Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to GLB 2022, the second workshop on graph learning benchmarks. It's a pleasure to meet everyone virtually here, especially I know the time is a bit early for people in Americas. So I'm John, a third year PhD student at the University of Michigan and one of the organizers of this workshop. Uh, I have the pleasure of working with my wonderful co-organizers, Jiaqi, who is also here, and Anton and Marinka, and our advisory board, Yuxiao, Danai, and Chiao Zhu. We have planned an exciting program ahead and we hope you will enjoy it. So for this workshop, we are focusing on establishing novel machine learning tasks and graph structure data sets that have put the potential to identify the limitations of existing methods along with future directions for graph machine learning. Following the success of last year, we have received 15 submissions this year from Europe, Asia, and North America. And we have accepted 12 of them with outstanding reviews from our 23 program committee members. We have also selected two papers for our contributed talk this year. So in the next few hours, you will have a chance to learn more about these works from the authors, and you will have also have a chance to ask them questions. And besides the paper presentations, we also have a fantastic lineup of speakers this year on the latest trends, applications, and open questions on graph learning. We will hear keynote, keynote presentations from Michael Bernstein, Stefan Gunnerman, and Tina Elise Rudd. And we will also host an inspiring panel discussion with Xin Luna Dong, Peter Wilikovic, Mingjie Wang, and Rose Yu later in the program. So here I want to briefly go through how we are organizing our program today. So our program today is divided into four different sections with breaking time in the middle. And in the first three sessions, we will start with a 15 minute keynote presentation followed by video presentation and Q&A of papers. And in the last session, we will host a 60 minute panel discussion. After that, we will give our final closing remarks. So this is a sketch of our schedule today and you can view the more detailed schedule on our website. So without further delay, I will give the floor to Anton to chair our first session. Thank you, John. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Anton and it's my pleasure to chair the first session and start with the professor uh, Michael Bronstein uh, and his keynote talk on graph neural networks, trends and open problems. Uh, Michael Bronstein is a DeepMind professor of AI at the University of Oxford and a head of uh, graph learning research at Twitter. He was previously a professor at Imperial College London and held visiting positions at Stanford, MIT and Harvard. So Michael, take the floor, please. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. I hope you can hear and see me well. And thank you again for the invitation. So um, I would like to talk uh, a little bit about some uh, recent trends and interesting topics that, that have emerged in uh, the, the graph neural network community and uh, adjacent fields. And um, you might um, have, some of you might have seen uh, the posts that, that that's already second year in a row that, that we are summarizing. Uh, the, the trends in this field in geometric and graph ML, uh, interviewing some leading experts. So this year uh, I did it together with Petter and uh, you can see it on um, Medium in uh, towards data science. So um, I will not, uh, originally I planned to, to basically to go through these uh, trends, but I would like to present maybe my own perspective. I don't want to uh, maybe misrepresent what other people have said. So uh, what you will hear is what excites me mostly uh, in this field. So let me just briefly remind you what uh, the majority of uh, or how the majority of graph neural networks look like. So essentially they're based on the message passing paradigm. So when you have a graph that is given as an input and let's assume that the graph is, uh, has some node features. So uh, you look at the neighbors of uh, each feature, uh, each node in the graph, you aggregate their features and because you usually you don't have the canonical ordering of the neighbors, you need to do the aggregation in a permutation invariant way. So you're insensitive to the order. Now, when you apply this, uh, this aggregation function locally at every node of the graph, you get uh, a permutation equivariant node wise function. And uh, appropriately choosing it, in particular choosing it injectively, 
gives the equivalent of this message passing to the vice for lemon graph isomorphism test which uh, is um, a classical algorithm from the 60s in graph theory that uh, proceeds uh, by iterative color refinement starting with uh, a graph that, that has uh, the same labels at every node and then looking at the structure of the neighborhood of every node updating uh, the colors by an injective mapping and this provides a distribution of color as a kind of graph level descriptor that uh, allows to compare two graphs and try to say whether they're isomorphic so uh, you can say that if there is another graph for which the descriptor is different uh, you know that uh, uh, that these graphs are for certain not isomorphic but if the descriptors are the same you actually don't know so it's a necessary but insufficient condition and uh, here i'm stealing uh, this metaphor from dominique Beni. Uh, it's uh, like discovering the structure of a maze by walking in the maze so you don't have a map you walk and you try to understand what it is so there are certain structures that you cannot detect in this way so uh, from very high level perspective uh, essentially what message passing does is uh, it discriminates uh, it treats nodes and edges in a different way so in most cases the data resides in the nodes and the edges are used for computation so you use the graph in two roles both as part of the input and as uh, uh, as a computational device and there are several issues <coughs> with this paradigm that, that are well known in the literature so i will not go into too much <clears throat> apologies into too much detail about them first of all is limited expressive power because of the equivalence to the vice fair lemon uh, uh, isomorphism test we know that where such test fails and in particular it fails even with very simple structures so for example it cannot detect triangles or cycles or clicks in the graph so there are certain types of functions that cannot be computed now the uh, identifying the input in the computational graph means that in many cases the input graph is not necessarily friendly for propagating information so it leads to phenomena such as uh, over squashing and bottlenecks uh, meaning that that information doesn't flow well on the graph and message passing is not efficient then there is another problem of over smoothing so it was usually associated with early convolution type models it appears also in other cases the fact that if you uh, apply uh, multiple layers of uh, of message passing or of information propagation the features tend to become the same and uh, this is a phenomenon of forest moving and then there is a class of problems where the feature structure and the graph structure are incompatible and this is usually formulated in the form of heterophily meaning that my neighbors are different from me and in this case uh, many uh, graph neural network models appear to perform poorly and this is actually one of the issues related to benchmarks which is the topic of this workshop somehow uh, a lot of focus has been given to uh, maybe too optimistic or too simplistic benchmarks such as score or sites here or similar uh, uh, data sets which we know that they're uh, uh, homophilic and more recently uh, benchmarks that were constructed uh, having in mind this problem showed that that some architectures that, that maybe performed well in homophilic settings are, are not necessarily suitable to to, to, to this uh, to this kind of configurations so the trends I would like to discuss today are essentially two. One of them is can be broadly called um, to go beyond nodes and edges, right? So message passing, uh, whether it's correct to still call it message passing, I think it's more a semantic question, but basically we want to uh, to replace the graph with something else. So, uh, to, so to say the computational fabric will be different. We still start with the graph though. So uh, here I will, would like to discuss uh, different methods of uh, structural encoding, uh, message passing on collections of subgraphs, and uh, hierarchical or topological message passing on higher order spaces such as cellular or simplicial complexes. And the second part I would like to talk about continuous models where we can have physical systems as a metaphor for learning on graphs and then devise uh, graph neural networks from discretization of some differential equations that describe these systems. And uh, then we can also introduce geometry into uh, into graphs in, uh, in the form of some discrete or discretized structures, such as Ricci curvature or uh, cellular ships. So to start with the first uh, with the first topic. So as I said, uh, this way of treating of a graph of nodes and edges separately uh, by uh, by message passing type architectures has obviously been. Um, addressed in, in the literature in the past years. And I would say there are four 
categories of uh, works that, that, that try to look beyond. So first of all, is still remaining with graphs, is to go to higher order vice fair lemon type tests. They were introduced in the 80s by Laszlo Babe and co-authors, and recently used by, uh, for example, Hagai Maron and, and, and colleagues in the context of graph neural networks. So I will not be discussing it, so there are many issues with these methods. One of them is computational complexity, so I think practically going beyond anything that is equivalent to three WL tests is not practical. Now, the three other areas I would like to, to focus on is positional and structural encoding. So essentially, it's equipping uh, graphs with some additional features that uh, come from uh, usually out of band. So you, you assume some prior knowledge. And there, there have been many works on this as well. Uh, another type of work that is related, and this is uh, considering uh, graphs as collections of subgraphs that are extracted by some policy. And again, multiple works in the recent uh, year. And then topological message passing, again, uh, multiple papers that, that have been published on this topic, but most of them started with uh, other spaces rather than graphs, such as simplicial complexes uh, and, uh, well, my own works uh, that started in the, the field of computer graphics, we looked at deep learning on meshes. So here, our assumption is still that the input is given as a graph, and what we are trying to do is to lift the graph into uh, a higher dimensional space. So going beyond uh, Weisfrey and Lemon using uh, substructures, uh, so this is uh, again a blog post uh, that that uh, that I wrote in conjunction with our paper uh, that only now will appear in PAMI. The, the idea is very simple. So if we know that Weisfrey and Lemon doesn't detect, for example, triangles, let's help it. Let's detect these triangles. So we count triangles uh, for every node or for every edge in the graph. We uh, we count uh, in how many structures it participates and then use this as a structural encoding. So uh, if you look at what uh, the vice for element test sees in, in a traditional sense, right, you, you can obviously see why certain uh, non isomorphic graphs can be uh, indistinguishable like this example. So if you look at the red node, you see that that basically by walking on this graph, walking in this maze, you see exactly the same structures. So uh, this structural encoding or positional encoding more generally allows to disambiguate between these structures. So if I, for example, say that I know that uh, triangles are important, I can count the triangles and then, for example, the, the yellow nodes will contain uh, one count of triangle and other nodes will contain zero, right? And you see that this uh, structure is already color coded and uh, can be easily disambiguated. So what we show in the paper is uh, two things. First of all, that uh, that, that we are able to be uh, uh, strictly more powerful than the vice for lemon uh, algorithm by appropriate selection of the substructure. And second, we can also think of, of it as a kind of problem specific inductive bias. So if we know a priori that in a certain problem, certain structures are important, then we can include them as, uh, as these features and uh, get better performance. And one classical example is, uh, is uh, molecular graphs. So we know that, uh, uh, that, that uh, cycle type structures, such as uh, aromatic rings, are important in uh, organic compounds. And here you can see an example of the ca caffeine molecule that has a cycle of five and a cycle of, uh, of six. So if we pre-count them, we show that we can significantly improve the performance of uh, predicting some molecular properties like solubility in this case. So, and by significant, I mean uh, that at least at that time, it uh, significantly outperformed all the, the standard graph neural networks with basically almost no uh, no pain. So it's standard message passing, uh, just taking into account some extra uh, extra features. Now, of course, uh, one question that arises is uh, if we don't know a priori what are these uh, uh, substructures, can we automatically detect them from the data? So the answer is at least partially positive. So this is our last year's uh, paper at NeurIPS where we show that by compressing the graphs, by decomposing into, into simple structures, uh, uh, the structures that we detect in some cases are meaningful and actually are known from the domain knowledge to be important, like in the case of molecules. Another question that is also uh, important and prominent in this uh, kind of setting is how powerful are these uh, graph uh, substructure networks or uh, the, the uh, substructure counting or encoding uh, in general. And there we, uh, connected it to what is called the reconstruction conjecture in graph theory that, that claims or asks the question more correctly whether a graph can be recovered from a collection of, of its subgraphs and uh, the specific most known version of reconstruction conjecture considers graphs where you remove uh, one node at a time 
and uh, it was proven for certain graphs of certain size, but uh, it still remains, to the best of my knowledge, an open question. And I'm not aware of any result that talks about a graph of uh, size of order one. So basically, some small substructures. So interestingly, this direction uh, gave rise to multiple papers that, that uh, we can collectively call uh, substructure uh, graph neural networks. And again, with, uh, with co-authors, we had uh, these blog posts uh, at the end of last year where we described some of these approaches. So what is the idea of uh, subgraph GNNs is the following. So if uh, you take these graphs, and again, this is a simple example of non-isomorphic graphs that, that would produce the same uh, WL coloring, so they cannot be distinguished by the vice Lemon algorithm. What happens if I start perturbing this graph? So for example, I can perturb it by removing an edge. And you see that uh, this removal suddenly makes the uh, WL coloring different. And as a result, we can distinguish between, uh, between these subgraphs. So uh, de facto, this was uh, the reason why, for example, uh, different dropout techniques, such as node or edge dropout, uh, work. And actually, uh, it was proven, I think it was a paper by Pap from ETH Zurich, that uh, the, the dropout technique uh, makes uh, graph neural networks uh, strictly more powerful than WL. So another paper by Leonardo Cotta uh, linked it to reconstruction conjectures. And then our paper that, that will be presented this week at uh, iClear, uh, Beatrice Bevilacqua, Fabrizio Frasca, and, and Colsers. So that was collaboration with Hagai Maron. We showed uh, a more powerful architecture that considers the graph uh, as a multi set of subgraphs that are extracted using some policy. So one of the policies would be, for example, node deletion or edge deletion, but we also consider uh, uh, random stochastic uh, policies. And then you think of um, an architecture that performs an equivariant message passing on this collection. So a collection uh, is an interesting object because it has uh, two types of structures. So we can think of it as a product of two symmetry groups. So on the one hand, we have the standard uh, symmetry structure of the graph, so node permutation. On the other hand, we have permutation of the subgraphs in, the, in this multiset. So uh, the, the overall structure is a product group. And what is important to say here, unlike situations when we have, for example, a multiset of images that was studied before, also by Haggai, in this case, we have correspondence between the nodes of the graphs because uh, it's not just a given set of graphs. Uh, we create them ourselves from the input graph. So we know which node corresponds to which one. And we can do an architecture that uh, is uh, equivariant uh, on, this, uh, uh, on this more complex structure. And the way it works is that we have a shared encoder that takes uh, each of the subgraphs independently and then uses also uh, an information sharing module where we have a collection of uh, basically an aggregation of these, uh, of these subgraphs. And this produces a, a result that is strictly more expressive than the vice fair lemon. So it's uh, somewhere between 2WL and 3WL in terms of its uh, expressive power. Now, uh, the last thing I would like to mention in uh, among these approaches that um, uh, that, that consider um, uh, that try to go beyond graphs is uh, uh, topological message passing. So uh, graphs are essentially topological objects, right? So even their origins come from uh, uh, from the, the early works of uh, Leonard Euler, who considered what is uh, what is called uh, geometry as cito. So so the, the the, the geometry of location, as he called it. So this is, was the precursor of topology. Basically, the, the classical uh, problem of the seven bridges of Königsberg, where uh, the geometry, the actual uh, structure of the city didn't matter. What mattered is how things are connected. And topology sometimes, sometimes is described as a, a kind of geometry where you don't have distance, but you have the notion of neighborhood. So uh, graphs are these kind of discrete topological spaces. So if you think of uh, some more complex structures, topological spaces uh, that are called uh, simplicial or cellular complexes, you can think of basically a hierarchy so, uh, of different dimensions. So uh, the, the structure of dimension zero is a node, structure of dimension one is an edge, structure of dimension two is a face, and so on and so forth. And uh, basically, the, the set, there is a set of rules, uh, certain adjacency properties. For example, uh, an edge has exactly uh, two nodes uh, at its ends. And the face will have uh, will have three nodes and uh, three edges and so on and so forth. And basically, we can uh, 
Now, we can do message passing on these structures. The problem is that we don't really uh, have simplicial or cellular complexes as input. We have graphs. So what we show in the paper, so that was a, a line of works with uh, colleagues from Cambridge, in particular uh, Chris Bodnar from the group of uh, Pietro Leo, is uh, describing a lifting transformation. So we, start, we, we have a, a procedure that starts with a graph and produces a cellular complex from it. You can think of it essentially as gluing cells to, the, to some structures in the uh, uh, in the graph, such as cycles or clicks, and uh, doing message passing, uh, a hierarchical message passing on uh, these structures, where you can go between objects of the same dimension or objects of different dimensions. So you can go up and down, and uh, we show that uh, this kind of construction uh, is uh, more powerful than the, than the WL. So we show even that it's can distinguish structures that are indistinguishable by a 3WL by uh, appropriate selection of this uh, lifting transformation. So again, the important thing here is that uh, that we start with the graph, because there have been other works that start with uh, simplicial complexes, uh, both in the signal processing domain, in, in, in the machine learning domain, and uh, simplicial complexes play an important role, obviously, in computer graphics. They also are uh, used in network science, for example, to describe different uh, types of flows, like, like transportation networks and so on. So the second topic I would like to discuss, or second type of trends, is uh, continuous models. And uh, again, uh, uh, there is a blog post that, 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 that I wrote on, on this topic, or actually a series of different uh, blog posts. And um, to start, why basically why uh, to motivate why we need at all these uh, uh, these maybe slightly exotic methods, if we look at uh, geometric deep learning uh, more broadly. So uh, as as you know, uh, we like to connect geometric deep learning to Klein's Erlangen program. Uh, as you know, uh, in the nineteenth century there was an explosion of different types of non Euclidean geometries for the first time. Uh, the, the the monopoly of Euclid uh, that, that lasted for more than two thousand years came to an end and uh, different geometries were defined with different properties and no clear hierarchy. So in uh, 1872, Felix Klein, in his, uh, uh, in his inaugural program at the University of Erlangen, proposed a new, radically new approach to, um, to the uh, systematization of geometries, which was a second time that the geometry was uh, algebraized uh, following, uh, following Descartes. So he used group theory to to define geometries as a space plus some uh, group of transformations. So essentially studying the, the properties that remain invariant under certain transformations. Uh, this immediately brought clarity as to the hierarchy of geometries. You could say that, for example, Euclidean geometry, which arises from the Euclidean group of rigid motions, is a special case of uh, the projective geometry, which arises from, from the projective group, because Euclidean group is a subgroup of it. And besides impact in geometry, it had impact in physics, uh, where uh, the notion of uh, symmetry and invariance became fundamental through the Neutra's theorem that, that allowed to derive conservation laws from, uh, uh, from considerations of symmetry. Uh, the gauge invariance that was introduced first by Weil, and then uh, uh, in some elaborate form became uh, what is known the gauge theory, and then uh, became the, the standard model that, that unifies different uh, types of interactions with the exception of gravity maybe and this is uh, the physics that that we now understand so uh, group theory uh, was also used uh, in the very early works on machine learning or neural networks in the famous or for some infamous uh, book called the perceptrons by uh, minsky and papert that put the nail in the coffin of, uh, of the of the perceptrons of uh, frank rosenblatt in the 60s and some people blame it for the onset of the first wave of AI winters. So uh, it was it is actually an interesting book. So many people judge or criticize it without having read it. So uh, the, the subtitle is actually Foundations of Computational Geometry. So that was the first time that the term computational geometry was was uh, pronounced or written or introduced. And uh, interestingly, they tried to approach and analyze why perceptrons are not good from geometric considerations. And they used uh, uh, group invariants to show what kind of functions perceptrons cannot represent. Now, uh, having said that, uh, I would say that it's probably fair to, to, to claim that until recently, the organizing power of uh, group theory has not been recognized in, um, in machine learning. And this is what we are trying to do in geometric deep learning. So the idea that you can derive 
many uh, different architectures that historically were developed uh, from different foundations for different types of data, such as CNNs or RNNs or transformers or GNNs, from the same uh, consideration of uh, symmetry and invariance. And uh, in Geometric Deep Learning Blueprint, we distinguish between the domain and its symmetry group, signals on this domain, on which the group acts for some representation and depends on the type of the data. And then we have functions that incorporate this symmetry through notions of invariance and active variance. And graph neural networks are a special case of this blueprint where uh, the, the, the structure of the domain uh, is defined by the permutation group. And then message passing is uh, equivariant to, to known permutations. And um, this blueprint can be applied to many different structures, such as uh, grids, meshes, or graphs. And what strikes in this picture is that uh, for the first two structures, we have continuous analogs. So we can think of a grid, for example, as a discretization of a plane, or a mesh as a discretization of a manifold. But it's not clear what is the continuous analogy of a graph. And if you think of the kind of ambiguity or structure that we have in these uh, different objects, we see that graphs have the least structure. So uh, if you think of a grid, for example, I have a canonical ordering of, uh, of the neighbors of every node, right? So it's, it's fixed. On the mesh, I have ambiguity, so I can pick up the first node, right? And then order all the rest of the nodes in, let's say, clockwise orientation, because I have local uh, manifold structure. So uh, the ambiguity is rotation. And on a graph, I don't have, unless I assume something about this graph, uh, some extra information. But being a purely topological object, the order is completely arbitrary. So I, I can reorder the nodes in any way I want. And as a result, uh, we, we, we get different, uh, different uh, structures in these cases. So on graphs, we must do uh, permutation invariant aggregation. Uh, it means that we don't have any notion of orientation. So these filters are isotropic. On meshes, we need to deal with rotation invariance. So one of the ways of doing it is using gauge equivariant convolutional neural networks. But we do have some local notion of orientation. And on grids, we have a global coordinate structure. So on grids, basically everything boils down to convolutions, which are shift invariants. And uh, the mental picture I would like you to have for this discussion is uh, basically we want to leverage this structure. And the mental picture that, that I think is nice, uh, uh, nicely captured here is uh, that of a physical system. And the figure is here from a recent Nature paper, which uh, showed that you can integrate real life physical systems uh, into deep learning pipelines. So you can back propagate through an optical or electronic circuit and uh, use it, for example, for image classification. So if you think of learning in these terms, we have some uh, physical system that is described by uh, some system of differential equations. Think of a plane, for example, that takes off at some point, flies, and then lands somewhere. So it has some uh, uh, parameters that can be controlled by a certain trajectory, right? So I can move, for example, the flaps or and so on. And uh, I can think of the learning problem as a kind of optimal control problem. So I can ask, for example, whether I can reach a certain state, right, by controlling uh, these uh, in this parameter state, uh, in, in the parameter space. Uh, and the, the, basically, the solution of the of these equations, right, the state of the system will be the output of my neural network, right, or my machine learning system. I can ask the question, for example, how fast can I reach a certain state, and this will be uh, uh, equivalent of efficiency. And uh, for example, we can think uh, of uh, perturbations of the initial conditions, and that could be some form of uh, generalization. So uh, if you think of different uh, physical processes that one can think of when uh, it comes to learning on graphs, so the most natural one is probably the uh, process of diffusion. Uh, when we think of uh, message passing, what it does is information propagation on a graph. So information diffuses somehow between adjacent nodes. So uh, diffusion equations are obviously very well studied, probably since the, the times of uh, Sir Isaac Newton. And uh, in the continuous case, if we have some domain with some property on it, let's say uh, we have some two-dimensional plane and we have a different temperature on it that is depicted here by different colors, the difference in this uh, quantity, in this uh, temperature, uh, creates the heat flux that is inversely proportional to the gradient of this uh, function. And uh, adding a conservation condition that no heat is created or disappears, we can attribute the change in the temperature, uh, the temporal derivative, to the divergence of the heat flux, right? That measures uh, the overall flux for some local uh, uh, volume element. 
And put together, this gives the classical uh, diffusion uh, differential equation uh, uh, that is probably known and familiar from uh, textbooks on uh, PDEs. Now, there are multiple flavors to diffusion equations. They uh, mainly differ in what we assume about the, the object on which the diffusion happens. So if the diffu diffusivity properties are constant, independent on the position, we are talking about homogeneous and isotropic diffusion. We can rewrite the divergence of the gradient as the Laplacian operator. And this is the, the standard linear diffusion. We can make the diffusion nonlinear. So in this case, the diffusivity function is position dependent. So this is the non-homogeneous case. And we can also make it direction dependent. So it's a matrix valued function. And this is an isotropic diffusion. Now, uh, these kind of nonlinear diffusion equations attracted a lot of attention in the image processing community about 30 years ago, starting with the seminal work of Pietro Perona and Jitendra Malik in the 90s, where uh, they used diffusion equations to uh, do different kind of image uh, processing, such as denoising. And uh, of course, what diffusion does essentially in the simplest case, you can actually describe it in the Euclidean space as convolution with the Gaussian, is some form of low pass filtering. But low pass filtering, what it does in the case of denoising, it will uh, average out the noise from the image, but it will also destroy perceptually important structures such as discontinuities or edges in the image. And uh, what Perona and Malik propose is to use adaptive diffusion that will stop the diffusion or slow it down when it uh, sees such as discontinuity. So in other words, the diffusivity can be chosen uh, inversely proportionally to the norm of the gradient, which is the edge indicator. And uh, you can see uh, how the kernel of this diffusion equation locally looks like, right? So you don't diffuse across pixels of different color. And here you can see an example of how it works. So the, the, the face of Sir Isaac diffused with a standard linear homogeneous diffusion. And this is what happens with non-homogeneous diffusion. So you can actually say that these ideas uh, resemble very much of attention that does exactly this, right? So attention, uh, it's learnable, of course, and it takes into account whether you want to collect information from certain neighbors or not, right? So it's uh, very much similar, at least philosophically, to what is uh, done here. And uh, in general, this was uh, a, a very vivid class of methods in image processing. Uh, that was called variational or PDE based image processing methods. And the idea was very uh, neat and very elegant, in my opinion. So you started with some functional that measures somehow the ideal image, quantifies it. And then you uh, derive the optimality conditions in the form of Euler Lagrange equation that gives you a PDE, like a diffusion PDE. And uh, the PDE is the gradient flow of some energy. So you minimize it by, uh, by running this diffusion equation. And it's very nice because it's interpretable, but of course, the main difficulty and the reason why these methods are not uh, widely used anymore uh, uh, after deep learning uh, appeared is that it's hard to handcraft this functional that would suit all uh, possible images. So what we try to do is we try to revisit these methods for graphs and in the context of deep learning. And here we are writing a diffusion equation on graphs that is formally very similar to the diffusion equation in the continuous case. So we have the gradient, we have the diffusivity function, and we have the divergence. So structure is very much the same. And if you want to solve it, so it's a nonlinear equation, we uh, want to solve it uh, uh, numerically by discretizing the time variable, for example, replacing the temporal derivative by the forward difference uh, using fixed step size of uh, fixed step of size tau. So we get an, uh, what is called a forward Euler iteration which uh, is nothing else but the graph attention network. So we get it as a particular discretization of the graph diffusion equation. So if you write the iteration formula, basically the next iterate k plus first iteration or layer, because we interpret each iteration of this solver as a layer of a graph neural network, is obtained as a linear transformation of the previous, uh, uh, of the previous features or the output of the previous layer with coefficients that non-linearly depend. On, uh, on these features. Now, of course, we can use more sophisticated schemes, such as implicit or semi-implicit, or multi-step Runge-Kutta methods with adaptive step size. So there is a plethora of different methods in numerical analysis, analysis literature. And the way that it is used for learning, so again, as I said, this metaphor of a physical system, we start with uh, some initial features. And let's say the downstream task is node-wise classification. We diffuse these features by uh, uh, solving numerically this diffusion equation. And the diffusivity function here is parametric. So these are the knobs, right? Like in the attention function that 
we turn to make the output, the solution of this, uh, uh, of this equation uh, fit the best the downstream task. And uh, what we gain from this view is uh, it's a new perspective on all problems. So we can, for example, use results such as theoretical guarantees of stability and convergence, but we can also use more efficient solvers. And many of these solvers that at least exist in the literature do not have, to my knowledge, immediate uh, implementations in the uh, GNN literature. So uh, methods like multi-step or multi-grid or adaptive step size uh, 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 techniques are yet to be explored and probably what we'll see uh, in the future uh, uh, as uh, the, the evolution of these works is um, uh, theoretically informed choices in uh, graph neural network architectures. Now, what is more interesting are deeper links to fields that are probably even less known in uh, graph neural networks, such as differential geometry and algebraic topology. And this is what I would like to show is, basically, if we go, uh, go back again to our initial desire to have a continuous model for a graph, so the analogy uh, of diffusion equation in the plane would be, if we discretize the plane as a grid, we have multiple ways of discretizing the differential operators, let's say the Laplacian. So these are the three possible uh, discretizations, and any convex combination of them is uh, also a legitimate uh, discretization of the Laplacian. And what has been done in image processing community, instead of considering <coughs> a nonlinear diffusion equation, we can also consider a non-Euclidean diffusion equation. So that was the work of my PhD advisor, Ron Kimmel, in the 90s. And the idea is that you consider an image as a manifold or two-dimensional surface that is embedded in a joint space where we have a combination of positional coordinates, the x, y coordinates of pixels in this case, and the feature coordinates like the color channels, R, G, and B uh, colors. So uh, we can use the pullback mechanism from differential geometry to define the metric on this manifold from the embedding. And uh, an image, for example, a color image will be represented as a two-dimensional surface in R5. And uh, we can define, with respect to this metric, a uh, non-Euclidean analogy of the uh, Laplacian, that is called the laplace beltrami operator, and define uh, uh, the diffusion equation, the Beltrami flow, uh, which uh, appears to be the gradient flow of a generalization of the Dirichlet energy that is minimized by the classical diffusion. Uh, in physics, it's called the Polyakov functional, and uh, it is used in uh, fields such as string theory. So for graphs, the same uh, version of the equation will uh, now have two types of data that is attached to the nodes. One of them is the standard uh, features that I denote here by x. Another one are positional coordinates. So you can think of a graph embedded in some space. It doesn't actually need to be Euclidean space. And then we evolve, uh, we diffuse both types of coordinates and uh, by doing it we can consider the evolution of the x component as the feature diffusion and the evolution of the u component the, the, the positional coordinates as some form of graph rewiring because if two nodes come closer to each other in this space we can decide to create an edge there and uh, this picture i think shows it nicely so this is the core graph and uh, the color of the nodes here represents uh, some low dimensional projection of the features the positions of the circles represents, again, some low dimensional positional encoding. And you see that while we are diffusing them, the graph also changes. So we are rewiring it on the fly. And here the task is the classical one of Cora uh, node-wise classification. You can see that uh, it separates very nicely between the classes that, that we have in this data set. Now, this picture of uh, a domain that is moving under your feet while you're uh, doing filtering on it is somewhat disturbing in uh, maybe machine learning and in signal processing, but it's actually very common in differential geometry, and uh, it is very common in this field to, to apply some evolution equation or geometric PD to the domain itself. And uh, probably the most uh, uh, the most famous uh, type of such equations are Ricci flows. So Ricci flow is an evolution of the Riemannian metric of the manifold, uh, and uh, structure it looks very much like the diffusion equation. So we have on the left hand side the temporal derivative of the metric, on the right hand side the Ricci curvature tensor. And when we evolve the manifold under this equation, so you see, start with a dumbbell that has a negative curvature on the bottleneck and positive curvature on the two uh, parts of the dumbbell. When uh, uh, evolved by Ricci flow uh, backwards, it uh, becomes more sphere like and then collapses into a point. And Richard Hamilton in the 80s introduced this mechanism of Ricci flows to try to characterize uh, topological spheres. Because on a sphere, you can say that something is, it looks like a sphere if you can, can take a closed curve and collapse it always into a point, right? So you can do it always on a sphere if you're on a torus for 
curves that go across the donut, you cannot do it, right? So uh, it turned out that uh, it's an easy problem in two dimensions, but uh, it, it is difficult in higher dimensions, in particular in, in three dimensions. That was the famous Poincaré conjecture that was proved using this technique of Ricci flows by uh, Grigory Perelman about 15 years ago. Now, what does it have to do with graph neural networks? Basically, we uh, try to use uh, uh, the geometry of, of graphs in the form of Ricci curvature to uh, characterize and deal with the phenomenon of over squashing. So I remind you that over squashing in graph neural networks comes from the fact that we need to propagate uh, information from distant nodes and the structure of the graph is such that uh, uh, there are too many such nodes. So what happens is that we need to squeeze a lot of information into a single feature vector. So it happens when we have long distance uh, dependencies and fast volume growth, like in graphs such as social networks. So uh, first of all, we can characterize the, this phenomenon of over squashing and over squashing essentially is a sensitivity issue. So if you have a multi-layer uh, uh, message passing type graph neural network, with let's say Lipschitz continuous activation functions. So what we can say is the following thing. I want to, I'm looking at the output of a few layers of the graph neural network at node i, and I see how it depends on the input at node s that is distant from it. And if uh, I can express this, uh, this sensitivity as the derivative, right, as the Jacobian, and if I see that this derivative is small in absolute value, it means that I have a sensitivity problem. And you see that uh, it can be bounded by something that depends on the structure of the graph. So through the, the, uh, some power of the normalized adjustancy matrix. So we see that uh, the structure of the graph enters somehow the play uh, uh, in this way, but it's very hard to understand what happens, right? And intuitively, we also understand that structures such as grids or structures such as trees, which are pathological examples of, of the over squashing phenomena should behave differently. And in differential geometry, the standard way of distinguishing between these two different types of spaces is through the notion of curvature. And in particular, Ricci curvature, it can be uh, identified with what is called geodesic dispersion. So you start with two points on your domain, you send geodesics from them, and you see whether they converge, uh, remain parallel, or diverge. And this allows us to distinguish between something that looks locally like a sphere, something that is flat, or something that looks like a hyperboloid. So similar concepts exist for graphs. And you can also think of a kind of edge dispersion. So you start with two nodes connected by an edge. And if you look at the edges that, that uh, start at these, uh, at these nodes, you see whether they tend to form triangles. In this case, we get clique-like structures and we call them positive, positively curved. Whether they form rectangles, and in this case, we, say, we can say that they remain parallel. So we are looking at something that is grid-like uh, or whether they diverge. And in this case, we are looking at tree-like structures with negative curvature. And there are multiple definitions. Uh, so the two constructions are due to Olivier and Foreman of curvature-like uh, uh, objects on graphs. So uh, the Olivier construction is related to optimal transport. It has been studied theoretically by uh, uh, big shots such as uh, Villani and Figali to field laureates. Uh, the Foreman curvature is combinatorial and it essentially counts uh, certain types of triangles and rectangles. So here we are using our own version of the Foreman curvature which we call the balanced form and curvature, allow me to omit the details. What is important is that it reproduces the continuous behavior for graphs. So clicks have positive curvature, grids have zero curvature, and trees have negative curvature. And the main result of the paper is that uh, if we know that graph has negative curvature, then there will be many nodes for which this Jacobian will be small. In other words, we have strong over squashing. So in other words, over squashing is caused by negatively curved edges. And having understood this, we can now propose a scheme that rewires the graph surgically by removing negatively curved edges and possibly replacing them with edges that contribute to higher curvature. And you can see here an example of what happens to, to graph rewiring in this case. So uh, compared to, to, to topology diffusion, such as Deagle, uh, the, the paper from the group of Stefan Gunniman, who is speaking after me, I guess, uh, uh, which uses personalized page rank for embedding. So we show also that uh, unlike Deagle, which uh, doesn't work well in heterophilic settings, this kind of curvature rewiring uh, performs significantly better. Now, uh, I was happy to know that, that uh, our paper was uh, uh, received an outstanding paper honorable mention uh, at iClear. We'll be presenting it uh, uh, this week. And uh, well, with my students, of course, we are very happy. So uh, we think that the best way to celebrate this success is with a glass of 
champagne from the, the winery of Richie Corbastro. Actually, the, the same family to which uh, Gregory Richie Corbastro, after whom the Richie flows and the Richie curvature are named, uh, belonged. Now, another thing related to curvature, uh, before I wrap up, is uh, considering uh, node uh, embeddings. So uh, it is very common to work with graphs after embedding them in some space. This is what, for example, uh, social networks such as Twitter or Facebook do, because it's much uh, easier to work with continuous structure rather than discrete. And the, the most ubiquitous uh, space that is used is the Euclidean space. Now, the problem with Euclidean space that its geometry is not consistent with the geometry of the graph. So in particular, if you look at the volume growth, the volume growth in Euclidean spaces uh, is uh, polynomial. So if you think of classical formula from school, pi r squared, right? So two-dimensional volume area of the circle, uh, it depends polynomially, right? Like r squared on r. On many graphs, such as uh, scale-free networks, the volume grows uh, exponentially fast. So if you look at the number of the neighbors of the neighbors of the neighbors, it will be very large very quickly. Now, uh, in order somehow to compensate for this problem, so the, the result of it is that, that graphs are severely distorted in Euclidean spaces, and you need to go to very high dimensions to accommodate for these distortions. Now, uh, what has been done recently in the past approximately five years, so there have been multiple works, including my colleague uh, Ben Chamberlain, who is now at Twitter, uh, and Max Nickel from Facebook and, and a few others, to use hyperbolic spaces. So hyperbolic spaces have exponential uh, volume growth, so they are more suitable for certain type of graphs. The problem is that all these spaces are homogeneous, so the curvature is the same. Even product manifolds, uh, like shown here, so this is from uh, last year's paper uh, from the group of Christophe Ferre, they are also homogeneous. But we know that graphs are not homogeneous, so if you look at their curvature, locally it can be very different, like uh, see the analogy of this dumbbell, uh, the graph with two triangles. So we want uh, some space where we could, can control locally the geometry in the form of Ricci curvature in order to match it to the graph that we are trying to embed. And uh, 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 my collaborator, Francesco Di Giovanni, showed uh, a way of doing it, basically constructing a product manifold where there is a rotation asymmetric factor uh, with a controllable Ricci curvature that allows to match it with the discrete curvature, the form and curvature of the graph. And uh, by doing this, uh, we are able to preserve in the same way the distances as the traditional embeddings do, but uh, significantly better preserve higher order structures such as triangles and rectangles. And you can see here a graph that is reconstructed from this embedding uh, is preserved uh, much better. So the final thing I would like to mention is uh, even more exotic construction that is called uh, uh, cellular shifts. So shifts are uh, a little bit obscure and difficult object in uh, studying algebraic topology. So uh, uh, they, they were introduced around uh, uh, around the 40s by uh, French mathematicians and uh, developed further in the 50s and the 60s. So cellular shifts uh, are a discrete. So shifts essentially allow to track different objects that uh, uh, that have some underlying topological space. So cellular shifts uh, consider shifts on discrete objects such as graphs or cellular complexes. And uh, on graphs, you can think of them as having vector spaces attached to every node of the graph and linear transformations that connect these spaces. So uh, if you think of a graph as a purely topological object that is analogous to a manifold, uh, where you have the notion of, uh, uh, of neighborhood, right, but not uh, any geometric structure. So uh, assigning a, a shift to, to, to a graph is analogous to uh, assigning a connection to a manifold. So a connection is a way of connecting um, tangent spaces uh, to, to two different points on the manifold. And it's more general than the Riemannian metric and actually define connection without the metric and a special connection called the levi civita connection that is uh, compatible with the Riemannian metric. So on manifold, this allows to do parallel transport. When you move a vector on the sphere, for example, the vector must be rotated and it moves from one point to another. So basically what we show in this paper, so that was also collaboration with uh, Chris Bonner and colleagues is that we this way we endow the graph with certain geometry and considering this geometry we can have uh, more interesting properties for example of diffusion equations so uh, this is how it looks like so we have uh, the, the features on the nodes we have uh, these transport maps or restriction maps in uh, in the terminology of algebraic topology and uh, we can make them learnable from the data 
So you can also define the, the sheaf of plus n that, that uh, essentially the derivatives, uh, uh, the gradient and the divergence uh, must include these transformations. So when you bring a feature from a, from a neighbor node, you must transform it by this, uh, by this linear map. And we can uh, identify node classification tasks with the limit of sheaf diffusion equation with an appropriate shift. So in other words, we can ask the question, can I find a shift that will uh, solve my node-wise classification problem? And this is a way of analyzing the expressive power of graph neural networks. So we're looking at the limit of this diffusion equation, and you can see that in this case, the colors here on this graph represent the ground truth labels, and the features evolve, so their positions represent some uh, low dimensional uh, feature space, so the X in this equation. And we uh, show a bunch of results. So for example, if we consider the standard uh, symmetric scalar transport maps, so this gives us a, a GCN type architecture, and we assume a homophilic setting, then we can show that, uh, that the chief diffusion uh, has linear separation over uh, such graphs. So in other words, it has sufficient expressive power. But uh, if we assume heterophilic setting, then uh, this expressive power is not enough, and we need to introduce uh, asymmetry. So the, the, the asymmetric transport maps allow to, to, to solve these problems. And this uh, provides a, a, a shift theoretical explanation to some recent works that tried to cope with heterophilic settings by introducing negatively weighted edges. So uh, uh, some form of a kind of sharpening, if you think of, uh, of what conv convolution type filters on graphs do. So the negative edges uh, do some form of, uh, some form of sharpening. And, it's important because uh, you need to have these kind of asymmetric relations between neighbors that belong to different classes. We also show that uh, in order to do classification with more classes, you need to use sheaves of higher dimension. Uh, uh, in particular, we cannot do more than, than uh, uh, more than two classes. And we also study uh, some other restrictions, for example, orthogonal message passing, so orthogonal uh, sheaves. And uh, we show that, that they can separate uh, a certain number of classes. And again, uh, it's not that we invented the orthogonal message passing. It has been done before, uh, but mainly from considerations of numerical stability and number of parameters. So here we can actually analyze it formally and show what it does. So uh, it's an interesting alternative that doesn't follow the vice Freleman hierarchy. And uh, I think it provides uh, a different uh, set of tools, completely different set of tools to look at uh, how expressive or powerful graph neural networks are. So the last question I would like to answer or maybe uh, pose a little bit provocatively is, are we done with message passing, right? Because message passing has been really the, the bread and butter of graph neural networks in the past years. And there are somewhat radically different opinions as to whether future graph neural networks will be based on message passing. So I can quote here Will Hamilton from the previous post about uh, the, the trends in GraphML, who said that uh, we need to go beyond message passing. And on the other hand, the recent paper by Petr Velishkovic, who said that basically, more or less, everything we do in graph neural networks is some form of message passing, maybe with some additional structure. So I don't have a strong opinion. I believe that this is mostly a semantic question. I think as a computational tool, message passing will still be around for quite a while. It's, uh, uh, we can say that to some extent, anything that you do on the, on the digital computer is message passing. However, it is a very general mechanism and the choice of how to do the message passing should probably be inspired by continuous models like uh, those that I showed. So for example, uh, how to, if you discretize a graph neural network uh, uh, and derive it from a differential equation, then, uh, uh, then uh, certain considerations that come from the continuous theory can tell you, for example, how exactly to discretize, whether to use residual connections. You can ask questions, for example, how the message passing functions themselves should look like, whether you should use linear maps, whether you should use orthogonal maps, and so on. So uh, I think it's an interesting perspective. And final comment is that it, it regards actually the, the computational hardware. Most of graph neural networks uh, are executed on GPUs. And the way you think of them is, okay, if it fits into the memory, then everything is fine. If it doesn't fit into memory, then, then we need to work hard. And the GPUs are by design uh, made for uh, CIMD or single instruction multiple data type of settings. Something that uh, looks like a vector which has uh, a local coherency in memory. So you bring the next data point and you uh, apply the same operation in different data points uh, at the same time. And it worked very well. For convolutions, uh, this was probably one of the reasons why deep learning 
and in particular CNNs were so successful. With graphs, it requires revisiting, and there are multiple semiconductor companies that are now working on future architectures that will be more friendly for graphs. Uh, and uh, here again, the physical metaphor is very important because if you can think of a graph as a discretization of some continuous domain, you can discretize it in a way that is uh, at least aware of the underlying hardware, for example, that it costs you uh, an order or two orders of magnitude more to send the message across different memories rather than within the same memory. Uh, and uh, also leverage techniques from scientific and supercomputing where this kind of no naive notion that you can fit your uh, equation with billions of, of variables into a single GPU would be ridiculous, right? So you solve it on clusters with hundreds or even even uh, thousands of computational nodes. So there are these problems accompany uh, 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 differential equations all the time and uh, techniques such as domain decomposition, where you partition the problem into different sub problems and then you uh, need to make sure that you stitch it correctly and you propagate information, maybe send information across these clusters from time to time to, to minimize the latency and the cost of this uh, information sharing. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. We'll be uh, glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Michael, um, and thank you for keeping in time. I think we can take uh, one question. If there are no questions, then maybe uh, let me ask one. I'm wondering, like in the last uh, bit, you said something about the you know distributed computing, acceleration, um, and accelerators. How do you see um, the applications of the theory that you have presented to uh, sampling graphs, because you said we can sample uh, graphs according to our, you know, hardware uh, specific, um, you know, in a hardware specific way. So how would how do you see the? So probably not sampling rewiring, right? So rewiring you can think of uh, rewiring. So rewiring means that that you change the computational graph. So you you depart from the input graph and uh, you you propagate information on something different. Now this something different can take into account, uh, for example, where the nodes sit in memory. So if two nodes sit in different, on different computational units in different, uh, different positions in the memory hierarchy, maybe I don't want to put an edge there. Or if I put an edge there, I want to add some uh, additional cost to it, right? And the cost not in terms of uh, accuracy, but cost in terms of, for example, how much time or even, uh, uh, even heat power it takes to, 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 to propagate this information. Thank you. Any more questions from the audience? Um, yeah, hi, hi Michael. Uh, thank you for the great talk. So I have one more question. So uh, like in, in, in both sort of part, those part of the talk, like for example, the expressive power and uh, the continuous models. Uh, so it seems like the design principles are following like the maybe the, the properties of the data, for example, how do we um, have more expressive power such that we can distinguish different types of data, and also um, like the some some types of data can be viewed as the discretization of some more continuous um, structures. So I, I'm wondering, like when it comes to the learning um, of like a learning model, when, when you prime price. Um, these models um, derived from some like maybe geometric, geometric theory or something like that. So uh, at end of the day, you, you, you like your model to generalize well um, and learning from the data, right? So uh, what's your opinion about like when you uh, derive these different types of fancy models, uh, how do you know like it, it's going to generalize well and uh, like, do you have any general opinions on that? Yeah, so generalization is uh, is a difficult question in uh, in classical graph neural networks as well, where you know, in most cases yeah, yeah. you don't know sure. either how it generalizes. So so it's 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 a bit hard to say. So that's why I, I think thinking of it from a different perspective of uh, of control theory might be might be interesting. But basically, what we do is we take a graph, we make out of it a more interesting more structured object such as cellular complex or cellular sheaf or maybe even a continuous space then do learning on that object and basically uh, again bring the data back to the to the graph so we always start with the graph so basically we invent some some extra structure 
And this uh, invention is, can be learnable, like in the case of cellular ships. So basically we make it up and uh, make it learnable, make it the best for the downstream application. But it uh, gives us uh, way more flexibility uh, and possibility to avoid some issues. For example, we, we avoid the oversmoothing that the standard craft knowledge works up by working with cellular ships. So we can actually show formally that the limit of this diffusion or the, the, the kernel uh, of this uh, shift Laplacian is non-trivial. So there is also the theoretical dimension that, that we can guarantee certain properties that, that are otherwise impossible or difficult. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michael. I think in order to keep up with the time, um, let's direct any further questions uh, directly to the speaker in the offline mode. They will be uh, more than happy to answer them, I, I'm sure. Uh, and with that, we will start the first uh, session. Um, and we will start with a contributor talk uh, from Baishan Huang uh, from Nature University of Singapore, uh, traffic accident prediction using graph neural networks, new data set and the travel model. Should be up soon. Hi, my name is Bai Xiang, and I will present traffic accident prediction using graph neural networks. This work was carried out at National University of Singapore as my master's thesis in collaboration with Professor Brian Ho. As the title suggests, we propose a set of traffic accident data set and apply machine learning approaches to traffic accident predictions. To be more specifically, we aim to predict traffic accident occurrence and accident severity in each intersection of a road network. In the first part, we will discuss the motivation and problem formulation. The second part will cover the process we build our data sets. And after that, we will talk about the proposed travel framework. Finally, we we are going to briefly analyze the experiment results. For the motivation of this work, we want to uh, learn which kind of environmental features lead to higher chance of accidents. Of course, human factors such as speed or drink driving are important causes of accidents. Here, we focus on environmental factors. After we identify accident hotspots and which kind of features lead to higher chance of accidents, we could take these features into account in the design of future road network. And we can learn which part of the road network is risky. Uh, so we formulate this problem as node classification problems with two tasks, the accident occurrence prediction and severity prediction. We use state-of-the-art machine learning methods on these two tasks. And the machine learning methods we used can be roughly divided into graph-based, uh, which include popular graph neural network methods such as graph convolutional network, graph attention network, and message passing neural network. And non-graph-based, approaches such as multilayer perceptron and uh, XG boost. And we are especially interested to find out whether graph-based approaches are, have higher performance. We believe so because intuitively, non-graph-based approaches completely ignore the underlying graph structure of a uh, straight network. In contrast, each each node in a graph neural network can not only learn its own features, but also aggregate useful information from its neighbors. So previous work on the accident prediction generally use a grid-based methods. Uh, the problem with this approach is that it divides an area into small grids and completely ignore the underlying graph structure, they do prediction separately on each grid. And recently, there are some researchers apply GNNs to this problem. 
and most of them focus on spatial temporal forecasting. Indeed, traffic flow is dynamic and temporal features are very important. But in this work, we try to focus on real world geospatial, uh, geospatial features that don't change over time, uh, such as road lens and uh, road type. These features are easier to get and are readily available from sources such as OpenStreetMap. So let's move on to the next part. Uh, to validate our ideas, we need some real world data sets. At first, we find this US accident data set, uh, which is a data set published in 2020. And it contains accident data across the United States. One of the reasons we only focus on accident around intersection is that the analysis on this data set shows that most of the accident actually took place near intersections. So we try to build graphs based on these provided accident coordinates, but it's difficult to do so because uh, without knowing the connection of the node, we only have separate coordinates. Uh, so we, we need a source for the structure information about straight networks. After many research, I found OpenStreetMap. Uh, it is a great tool for our purpose. It's a freely available geospatial data space and uh, it provides a variety of environmental features. And more importantly, it provides the graph structure data that we need. So OpenStreetMap uh, Open features that we used are shown in this table. And uh, the coordinates data and timestamps are also included, uh, but we don't use the coordinate data in our experiment because we don't want neural networks to memorize the accident locations. Uh, we want the models to make prediction based only on geospatial features. If users want to experiment with the temporal and coordinate data, more detail can be found in our GitHub repo. After that, uh, based on the data from the US accident data sets, we store the cities by their total count of traffic accident occurrence. Next, we select 1,000 cities with the most accident to build our data sets. Actually, when I check the US accident data sets, visualizations shows that for cities like Los Angeles, New York City, and Boston, some part of the accident data is missing. It turns out that uh, a city column of the data set is sometimes filled with uh, neighborhood names instead of city names. Uh, so I have confirmed this issue with the author of this data set, and I replaced neighborhood names with their uh, correct values so that the users of our data set don't have to worry about it. Next, we download the OpenStreetMap data, clean and pre-process the data, and using the OpenStreetMap graph data as backbones, using geospatial data as node and age features, and using accidents, accident data from the US accident data set as labels. We build our own data sets. To make it user-friendly, we build it following similar format as other graph benchmarking data set in PyTorch Geometric so that it can be easily downloaded and used. We publish them on GitHub and we will, will we will maintain and update them if we find more excellent data. Uh, this table below gives a summary of eight example data sets. We observe that the traffic accident data are imbalanced. Only a small part of the node have accidents 
and big cities tend to have more nodes and edges as we expected. These figures uh, shows the visualization of accident locations and severity labels on street maps. Severity is represented by a number between zero to seven, where zero denote no accident and one indicate the most negligible impact, impact on traffic and seven indicates a significant impact on traffic. We can see that city centers tend to have higher accident density and accident, accidents near main roads tend to have higher severity. Uh, next, uh, let's briefly talk about some unique features about street networks. For some, uh, for some graph structures, such as the citation network on the right, uh, the layout of the network don't matter as long as the connection don't change. The location of the node, the angles between edges can change. However, this is not the case for a road network uh, because changing the angles among edges will also change its geospatial features. Uh, therefore, we design a graph neural network architecture called traffic accident vulnerability estimation via linkage, the travel framework. This framework is specially designed for a road network. And uh, here is a study shows that whether an intersection has a right or left turn or a sharp turn can affect road safety. Also, uh, road direction features are important. For example, in some cities, there may be more traffic heading west to east because many people live in the west and they commute to the east side for work every day. So higher traffic volume may lead to higher prob probability of accident. Travel, uh, travels graph convolution layers consist of these two components uh, to capture these special features from road networks. The first component capture the angles between roads, while the second component aims to learn the direction information of the road. These features are also included in our data set. So here, this table shows the result of occurrence prediction tasks. Or we can learn that GNN-based approaches clearly outperform classic machine learning approaches such as XGBoost and multi-layer perceptron by a large margin. And this is because node, nodes in the GNN can aggregate feature information from its neighbors. As we mentioned earlier, well, MLP and XGBoost can only learn from its local feature. Also, the proposed travel framework consistently have the best performance in terms of all metrics uh, due to its ability to capture extra angular and directional features on top of the geospatial features from the data sets. Uh, thirdly, GNN variants that support multi-dimensional edge features, such as uh, tra graph transformer and uh, GEN and message passing neural network turn, tend to have, uh, generally they outperform models that do not support them, such as the uh, graph, uh, uh, graph convolutional network and ChapNet. So as we, uh, here is a visualization about the 
experiment, a prediction result on the Seattle data set. Blue nodes are, represent the endpoint with no accident. So, and the magenta nodes denote accident locations. By comparing the visualizations of ground truth and prediction result, we observe that our travel framework gives more accurate prediction, uh, not only on the uh, downtown area, but also on the roads far away from the city centers in places like here. Although here is a ground truth and other models uh, don't give correct predictions on roads that, that is far away from the city centers. So ne next, let's move on to the a prediction result of the excellent severity prediction task. Uh, our model, again, clearly uh, have the best performance against other baselines across all, all the eight data set. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. And I think the author is here to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Well, the audience th thinks about the question. Uh, let me ask the first one. Uh, what would you say is the key component missing from the classical GNNs uh, that is kind of key to unlocking the potential of the data sets of the road network data sets that you have uh, developed? Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, what would you say is a key component uh, missing from the classical models such as, uh, you know, GCNs uh, that are that is the key to unlocking the potential of the data sets uh, you have produced? Oh, thank you. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, street networks is actually different from other traditional networks such as citation network or other kind of uh, graph structure. Uh, it Because the location of the node and the angles between edge actually carry some uh, geospatial meaning. So that uh, if we use a classic, uh, it cannot capture these uh, angles between the edges, which we call angular component, uh, and the direction uh, direction of the network. So maybe uh, there's uh, there's more traffic from uh, from east to to west than the north to source. So this kind of inf information we uh, is what differentiate our travel framework from the traditional network. Thank you. Uh, do we have any more questions from the audience? Just as a reminder, you can also ask questions in the chat and I will read them for you. Um, but uh, if there are no more questions, uh, let's thank the speaker and go to the next presentation of uh, Telegraph a benchmark data set for hierarchical link prediction uh, by Min Zhu, uh, Bisheng Li, Mei Ling Yang, uh, and Lu Jia Pang uh, from Huawei Nor Noah Art Club and Fudan University. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Zhou Ming, so I'm behind, on behalf of a team to present our work, Telegraph, a benchmark data set for hierarchical link prediction. So graph structure data is very common in the real world applications and the link prediction is one of the key problems that network data structure uh, network network structure data analysis. It aims to predict interactions among the given um, entities and have a, a have a diverse have a diversifications. So according to the uh, 
the technique involves the link prediction methods can can be categorized into three groups: heuristics one, heuristic embeddings, and uh, graph neural network based one. So heuristic ones usually involve the handcraft measure similarity measures, and the embeddings learns the node embeddings uh, by the given structures. And for the graph neural network network based one, so it mainly mainly um. Involve the, the involve the graph neural network to learn the existence of the uh, of the links, and for the graph uh, gen based on one, we can further categorize into uh, cat divide them into the node level based node based node node level one and or subgraph uh, based uh, a subgraph gen. So for the subgraph gen, it uh, try to try to formula uh, formula the uh, formula the link prediction problem and subgraph classification problems and it shows more evident um, better usually it shows better performance than the node gen ones. So even though the link prediction technique have been have been very well studied, but the mainly um mainly test on the general graph like the citation graph or collaboration graphs but for in the in the real world um many scenarios the data the network has has very highly hierarchical and structures uh, um structures on the other hand the valuable tree like data set are either simulated it's smaller in scale of with very limited load information, so which encourage us to release uh, our our telegraph, our telegraph, which is a meter size, uh, heterogeneous and highly tree like um, telecommunication network data set with uh, uh, with a rich set of attribute information. So telecommunication network can be important in in the in to support personal communications in the in the modern life and the topology and recovering the incomplete topology is of crucial importance to the efficient network management and the our data set telegraph is collected from an access layer of of a uh, um uh, telecommunication network of a modern city and we have the three type of device so for the given data what we have uh, the raw data is the path logs and the long logs so path logs tell us the information flow from the different device which can be regarded as the as as the um, topology information and the alarm logs tells um, when the well the alarm happens so by combining the alarm pass and to also uh, associate the alarm to the corresponding device, what we and we can have the an attribute alarm graph, uh, alarm attribute graph. We all the each node we have the node attribute dictionary tells the node type and uh, the historical alarm 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 information. So we present, uh, we have uh, some described analysis on given data set, one, uh, and we, as we can see that we, for this given data set, given telegraph, we have about 40,000 nodes as well as, as well as the same, almost the same numbers of the age, which mean, uh, and we can see that the given data set is very, very, uh, very, very sparse. And we also um, try to evaluate, try to, uh, evaluate the how uh, the tree likeness of the given data set, which is um, which is evaluated by the hyperbolicity value. Um, the the as we can see that the given data set is extremely tree like, as the hyperbolicity value is is very close to zero. Is is almost to zero zero. Though the data set is highly tree like, we will still find some uh, cycles with the uh, about 700 cycles and with the largest one involves about more than 10 nodes and most of the cycles have three or four, four nodes so in conclusion the given data set is highly sparse and hierarchy with complex local structures so um 
as the graph neural network sensationally future centric, so which encourages us to first investigate some preliminary um, future engineering schemas. So uh, in that work, we come up we come up with the three initial embedding initializing schemes uh, schemes schemas. So uh, for one hundred count, we assign the future vector to each node according to whether the lamb appears or not, and the numbers of of occurrence, numbers of occurrence of the lumps. So for the random one, we initialize and put embedding for each node randomly. From the result, we can see that future engineering is very important for the message passing that paradigm, the paradise as the different like uh, embedding schemas produce very different results. And the second, uh, and also we, we can see that the lump log is very uh, is helpful to recover the connection of device as the random the random one given the results almost similar to the random guess. Um, secondly, we have some uh, comparison, a performance comparison on the given data set of a different like link prediction technique. Uh, we can see that is that the heuristic method large uh, like the CN a uh, uh, common able uh, AA and the PP uh, H rank, um, which is based on the closed trend structure, uh, usual and the field to collect to predict the link exists, and also the subgraph based link prediction, a subgraph neural net based link prediction shows a parent advantage over the others on on our highly hierarchical and sparse data set. So, in conclusion, um, we present a highly hierarchical and sparse data set. Graph, which um, can use to benchmark and for the link prediction techniques. So our described analysis of this data set has demonstrated the high hierarchy in space, which makes the heuristic measures fail to work. And um, That we also uh, we also observed that the subgraph based GM models performance best among the given given the method given the um techniques. So, um, we believe that the telegraph can serve as important benchmark to assess to for the novel link prediction node um embedding techniques and the code that we have. Publish of code and the data set and the given links. So, I hope more um, researchers could um, join to propose to test their own, the, to test the uh, link prediction, to test their arguments on the given data set. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I think authors of the paper is here, uh, so we can also ask questions to them. Right. Let me uh, start with my question then. Um, purely cross structure based methods on your data set perform like extremely poorly uh, with AUC of zero point five or zero point five one. Do you think there are like features are ha having the majority of the weight uh, in link prediction quality, or is this is just the subclass of the models cannot leverage the tree like data? Hello. Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> can, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay. So, um, sorry for question. So, you you ask about the first the uh, GCN one or the the more comprehensive one? No, I'm actually asking about the simplest one. So, oh, the, the simplest uh, one. You mean you mean the draw. heuristic one? Yeah. yeah. According to our analysis, is that for the heuristic one, they are mainly um depend on the cluster triangle. Actually, uh, yes, depend on the cluster triangles of the topology. But for the highly tree-like or sparse data set, actually, the link between uh, the link between the nodes, they actually they're not have so much like uh, triangles and so on. So it's very hard for such kind of like uh, their measures to give the proper um, yeah, measures of the two to know they have should should have the links or not. Yeah. Thank you for the question. OK, Any thank you. Questions?
Great. Uh, if any further questions can be directed to the authors online, we will proceed with the next paper, benchmarking large-scale graph training over effectiveness and efficiency uh, with a large set of authors from uh, Rice University and UT Austin. Hello, everyone. It's my honor to give a presentation here. Today, I have shared uh, our new work on benchmarking large-scale graph training over effectiveness and efficiency. The authors of this work are from Data Lab at Rice University or Beta Lab of the University uh, of Texas at Austin. For your reference, we put the QR code of our repository down below. The graph neural networks have shown great prosperity in recent years and have dominated a variety of applications, including recommender systems, social network analysis, and so on. However, though the message passing strategy ensures genes uh, have a superior performance, the nature of involving massive topological structures prevents message passing based genes from scaling up to industrial applications. For example, training a gene-based recommender system over 7.5 billion items requires three days on a 16 GPU cluster, which is extremely costable. To facilitate understanding, we provide a unified formulation of message passing with K layers as follows, where A denotes the adjacent matrix, W is the transformation matrix, and sigma denotes the ReLU function. Based on this formulation, the k bottleneck of vanilla message passing lies on the computation of A times X, whose space complexity is O E plus N, where E is the number of edges and N is the number of nodes. For large-scale graphs, N and E are too large to be handled in a GPU. This constitutes to the main bottleneck for large-scale graph training with graph neural networks. Up to now, massive efforts have been made to mitigate the aforementioned issue of message passing. In general, previous works encompass two branches, sampling-based methods and decoupling-based methods. Briefly, sampling-based methods perform batch training that utilize sampled adjacent matrix to approximate the full batch message passing, such that the memory consumption is considerably reduced. Look at the general form. The BI here is the set of sampled nodes for the ith layer. Based on the way to construct a BI, we have three branches of sampling strategies, that is node-wise, layer-wise, and subgraph-wise sampling. For decoupling-based methods, the core idea is to compute or approximate A times X in CPUs such that we only need to store the node features into a GPU for training. Based on the processing stage, decoupling-based methods could further be divided into pre-computing and liberal propagation, where the former pre-processing A times X, while the later one do message passing in a post-processing manner. To perform a systematic study uh, and establish a fair benchmark for existing scalable GNs. From the perspective of effectiveness, we first perform a greedy hyperparameter searching for sampling based and decoupling based methods to find their sweet point and the best performance. The search space is defined in the table on the left, and we present an example of the searching results on the bottom right. The columns denote the searching hyperparameters, and the rows denote their exact values corresponding to the search space. We present some sample results here, all of which are representative methods for different branches. Like the graph stage are node-wise sampling-based methods, the latest are the layer-wise sampling-based methods, and cluster JSON are subgraph-wise sampling-based methods. Also, SJGN are the pre-computing based methods and the LP denotes the labor propagation. So we present, we test all these methods on three commonly used large scale datasets, 
Flickr, Reddit, and OpenBM products. We present a couple of observations here. Firstly, sampling-based methods are more sensitive to the hyperparameters related to message passing. According to the figure, in comparison with pre-computing, all sampling-based methods are non-sensitive to hyperparameters that are related to the feature transformation matrix, including weight decay, dropout, and hidden dimension, but particularly sensitive to the message passing-based hyperparameters, including the number of layers and batch size. For model depth, sampling-based methods generally achieve the sweet point when the number of layers is confined to shallow, like four uh, or two layers, and suffer from the oversmoothing problem as the GN models go deeper. However, this issue is moderately mitigated in decoupling-based methods as the model depth does not in align with the number of message passing top. Also, secondly, um, the data sets of different scales are dominated by different branches. As shown in the figure, quid and smooth, the label propagation algorithm outperforms the fallback training on the large, largest data set OJBM products by a large margin of 4.5%. In contrast, GraphSage significantly outperforms the other methods on the smallest data set Flickr. Also remarkably, our search results for GraphSage and uh, label propagation on OJB products, the largest data set, also reached better performance in comparison with the ones on the OJB leaderboard. Noticing that GraphSage encounters the auto memory runtime error with increasing depth. The observation partially indicates that, limited by model depth and the neighbor exploring problem, sampling-based methods is possibly not powerful for extreme large-scale graphs to learn expressive representations. In addition, the running speed and memory usage are also the crucial indicators for evaluation for large-scale graph training. To this end, we perform both theoretical and empirical evaluation over sampling-based and pre-computing-based methods. Here, we denote that we did not include label propagation uh, because it does not follow an end-to-end -end training manner. So we provide some uh, empirical observations here. So firstly, GraphSeed is significantly slower and occupies more memory compared to other baselines. This is partially because of the largest, the large neighbor sampling threshold we set and inherently owing to its own neighborhood exploring problem. Namely, to compute the loss for a single node, it requires the neighbor's embedding at the downstream layer recursively. And secondly, counterintuitively, SGC, a very simple model, does not occupy any activation memory during training. And finally, in general, the speed of decoupling-based methods is incomparable to sampling-based methods. So that's all for my today's sharing. Should you have any questions, please feel free to reach out through the emails at the bottom. All right, uh, thank you. I think uh, the author is also present, so we could have a quick question. Yeah, uh, so I have some questions. And uh, I want to ask, uh, have you uh, tested on like uh, basically catching or lazy update based methods such as uh, GN auto scale in your experiments? Um, actually, we have uh, do a survey on it, but we did include it because uh, according to our framework, we basically um, categorize them in two, two parts. The first one is the uh, sampling-based methods, and the second one is coupling-based methods. So uh, we think our framework can handle the most of the existing framework uh, existing methods, but for uh, GN auto scale, which uh, we think is a uh, kind of a completed system which uh, integrates uh, both parts, like the sampling and uh, the pre uh, decoupling bit methods. So for this work, we just only focus on some uh, basic part of the algorithm. Uh, algorithm. So for some more, um, I mean, the complex models, we did include it into the comparison, but uh, we add it into the related work. I see. So basically you think that the uh, 
a gene on scale is like on another dimension compared to the sampling and the, um, uh, the yeah, yeah, kind of. I see. Yeah, so uh, have you uh, also considered like, uh, I see that you measure the uh, speed by the, uh, basically the throughput and the uh, RAM usage. I think that's the CPU RAM usage. Um, that's the GPU, GPU memory usage. Yeah, the ah, GPU okay. memory usage. Yeah. Cool, cool. Yeah. So, uh, have you considered like uh, measure the uh, speed in the sense of the convergence speed of the model, like how the performance uh, like changes throughout the time in the training process? Um, yes, we do do the convergence analysis, but we do not include in the workshop version. So uh, for our experiment, um, I mean, the decoupling based methods usually have a more fast convergence and also smooth convergence because, um, you know, they just exclude the adjacent matrix out of the training process. So they can just train with a feature matrix, which uh, should expect the smoother and uh, faster. So for, uh, for the sampling-based methods where they include the adjacent matrix into training, um, they usually have a very noisy training process. And also sometimes it did not converge very, very well. So that's a very brief introduction. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the questions. Yes, indeed. Thank you for the questions. Uh, we will proceed with the next paper, a unified framework for rank-based evaluation metrics for link prediction in knowledge graphs, courtesy of Charles Stapley Hoyt, uh, Max Berendorf, uh, Michael Galkin, uh, Volker Tresp, and uh, Benjamin Giori. Hi. My name is Charlie Hoyt, and I'm going to present our manuscript entitled A Unified Framework for Rank-Based Evaluation Metrics for Link Prediction and Knowledge Graph. Equal credit for this work goes to Max Bauerndorf, and big thanks to Mikhail Volker and Ben for their supporting contributions as well. So most knowledge graph embedding models, like Dismolt and Transi, are trained and evaluated on the link prediction task. And during evaluation, a rank RI is calculated for each of the N entities in the knowledge graph typically by comparing known triples to sampled negative triples. The three most common summary statistics of these rankings are the hits at K, mean rank, and mean reciprocal rank. The hits at K is the average number of ranks that are lower than K, which is useful in situations like showing the top K results of a search. However, hits at K doesn't differentiate between close misses and far misses. The mean rank is defined as the average rank, which better reflects the full distribution of ranks but it's biased towards larger ranks and susceptible to outliers. And finally, the mean reciprocal rank applies the inverse to each rank before taking the average. It's biased more towards smaller ranks and doesn't completely regard the bigger ones like hits at K. So despite their ubiquity, there didn't already exist a theoretical framework for formulating these metrics that could help us reason about their different advantages and disadvantages. So here we're proposing a general form with three parts. First, there's a pre-transformation function applied to the ranks. In the case of hits at K, this is the indicator function. In the case of the mean reciprocal rank, this is the inverse function. And in the case of the mean rank, this is the identity. Second, there's an aggregation function. In each of these three common metrics, this is the arithmetic mean, which is a special case of the generalized Holder mean, where P equals one. Third is the post-aggregation function, which is the identity in each of our three metrics, but this will be useful later on. Interestingly, this general form also allows us to reformulate the mean reciprocal rank using the harmonic mean, uh, a special case of the generalized Hilder mean where P is negative one, and using the inverse as the post-aggregation. Through the lens of these two Pythagorean means, we can better understand why the mean rank is biased towards large ranks, while the mean reciprocal rank is biased towards small ones, despite their codomains having different properties and being on different scales. So using this general form, we can better articulate four desirable properties for rank-based metrics. Since all of our metrics are defined with the monotonically increasing mean aggregation, it's convenient to describe these in terms of the pre-aggregation function. First, we want the optimal value of the metric to happen with a rank of one, which is the best possible rank. This happens in the mean reciprocal rank and hits at K, but not in the mean rank. Second, we want the worst value of the metric to happen as ranks get bigger and approach the maximum possible rank. 
And so here we're using infinity as an informal shorthand for that. Again, the mean reciprocal rank and hits at k satisfy this. And third, we want the ranking function to be anti-monotonic, meaning that bigger ranks mean unique worse values, which is only true for the mean reciprocal rank. And fourth, most importantly for this work, is that we don't want the expected value of the metric to be based on the size and topology of the data set, which we denote as ni. There are several motivations for improving these metrics, and most importantly, enabling the better interpretability and comparability of results on different data sets. As an example from drug discovery, you might want to formulate a biomedical knowledge graph using different combinations of resources to generate better drug disease link predictions. But this would result in different sized graphs with different topologies whose evaluation results currently aren't readily comparable. Just to send this notion home, we simulated the evaluation across random data sets to show that the expected value and the variance of each metric increases with data set size and show this in the first row of the chart. So inspired by previous work from Berendorf et al, we propose three statistical adjustments that can be applied to all of the base rank-based evaluation metrics that change their statistical properties. And this works because we can assume that all ranks are independent and identically distributed random variables with a discrete uniform distribution. So the first adjustment normalizes the expectation to one. This isn't super applicable to rank, uh, metrics like the mean reciprocal rank where the range is between zero and one. Second, we propose an adjustment by both the expectation and the optimal value, which maps the best value to one, the expected value to zero, and all worst values to negative numbers bounded by a constant related to the expectation of the base metric. Finally, we propose an adjustment equivalent to z-scoring in which the expectation is subtracted and the value is normalized by its standard deviation. And this works because of the central limit theorem, and it gives us a very simple statistical perspective to the results, which can also be interpreted using the inverse CDF of a standard Gaussian distribution. So each of these adjustments takes the notions of a base metric and helps them satisfy our original four desiderata that we started with. So overall, we've proposed several derived metrics from the three presented in the beginning, as well as some additional ones based on the geometric mean and alternative post-aggregation functions, which we're not covering in this presentation, but we detail a bit more in our manuscripts. We've included detailed descriptions of the assumptions and the derivations for all of the following slides in the appendix of our manuscripts. And we also provide implementations of each of these in the PyKeen software package, so you can get them right now using the latest version from PIP. So as a case study to demonstrate these new metrics, we want to present how they can be more interpretable in practice. First, we reevaluated a few standard data sets with a few different flavors of knowledge graph embedding models. And there's a few major insights just from this one picture, focusing on the mean reciprocal rank. First, the base metric suggests that complex performs similarly on WordNet 18, RR, and nations. But the adjusted metric and the z-adjusted metric show that the difference is actually more remarkable. Second, the base metric suggests that Tucker performs better on nations than on WordNet 18RR, but the adjusted metric and the z-adjusted metric show that when improving comparability by adjusting for size effects, Tucker actually performs better on WordNet 18RR. Both the base metric and the adjusted metric display an anti-correlation with dataset size that's not present for the z-adjusted metric, disregarding the smallest data set for which there's a numerical behavior uh, of the adjustments that's slightly erratic. And finally, the z-adjusted metric enables a direct comparison between the results on different data sets, while also giving insight into their significance by normalizing against the expectations and variance of the metric under random rankings. This adjustment reveals that the improved original metric on the two smaller data sets, kinships and nations, were actually less significant than the results on the two larger data sets, WordNet18RR and FreeBase15K237, yeah, despite the achieving better unnormalized performance. So, so because of the formulation of these adjustments, they are affine, which means they can be applied as a linear transformation after the fact. As a last remark, we pre-computed these values for all of the data sets in PyKeen in a few different scenarios so that they can be reused by anybody, even after the fact, regardless of how they trained and evaluated their knowledge graph embedding models, even with a different software package. So this data set's available on Zenodo under the CC0 license. So we've done our best to make sure that the work we presented is robust, reusable, and useful. All of the code and data are available through these links, as well as the surprisingly tricky derivations of the expectations and variances of each of the base rank-based metrics. 
Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, and we have authors available for the questions. And the first question is already present in the chat. Um, so when we change the evaluation metrics, should we change the training loss as well from uh, Guan Ming Yao? Um, short answer is no. The, the training and the evaluation processes are completely split up. And um, I'd say that you don't have to necessarily change the evaluation metric. You can apply many different evaluation metrics to the same evaluation. Uh, let's say you're doing rank-based evaluation, you generate all these ranks, and then you have different ways of aggregating them and different ways of post-processing them as we presented these uh, sort of adjustments or post-processing steps that can be done after you've already computed the base metrics. Thank you for the question. Any more questions from the audience? All right, let me then ask maybe, you know, I think the kind of ranking literature already possesses the most metrics, uh, you know, known to men. And now you have three variants of these metrics uh, produced uh, from this paper. So like which metrics would you recommend uh, a new paper to use? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. So it depends what your task is. I think the, the hits at K is sort of this discretized version and, and actually, there's a lot of other ranking metrics in like the information retrieval literature, for example. And so we focused on these three because these are the ones that people present in the knowledge graph embedding and link prediction literature. And it's awfully hard to get a whole community to change what rankings they're doing because of all of these weird incentives people have for how they publish papers. So um, it really depends what you're trying to do. If you're Google, using hits at K is probably good because people don't go to the second page. Um, if you want a really good representation of your, your whole work. I think the mean rank and the adjusted versions of the mean rank are probably the best way to go at this point. But you know, there's also people who are interested more in the mean reciprocal rank because it's a, a softer version of hits at K. So, so in this, I think you should look at all three of these different kinds of ranks and you know, picking the right K is, is very difficult. That's not within the scope of this work. Um, so yeah, not, not a very good answer, sorry. <laughs> well, it's uh, also good because it leads a lot to the future work. Um, thanks a lot. Um, and the further questions, as usual, can be directed to the authors offline. We will proceed with the next uh, and last paper in this section, after which we will have a break. Uh, the paper is titled KG Tuner, Efficient Hyperparameter Search for Knowledge Graph Learning uh, by Yong Ki Zhang and their authors. Hello, I'm Aaron. I'm going to talk about our work, KG Turner, Efficient Hyperparameter Search for Knowledge Graph Learning. I'm Chen Ming Yao. This is the last line. Let's first see the background part. Knowledge Graph Learning tries to encode load entities and relations in KG into a low dimensional vector space and try to measure the possibility of a fact using the scoring function. For example, we are Defend and Mona Lisa. Generally, knowledge graph learning methods has four components: scoring function, negative sample, loss function evaluation, and finally optimization tactics. And this is how the frameworks will look like. We have many hyperparameters in knowledge graph learning, like negative sample, loss function, regularization, optimizations. Note that scoring function are architecture, so not these are not covered here. And this figure shows a typical configuration in this hyperparameter space. In the literature of large graph learning, there is a low efficient hyperparameter search algorithm to turn hyperparameters. So the objective of KG Turner is to design a search algorithm to efficiently turn hyperparameter for large graph learning. So what kind of properties do we have in large graph learning? Now let's understand the hyperparameters here. Okay, let's first see the search problem. In the higher level, we need to search hyperparameters using the validation set. In the lower level, we need to train the model parameter p. So this is a classical pipeline of hyperparameter search. The algorithm generates a configuration in the space and evaluate on the validation performance. The three major aspects for efficiently solve this problem is the size of the space, validation curvature, and the evaluation cost. First, let's see how each individual hyperparameter can affect model performance. 
Generally, we observe that HP can be classified into four groups. First, in this group, we can see Adam can almost be sure the best optimizer, so the choice is fixed. And then for the learning rate, we can see too large or too small are not good. So for continuous hyperparameters, the range can be limited. And for batch size and dimension size, the performance is momentarily related with the, this size. And finally, for the last group, there is a low observed pattern for, for example, regulator and initializer. Next, let's see the validation curvature. We consider three types of predictor here, Gaussian process, MLP, and random forest. This is the ground truth. We can see it is very complex and contain many, many local optimals. Compared with GP and MLP, we can see random forest can better approximate the ground truth. This can also be seen from the MSE result. It is the lowest. So the observation here is that random forest is better in approximation the curvature. Finally, let's see how each window hyperparameters can affect the model training time. Let's see the dimension size. The time cost grows linearly with the dimension size. And then for the batch size, the trend is similar. However, for other hyperparameters like the regulator, their effects on the time cost is not that obvious. More interestingly, we can see when changing other hyperparameters, the ranking correlation of batch size and dimension size still very, very high. This means that the batch size and dimension size less correlate with other hyperparameters. Another key factor contributed to the model training time is the size of the graph. So here we examine that if we subsample small subgraphs from the original big graph, then how the performance can correlate with the original graph. This figure shows the trade-off. So we can see the time cost grows very high as the subgraph gets larger, and the correlation also quickly gets very high. And our observation here is that to balance the consistency and the cost, a subgraph with about 20% loss can be a good choice. Let's briefly summarize the observation here. For the space, hyperparameter can be generally classified into four groups, fixed, limited choice, momentous related, and the low obvious pattern. And for the validation curvature, it is very complex, but random forest can serve a good surrogate model. And finally, on the evaluation cost, dimension size significantly affects the running time, but not coupled with other hyperparameters. And a subgraph can provide good trade-off between average cost and accuracy. So, how to design an algorithm based on above observations? Now, let's design the two-stage searching algorithm. First, there is a pre-processing step. As we can see, some hyperparameters can be shrinked, and some can be decoupled. So, by shrink this range of hyperparameters and decouple these hyperparameters, we will reduce, obtain a reduced space, and the reduced space is about 1 over 7 size of the full original space. Now, let's enter the first stage, and in this stage, the search algorithm will use random forest as a predictor. It selects configurations from the reduced space, not the original big space, and the candidate will be evaluated on the subgraph instead of the original subgraph. So, in this stage, the algorithm will generate top 10 configurations based on the reduced search space and the subgraph. With top 10 candidates, now we enter the stage 2. In this stage, we need to get the exact performance on the original big graph. So, we free the batch size and the dimension size and evaluate those 10 candidates on the original big kg. Finally, let's summarize our search algorithm part. It has three steps. Preprocessing from the original to reduced base and stage 1, exploration on the reduced base, and stage 2, exploitation with the fine tuning. And this figure show where previous observations are used. The observation on search space help to reduce the space, and the observation on evaluation help to reduce the cost in the first and the second stage and the evaluation in the curvature help to construct the search algorithm. Then, let's see the experiment. Compared with the previous hyperparameter search algorithm, we can see KG Turner is much faster and better. However, note that the starting point is not from zero point because the KG Turner has two stages. 
Next, in the next part, we can see KG Turner achieved better performance than both original reported results and reproduced results in public KG learning toolbox. And in the right part, we can see existing results on OGB leaderboard can be significantly improved by turning hyperparameters with KG Turner. Finally, we show some takeaway messages. In this paper, by a comprehensive understanding of hyperparameters, we propose an efficient two-stage search algorithm named KG Turner. Finally, there are some limitations and future directions of our work. First, we can apply GN to solve the scaling problem, then combine hyperparameter search with the neural architecture search. Finally, consider transfer across different datasets and model and tasks. Last but not the least, thanks for your attention. And this is our code, and this is my email address. And postdoc over the PSTD position are available. Welcome to contact me. Thanks a lot for the presentation. We can take a question now. Okay, um, so maybe as a question from my side, uh, there is a significant startup time for the KG tuner. Um, how would I would how could I reduce that startup time? You know that gap uh, between zero. Oh, start, and uh, okay, okay. Uh, there is a budget. Okay, in our algorithm. <clears throat> okay, for generally for hyperparameter tuning algorithm, we have a budget on the total running time, right? And actually, assume the budget is B, and we can manually split it in B1 and B2. And in this paper, we just split it equally, 5%, uh, half in the first stage and half in the second stage. And we set it by default and test it on all experiments, and we find it work fine. And we want to do, and if we want to reduce the time cost in the first stage, we can set it B1 to be some, some number smaller. But indeed, there is uh, some trade-off here. Maybe uh, others can try on their own data set. So now I, I think let's move on to the, our pre paper presentation session. So in this session, we have three papers and um, we will begin with the contributed talk uh, with title, A Heterogeneous Graph Benchmark for Misinformation on Twitter. And this is a work done by Dan Nielsen and Ryan McConville from University of Bristol. Okay. Hello, my name is Dan Sotrop Nielsen. I'm from the University of Bristol in the UK, and I'm here to present uh, a paper which I wrote with Ryan McConville called a heterogeneous graph benchmark for misinformation on Twitter. So firstly, let's talk about what misinformation is. So I'm not going to give a precise definition here, but I'm going to give a few examples of misinformation to give an idea of what it is. So firstly, here's a social media post which is talking about the tragic deaths of pilots from several airlines. And it's hinting at all of these pilots uh, being dead because they were all vaccinated. And this is a piece of misleading uh, information since all the deaths were unrelated. Second claim here uh, concerns Christian Eriksen, the Danish football player who suddenly collapsed during the uh, football Euros. And um, the claim here is that he collapsed due to him having received the Pfizer vaccine in the days leading up to the match. So this is wrong for two reasons. Firstly, he wasn't even vaccinated with the vaccine from Pfizer and his condition was furthermore unrelated to vaccines in general. So the issues with manual fact checking is that many resources are being used. Uh, there's often a delay from the utterance of the claim to when we have a fact check ready. 
uh, that can take up to a day or two. Uh, and lastly, all claims for obvious reasons cannot be fact-checked since there are thousands of claims being uttered, but we only have limited amount of people uh, working professionally with fact-checking. So this leads to using automatic fact-checking methods, which leads to uh, developing machine learning models in this space. And to train such machine learning models, we need data sets. But what is currently missing from the misinformation data sets are that most of them only contain one to two modalities, which is um, such as things such as text and images and comments and videos and so on. Most of them only contain text and some of them contain some images as well. Second point is most of the data sets are quite small. And as we all know, machine learning models uh, requ usually require large data sets to work properly. And thirdly, uh, almost every data set is monolingual, but all claims in the world cannot arise from a, an English speaking country. So just disregarding everything which is not English or Chinese for that matter, those are the two languages um, often used in mi uh, current misinformation data sets. Uh, so disregarding everything which does not belong to those two languages is ruling out a lot of, of claims and a lot of fact checks. So this led us to build a new data set, which we call the Moomin data set. Um, and this is a kind of a short timeline of, of the steps that led up to the construction of it, or which was part of the construction of the data set. So the first step was to collect a bunch of claims, like from these professional fact checking institutes. This is where we used uh, Google has an API called the Google Fact Check API, which connects you to hundreds of different professional fact checking organizations around the world. Uh, so from this API, we collected about 130,000 claims in roughly 50 different languages. The problem with these claims and associated verdicts is that the verdicts are in plain text. They are not categorized as misleading or factual or anything of that sort, but they can be anything. They could be obvious things such as true or false, but it could also be uh, this could be true, but it's missing some context and maybe it's true. We don't really know at the moment and things of that sort. And it doesn't uh, only contain verdicts in English. Of course, it contains verdicts in whichever language the fact checking organization is uh, speaking or writing in. So this verdict classifier um, so we, this led us to train a verdict classifier, which is a fine-tuned transformer model. Like we chose the uh, multilingual XLM Roberta model, uh, the base version. And towards this, we manually annotated 2,500 unique verdicts and translated those to the roughly 65 uh, languages um, on the um, Google Fact Check API. So this verdict classifier, it takes a plain text verdict in any of the languages and it spits out a verdict, um, whether it's misinformation or factual or other. Um, everything which is other is, uh, they are verdicts which are not really verdicts, but merely discussing the claim or saying that we don't have enough information to give a proper verdict. So we will so every claim which received the other verdict or other label uh, was thrown out of the data set. So this model here is also available uh, at the URL below, hf.co forward slash satrapdan uh, forward slash verdict dash classifier. So this Verdict classifier, among the two classes that we care about, factual and misinformation, it achieved uh, almost 99% test macro average F1. So it's quite reliable. So from this model, we now have binary labels. Uh, the last thing is 
that we want to connect the claims up to tweets and the surrounding tweet context because we want to um, extract as much social media context as possible to provide context around the claim to be able to generalize two new claims and new events. So this fetching and linking of tweets was done via um, a model which we call the semantic linking model. So the way it works is as follows. We start with the claim. Then from the claim, we use a machine learning model transformer based to extract five key phrases. With these, each of these five key phrases, we conduct a query on Twitter via the API to get a thousand tweets which are related to uh, the given key phrase and also which were posted around the same days as the claim was uttered. If the tweet contain, uh, contains an article, we also take the article, we summarize the article, and lastly, we connect up the claims and the tweets and the summaries um, by embedding all three using the same transformer architecture, the same pre-trained transformer, and then computing the cosine similarity between both claim and tweet embedding and claim and summary embedding. If that's above a certain threshold, either one of the two pairs, then we link up the claim and the tweet. So this also gives us labels, again, misinformation and factual labels for all of, this, uh, all of the tweets. So I note here that the tweets that we um, get via this Twitter search are so-called source tweets. So they are not replies or retweets or anything of that sort, but they are the ones that have initiated a Twitter thread, if you will. They're the ones sharing an image or sharing an article uh, related to a claim. Okay, so now we have, we have the claims, we have binary labels, we have the source tweets. So the last link here is to extract the context um, around the social media context around the so, uh, source tweets. So the social media context is described here. So this is also the graph structure of our data set, the Moomin data set. And starting from the top, we have the claims and the tweets. So this is the source tweets. Um, further, we have collected the replies to the tweets, which can both be a reply and a quote tweet. Um, we also have the associated users, which are both the authors of the source tweets and the replies, but also the users who follow the author or are followed by the author, um, or who simply retweeted the source tweet and so on. We also collect the articles, as I mentioned before, as well as the images and hashtags and collected all these relations that you see here, which are all natural uh, with respect to the structure of Twitter. So the result is that we get, so out of the 130 odd uh, thousand claims, we managed to link up roughly 10% of them to um two tweets two source tweets so we have about thirteen thousand claims 95 percent of them are misinformation so it's a heavily um, imbalanced data set so this is because uh this is representative of the data distribution from the fact-checking institutes they tend to fact check things that end up being misinformation um these 13,000 claims have been linked up to roughly 26,000 source tweets. And uh, surrounding these source tweets are a bit more than 21 million tweets. So these are timelines of, or sample of timelines of associated users, as well as replies to the tweets. Uh, we also have about 2 million users, 41 different languages, 11,000 articles and more than 6,500 images. We furthermore did a cluster analysis of the claims. So this is a HDB scan um, clustering of the 13,000 linked claims. 
um, which were split into roughly 30 different clusters. Half of the claims belong to one cluster, which is the purple cluster you see on the right, which all are related to COVID. Um, so aside from analyzing the data set, the claims in the data set, we also use these clusters to provide proper uh, train validation test splits of the data set so that the events covered in each of the splits are distinct. So this is a property that we would want in a misinformation data set because if we train a misinformation classifier today and a new event uh, breaks out next year leading to a lot of misinformation, we want to be able to still use our model uh, with these new events. So we trained a handful of different performance baselines as well to have an idea of how difficult this task is of predicting uh, whether um, a tweet is uh, misinformation or discusses misinformation or discusses something factual. So all of these are macro average of one scores. Uh, and we see the random prediction is about 37%. Then we have an image only classifier around close to 49%. If we always predict misinformation, then we also get around 49%. Keep in mind that we had 95% misinformation. Next, we have a text uh, transformer based text model, uh, which achieves a roughly 53%. And lastly, we have a graph based model, a heterogeneous graph sage. Uh, model which beats the other significantly, achieving a macro average F1 score of more than 61%, but there's still a lot of room for improvement. Lastly, we have the Moomin website uh, URL seen here, moomin-dataset.github.io, and this website contains a getting started guide um, as well as a tutorial will, which will uh, help you get started with the data set um, as well as analyze the data set and uh, build models surrounding um, the tasks in the data set. So this could be the tweet classification tasks that I, um, that I displayed before. So the data set cannot be simply shared as a file, it has to be compiled, unfortunately. And that's due to Twitter's terms of use uh, requires us to only share the tweet IDs. Um, but we have developed a Python package also called Moomin, uh, can be installed pip install Moomin, and which enables very easy compilation of the data set. On the website, you can also find a leaderboard as well as links to paper and source code. Thank you so much for your attention. Oh, John, uh, you're, you're muted. You're muted. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so thanks, Dan, for the great presentation. And uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, do, do, is there any questions from the audience? Mm, if not, I will go with one of my questions, I think. So uh, I think uh, basically the task you are describing in this work is uh, try to predict the um, try, try to predict which tweet is misinformation and which is not so besides that application do you see like this data set can be applied to um, other like task or scenarios yes yeah, so we at least in the paper we're considering two different tasks which are quite similar like the first one is this tweet classification task the second one is focused on the claim side of things so a claim classification task where the main difference is that as i mentioned in the graph schema that a claim is connected up 
to many different source tweets, so you get a lot more context surrounding the claim, and therefore it should be easier technically to uh, to predict whether a claim is misinformation or not, just because you have more uh, more context for that claim compared to only having a single uh, Twitter thread. So those are that's one different task. Does that make sense? Like classifying whether the claim is misinformation rather than classifying uh, whether a tweet is discussing misinformation. So it's like I a big bro bit broader, if you will. Other than that, of course, the, the data set itself is not restricted to uh, prediction tasks, of course. Like the data set is or can be valuable as well, purely from an analytic point of view. Yeah, if you're interested in, um, I don't know, images, uh, misinformation images, which hashtags those are uh, related to, for instance, you can pull that information out of the graph. Um, from a graph prediction point of view, um, I think we only considered those two tasks. You could also frame it, I suppose, as a graph classification task instead, but it would be quite quite similar, like where each thread with all the context would be an isolated graph, if you will. I see. Uh, and uh, another question I have is basically, you mentioned that the data set you currently have is highly imbalanced. So uh, yeah, basically, let's say if I have a predictor, predictor which basically predicts everything as misinformation, uh, have you tested how that would result in the F1 score in the benchmark? Oh yeah, so it was included in the benchmark uh, as well, or in the slide. So that was, uh, it was roughly equal to the score if you use the vision transformer, like the image only model, but even the text only model beat the, uh, the model, if you want to call it that, that only predicts misinformation. And the graph stage model like uh, beats that even further. I think the um, if you only predict misinformation, your macro average F1 score will be roughly around 49%, uh, where the graph stage model was over 60. So you do get like significantly more than simply just predicting misinformation. But it is a good point. It is very uh, imbalanced this data set and. We did think about whether we should alleviate that. Uh, other papers have done so by, for instance, saying or more or less dictating that we trust some sources, it could be BBC or CNN or whatever, and then pull down a lot of claims from those sources and use those as true or non-misinformation. Um, but what we feared was that the data distribution would just be significantly different like we hypothesized that people would interact differently with uh, claims like that, like non-novel claims, if you will, like boring claims, uh, and that would artificially make the task too easy. So we tried kind of to to stay pure, if you will, and, and keep the data as is, and then people can always uh, add onto this data set and add more um, extra data if they feel like that will increase the performance. The data collection uh, system that we use is all open source. Uh, there's a link on the Moment website as well. Cool. Yeah, thank you very much. And I see an additional question from the chat panel, but I don't think uh, we will have time to discuss this online. So uh, I, if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out the author uh, offline, and I think they will be happy to discuss. And with that, let's move on to our next uh, paper presentation on um, what's wrong with deep learning in tree search for combinatorial optimization from Maximilian and their collaborators at Hassel Plattner Institute and the Demi College of Tel Aviv and University of Porter. Hello and welcome everybody to the presentation of our paper What's Wrong with Deep Learning and Research for Combinatorial Optimization. I'm Max and I'm presenting here with Otto today 
at uh, GMB. And this is a paper that was originally accepted at ICRR this year, but as it's of high relevance to the graph learning community and especially like benchmarking and evaluation, uh, we are very glad that we can share this with you guys because uh, we have like two main contributions and like the important methodological uh, contribution is that we show the importance of thorough evaluations and baselines, especially in a fast paced, fast evolving field such as machine learning. Just because a paper claims something, and this includes our paper, we should not take it for granted and always try to, to understand the evaluations, the approach, and also the code. And of course, like content-wise, we show here that a well-known paper in the deep learning for combinatorial optimization community is uh, not reproducible, give like some further evaluations of different solvers for, for combinatorial optimization problems, and maybe take some, some guesses into the future. So let's get started, right? And we get started by discussing what an independent set actually is. So an independent set is a set of non-adjacent vertices. So of course the empty set is an independent set, any set containing just a single vertex is an independent set. Or if you take a look here on the screen on the blue vertices, all these together form an independent set because none of them are adjacent, neighbored, so to say, they're not directly connected. What like combinatorial optimization people often want to do is finding the largest of these independent sets. Unfortunately, though, this problem is NP-hard, so we have to be smart when solving it. And different communities have tried to solve it in a smart way, and the machine learning community has proposed one algorithm, and this algorithm is also known to other communities, but the machine learning community has made use of it, the so-called tree search. And you can think of the tree search as a kind of smart brute force algorithm. And for this algorithm, first of all, we make the assumption that we can query an oracle um, for probabilities. And the probabilities this oracle gives us is the probability of each vertex to belong to our final solution. So if we do that now, we get these probabilities for this example graph here. So we know that the vertex on the upper left side belongs to the solution with a probability of 85%. And now what we do is basically an iterative process of assigning vertices to our solution based on their probabilities. For this, we mark probabilities that belong to our solution as blue, and we mark vertices that don't belong to our solution as orange, and for all other vertices where we haven't decided yet, they, are stay, uh, they stay grayed out. So we start, of course, with the vertex that has the highest probability of belonging to our solution and mark it as part of the solution. And now, because an independent set, by definition, cannot contain neighboring vertices, we have to mark this vertex as orange. And now we do this iteratively. Now we take the 76 vertex, mark it as part of the solution, and all of its neighbors cannot be part of the solution anymore. And then last, of course, the 75 vertex can be part of the solution again. And this is what we get based on the probabilities that the oracle gives us. Of course, if the oracle would have given us completely different probabilities, our solution would have uh, been different. And also, in this case, it worked out well because there was no conflict. So we didn't want to label a vertex, the part of the solution that we have already labeled, not part of the solution. How we deal with those cases, you can read up about in our paper. But this is the important baseline algorithm. And now Otto will take over uh, to discuss more in detail, uh, like this oracle. Yeah, so and comment approach, what to use as an oracle is, well, we could use a GNN, a graph neural network. And a well-cited paper that did this what was the Lee et al. paper at Europe's 2018. And we want to quickly look at their optimization pipeline, which is kind of um, taking the rough shape of the tree search that Maxi just outlined. Um, so we have our input graph, and before it even gets to the graph neural network, we pass it through a graph reduction, which is an algorithmic approach, which aims to make the instance smaller and easier to solve. Only then the reduced graph is put into the graph convolutional layers, which um, also called GCNs, and um, which gives us then the uh, probability maps from which we can label our nodes. And if we get a complete labeling, that means we have no nodes with unlabeled label basically left. Well, we put this labeling, this labeled graph through another 
algorithmic approach, this time the so-called local search, which is kind of um, similar to an evolutionary algorithm, which aims to make the solution even better. And if we still have unlabeled vertices, we repeat this process and pass it through the graph reduction again and then through the GCN again. And what we don't want to emphasize here is that we have these algorithmic approaches baked in into the tree search. So it's not just the GNN at work here. And well, we want to look at the evaluations we have done. And we can see five different plots here for five different data sets, basically. And in those different configurations um, with different parts of the tree search enabled or disabled. And the bottom line of this is basically that we can replace the GNN part, so the probability maps it puts out with random noise and basically get the same performance, which leads to the conclusion that the GNN is actually not learning anything at all. And all the work is basically done by the by these algorithmic approaches we have seen earlier. And this also wraps up our paper where we compare and analyze different tree search algorithms, but also other approaches like reinforcement learning, um, like used in the paper, learning what to defer, and also classical server, uh, solvers like Kurobi. We all um, bake them into an all-in-one benchmarking suite that unifies the way they um, are handled, they are evaluated, and also creates all the data sets that we used for our evaluation. The QR code you can see leads directly to our code repository. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and we are looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Maximilian, for the and Otto for the presentation. And I see Maximilian is here. And is there any question from the audience? So um, if there are no questions from the audience, uh, I have a question on that. I think the conclusion of the work is that basically the GM model seems not to be helpful in this task. So uh, have you like considered what may be the reason behind this or is there any ways to uh, solve this issue? Yes, I mean, this is actually getting to the, to the core of the problem. So the question is, why do the GNN outputs not learn something in a meaningful way? And uh, we, when, when like debugging this, uh, couldn't really like figure out what the problem is. There have been like more theoretical works pointing towards the idea that GNNs should actually be more used for problems that are in P. So like in solvable and polynomial time, like shortest paths, for example, while maximum independence set is an NP hard problem and it like theory papers at least uh, some some very recent works have shown that solving NP hard problems with GNNs might not be uh, what what they really should be used for and it, it could be that there's just a limitation in, in the current architectures that we use uh, so, so that the structure of the independent sets is, is not easily learnable um, on the other hand, um, we, we also discussed the learning what to defer solver, which, so which is reinforcement learning, but still using graph neural network architecture. And there we get much more reasonable results, at least compared to the tree search. So I guess the, the obvious next step is now knowing, like having evaluated all the different solvers, all the different setups, finding out for what problems GNN might be appropriate, like theoretically and experimentally. And then uh, yeah, finding out the reason, what, what is the actual bottleneck on, on the different problems? And it could be, 
I probably the, the inherent structure of the solutions, but we really did not figure out at this point what the what the problem here uh, might be. I see. Yeah, that that sounds great. And thanks for the answer. Yes, you're right. Um, all right. Uh, I think uh, let's move on to our next presentation uh, on a content-first benchmark for self-supervised graph representation learning. Uh, this work is done by my lab mate, Pooja Chivity, and her collaborators, Mark Hyman, Ekdi Lubna, Danai Kutcher, and Jaya Raman from Lawrence Livermore National Library and uh, University of Michigan. Hello everyone. I'm excited to present our paper, a content first benchmark for self-supervised graph representation learning. This work was done with my collaborators, Mark, Akdeep, Denai, and Jay. Interactive learning is a popular SSL paradigm that learns representations by enforcing similarity between augmented or positive pairs and enforcing dissimilarity between negative samples, which are typically other samples in the batch. You et al. proposed generic graph augmentations, or GGAs, as a first-pass all-purpose augmentation strategy for graphs. These augmentations include masking node graph attributes, dropping or adding edges, dropping nodes, and sampling subgraphs. Notably, GGAs assume that limited changes to a graph structure or its features will not change its semantics or label. The empirical success of contrastive learning, especially in visual representation learning, has spurred a lot of interest in understanding the properties that make it successful. Underlying many of these analyses is the assumption that there exists a latent space in augmentation strategy that, fall, that satisfies the following data dependent properties. Augmentation should be recoverable, meaning that augmented samples should share the label of the sample from which they were generated. Furthermore, there should exist a latent space where samples and their augmentations can be well classified or separated. Finally, augmentation should only alter task irrelevant information and preserve task relevant information, which leads to task relevant invariance. Now, while these assumptions are well known to hold in visual contrastive learning, it's not clear if these assumptions are going to hold for graph contrastive learning, where we work with non-Euclidean and discrete samples. Therefore, in this work, we focus on the interplay between the data dependent assumptions I mentioned and graph contrastive learning. Specifically, we'll investigate the invariance induced by GGAs on benchmark graph classification data sets. And then we'll go on to propose our own synthetic data generation process that introduces recoverable content aware augmentations and has controllable data set separability. Finally, we'll evaluate a number of different graph SSL paradigms on our proposed data set. Let's begin with our study on GGAs and invariants. We asked the question if GGAs induce task relevant invariances on standard benchmarks. Now recall that CL maximizes representational similarity between augmented samples. So over the course of training, representations will become invariant to this augmentation. We can measure this invariance by looking at the expected distance between positive samples shown in that equation. If augmentations lead to task relevant invariance, we would expect that improved invariance would also improve downstream task performance. And we see if this is true for various graph SSL methods by reporting the change in KN and accuracy and also the change in invariance with respect to an untrained model across a number of different data sets. Now we find that GGAs do not necessarily induce task relevant invariances. Indeed, the relationship between invariance and accuracy is not always clear. For example, on the Reddit data set, we see that invariance has increased, but accuracy has actually decreased. While in reconstruction methods, we see that invariance decreases, but accuracy increases, likely due to the use of a decoder. These results suggest that GGAs on benchmark data sets are perhaps misaligned with graph contrastive learning, as inducing task relevant invariances is really one of the main objectives of contrastive learning. Therefore, we propose a synthetic data generation process that allows us to use recoverable content aware augmentations and control data set separability. So we're a little bit better aligned with the objectives of CL. One of the potential causes for the mismatch that we just saw 
is that GGAs have unknown recoverability on standard benchmarks because it's unclear how whether they alter task relevant information or content and potentially alter the sample semantics. Therefore, our synthetic data generation process, which was inspired by work in GNN explainability and some recent analysis of SSL, will use motifs to define the content and also determine sample semantics. For example, these are the motifs that we're going to use to define each of the classes in our subsequent experiment, therefore fixing the content information we wish to preserve. We can now define content aware augmentations that do exactly this, preserve the structure of the motifs and induce invariance to style. And here we're going to define style using random graph generators, such as trees that I show there. Combining the content and the style, we can generate many different uh, samples to perform a classification task. Moreover, our data set allows us to control the style versus content ratio or separability over samples by varying the size of that background graph. And since we have content aware augmentations, we can actually learn style invariance, which means that the performance of models will not decrease as that style ratio increases. Indeed, content aware augmentations are going to serve as sort of a gold standard that we hope other graph SSL methods and augmentations will be able to recover. So now we evaluate a number of methods on our proposed data set. Specifically, we look at GraphCL, spectral contrastive loss, uh, various autoencoding approaches, and advanced automated augmentation approaches. Here we're going to train all models with an SVC ratio of four. As expected, we see that content aware augmentations do induce style invariance as the performance does not significantly deteriorate as the style ratio increases. However, this is not true for GGAs, and indeed using aggressive GGAs harms performance more severely as they are more likely to destroy content information. We also see that reconstruction methods really struggle to match the performance of CL methods, perhaps due to the difficulty of just training those methods. Most surprisingly, we see that automated augmentation methods are actually unable to recover a style invariant solution, seen by the decrease in performance as the style ratio increases. Notably, Zhao, which uses a bi-level optimization to select augmentations and learn a strategy from over a prior set, still fails to induce style invariant uh, invariance, even when we include a content-aware augmentation in the prior set of augmentations. This suggests there's much room to improve augmentation strategies in graph SSL. We summarize our contributions and takeaways here. We show that GGAs do not induce task relevant invariances on graph classification data sets. We propose a useful synthetic data generation process, and we evaluated different graph SSL techniques on our proposed data set. We think our proposed benchmark will be especially useful in evaluating uh, novel automated augmentation methods, as there is a ground truth that we wish those methods to recover, and also evaluating various graph SSL methods under different generalization conditions where the definition of style is flexible and changes. Furthermore, we hope you stay tuned for follow up work where we perform a theoretical analysis on the generalization of GraphCL with GGAs and also where we plan to extend our synthetic data generation process using spectral graph theory and perturbation theory. Thank you for listening to my talk. Please feel free to send any questions to the email address listed. Thank you. Thank you, Pooja, for the presentation. And I see Pooja is here. So uh, is there any question from the audience? If not, then uh, I have a question on the style choose for generating the synthetic graph. So uh, I'm wondering uh, how, like we, what are the styles that you have looked into? And I know that you mentioned that you look into the trees in the presentation and how, do you have any ideas on how the style choice should be different based on different contexts or different applications? 
Hi, John. Um, Hi. Yeah, so we did another experiment where we didn't use the tree graph, we used the BA graph. Um, those results were a little bit uh, preliminary, but we did see that the, the classification task given the same uh, content motifs does become uh, much harder. One of the other things that we'd like to explore more in depth, right, is that um, changing, like changing the size of the style content is one thing you can do, but also you could um, go from like tree generators to a different type of background graph, like BA or ER or whatever you, you decide to use. Um, uh, so, so I guess the, the choice of the style content definitely does depend upon um, what application you have. And I think it can be used to do sort of more interesting generalization tests too. Like you could also look at changing the number of the content motifs essentially as another form of like pseudo style invariance, I'd say. I see. Yeah, thanks for the answer. And uh, I think that wraps up our session two. And we will have a 10 minute break due to uh, like we will have run out of time for about five minutes. So we will uh, gather again in 10 minutes to begin our session three, where we ha will have a keynote presentation by Tina Lisi Rat on the why, how, and when of representations for complex systems, and followed by paper presentation. And later at 7.15 uh, on the Central European summertime, Sorry, 18.15, we will have a panel discussion and follow that will be closing remarks. So thank you everyone for joining and we will be come back again in 10 minutes. Welcome back everyone. Uh, so this is the, the third session of today's workshop. And uh, this session will start with uh, a keynote talk by Professor Tina Ilyasi Rapp and followed by a, a paper session. So uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Tina Ilyasi Rapp. She's a professor of computer science at Northeastern uh, University. Uh, she's also affiliated with multiple uh, institutes relevant to network science and uh, complex systems, um, such as Northeastern's Network Science Institute and Institutes for Exper Experimental AI and uh, Santa Fe Institute and Vermont Complex Systems Center. Tina's research is at the intersection of data mining, machine learning, and network science. Her work has been applied to personalized search on the World Wide Web, statistical indices of large-scale scientific simulation data, for detection, mobile and targeting, uh, cyber situational awareness, and ethics in machine learning. Her algorithms have been incorporated into systems used by governments, industry, and open source software. And she received an uh, outstanding mentor award from the Office of Science at the U US Department of Energy and became a fellow of the IS ISI Foundation. Um, and uh, she, also, she was also named uh, one of the 100 brilliant women in AI ethics for uh, uh, 2021, and uh, I, I like also to mention that like some of our um, very popular common benchmark data sets, such as Quora, are actually uh, introduced by the work uh, of Tina and her colleagues. So uh, yeah, so today her topic is the why, how, and when um, of representations for complex systems, and uh, without further ado. Uh, uh, let's uh, welcome Tina for her talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jia uh, Chi and uh, Ji Young and Antoine and Marenka uh, for organizing the workshop, uh, for your service. I know how much time it takes to organize a workshop. Uh, so I appreciate that. And I appreciate you inviting me to speak to you guys about this topic. And uh, also to the participants, thank you for being here. From I know you're from all over the world, so I appreciate you being here. So the work I'm gonna be presenting is a joint work uh, with Leo Torres, who was my PhD student, who's now at Max Planck Institute for Mathematics and Sciences. 
in Anne Sizemore Belvins, who was a student of Danny Bassett's at UPenn, who is now at Biting Lab, and of course, um, Danny Bassett at UPenn. And it was published in Siam Review last year. So what are complex networks? Why should you care about it, right? Uh, so the complex networks, um, the study uh, of it, uh, won the 2021 Nobel Prize in physics. And um, so you may think, well, what are these complex networks? I'm a computer scientist. Uh, perhaps you have never come across of them. I like this book, What is Complex Network? What is a Complex System? Because it talks about complex systems in terms of features, right? And as machine learning, data mining people, we like features, right? And so I like this image here that um, talks about um, features of a complex system. At its most basic level, a complex system is um, consists of units and their interactions. And so if you look at this uh, picture on the outer layer, you have the necessary conditions of a complex system. So you're going to have numerosity, many interactions among many components. Think about the knowledge graph, right? There's disorder and diversity. There are interactions that are not coordinated. They're not controlled centrally. And the components uh, may vary. There's feedback, right? So there's this notion of um, time and interactions across time that would lead to some emergent dynamics. Um, and then um, in terms of the last necessary condition is this non-equilibrium. So this notion of uh, change over time again and how this non-equilibrium may be driven from outside of uh, the system. And of course, a complex system, for example, is an ant colony or your brain is a complex system. Now, in the inside, in the middle uh, set of features, these are emergent features. Um, the system has history, there's self-organization, there's nested structure. So think about multi-scale. There's structural robustness in terms of if there are perturbations, um, the structure still remains. Think about if you have a noisy graph, but still the communities are robust. You can measure it with something like variation of information that Mark Newman had proposed, which is a symmetric information theory measure. And of course, there's nonlinearity. So there's nonlinear dependence on the parameters and on external drivers. And lastly, there are these um, features of the functional system, right? The complex system has a function. Your brain has a function. It's not just the structure of it. And so it has adaptive behavior, has modularity. You all like graphs and networks, so you know about modularity, this notion of clustering. Um, and then there's also functional robustness. So the system is robust to perturbations, um, where if you hit your head, your brain still functions, right? So since this is Zoom, I'm going to give you the spoiler alert up front <laughs> in case you fall asleep. Uh, and then I'll um, dive deep into um, these take home messages. So the spoiler alert is that there is no perfect way to analyze a complex system. And the modeling decisions that you make when you examine a data set um, does not necessarily transfer from one system to another system or even from one data set um, to another data set from the same system, right? So if I um, uh, take different uh, observations of your brain, um, the modeling decisions that I make based on one data set from your brain and another data set from your brain, they may not transfer. And so these are things that we need to be careful of when we are using uh, machine learning, uh, graph neural networks, when we are creating benchmarks in terms of what kind of properties are we capturing and how much of the space are we actually um, traversing here. So it, Protocol analysis pipeline for a complex system is as follows. There's a system, and you should care about the dependencies that exist in the system. I hope to convince you of that. Then based on that, you decide how to represent your data. What are the nodes? What are the links? What kind of dependencies should I take into account? Then based on that, you come up with some mathematical formalism for it. Whether it's a single, it's a simple graph, whether it's a simplicial complex, whether it's a hypergraph, whether it's a multi-layer network, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, now that you have your mathematical formalism, you could do your machine learning, et cetera, and then um, try to interpret uh, the output of the co computation that you just did. And so the machine learning pipeline usually enters in terms of after you've picked your formalism, which if you're creating benchmarks, it's a little too late. You really need to go back to the system and think about the dependencies that exist. So what are some of these dependencies? So the first one is the subset relationship. 
So are uh, subsets of sets implied? Think about a co-authorship network, right? So if the red um, person with the blue person and the green person, if they have co-authored the paper, then you know that each pair has also co-authored the paper, right? By the sheer fact of the fact that they were co-authors all on this one paper. Then there are these um, temporal dependencies. So are walks on this network Markovian? Do I need to have memory? Do I need to know that I went from the white square to the gray square through um, this circle, but that I got to the circle from the white uh, square as opposed to going to it from the white triangle? And then there are spatial dependencies. So are nearby nodes likely to connect? So strength of connections between brain regions often depends on the Euclidean distance between those brain regions. So obviously spatial dependencies are also important in many systems that you would like to model and benchmark. We all know about subset um, uh, relationship and dependencies. Um, sometimes we don't consider them. But we all know them, right? So it doesn't matter what the color of a square is, it's still a square, right? And it doesn't matter what the geometric shape of a pink object is, it's still a pink object. But this subset um, dependency doesn't always hold. So if I have chemical reactions, and then I don't have subset dependency. So O2 and H2O are part, is a proper subset of H2O2 and H2O. And I know that there is a chemical reaction between H2O2 and H2O, but there's no chemical reaction between O2 and H2O. So this notion of subset relationship and these subset dependencies does not exist if you're thinking about chemical reactions. And you should care about that in terms of the mathematical formalization that you're gonna be picking. The other one is temporal dependencies. So if I give you a bunch of commutes, passenger commutes on a subway system, and I tell you to predict the map of that subway station, New York City, London, et cetera, if you represent it as a simple graph, no matter how complicated your model is, you will not get the correct map because you need to have the temporal dependencies because it's important to get the transfer points correctly. And then uh, lastly is the spatial dependency, this notion that, for example, in the human brain, again, as I said, the physical constraints of the topology is extremely important when you're studying the complex system that's a human brain and you're making benchmarks of it. And so you need to be able to have both space and structure represented in your network. And of course, there are external sources of dependencies. So however big your data is, it is incomplete, and you don't know if you have a faithful sample of it. So in past work, we looked at network discovery, this notion of network discovery, and there's a tutorial um, two years ago, or now three years ago at KDD, where you can think of it as, okay, well, I have some data, I'm gonna assume some model is generating my data. You could pick anything, stochastic block models, Kronecker, um, graphs, etc., and then use something like an expectation maximization to fill the rest of your network. Or you could say, well, I don't know the process that's generating my network. I don't know the, the generative model of the network that I have, but I have a budget and I can go and collect more data. How would I spend that budget to collect more data for, for example, a downstream task when I want to, for example, find dense subgraphs in a graph? And so then that basically turns into this exploit explore problem and you can have multi-arm bandit approaches or you can have um, Markov decision processes for it. You can use um, you know, deep reinforcement learning and use graph embeddings to reduce your state space. And that's some of the work that we did that was highlighted in that tutorial. Then there's this notion of data accusation and processing and how that affects the dependencies that is in your system. So most real world graphs are actually bipartite graphs and then you project them into it being a unipartite graph. Think about co-authorship networks, right? Anything co-something uh, was a bipartite network that you then projected into unipartite. And usually when you do that, you increase um, number of triangles. So you uh, artificially increase the transitivity dependency that does not exist in naturally occurring unipartite um, graphs, such as, uh, for example, Facebook social graph. 
And we talked about this in a website article um, about a decade ago. And then, of course, the research question affects the kind of dependencies that you're looking at, right? So if your research question is, could a common food have caused a disease outbreak, then you should care about both time and space, right? People who are close together in time and space often consume the same foods, right? And of course, this is important in terms of pandemics, et cetera, epidemics. So then now let's say you have the system, right? You want to make these benchmarks, so you understand the system dependencies, and now you're thinking about, okay, how would I actually mathematically formulate this? So three popular ways are simple graphs. You all know about this, right? There's lots of these graph benchmarks uh, where we're interested in cliques, we're interested in paths, etc. And then there are these simplicial complexes. And so versus a simple graph only measures dyadic relationships, simplicial complexes can measure polyadic relationships. Uh, so relationships with more than two nodes and in particular, they capture this thing called downward closure. So if I have a K simplex that's among K plus one nodes, it's, ca it's collectively capturing their interactions. And then any subset of that simplex has to be a simplex itself. And so there's a downward closure. So if five of us were, uh, were co-authors, then three of us are also co-authors, four of us are also co-authors, right? And so when you represent it in terms of simplicial complexes, then oftentimes you care about these topological cavities. Um, people who study uh, network neuroscience are very interested in persistent, what's called persistent homology, right? And when you're talking about topology, you're interested in cavities or holes, right? And how that persists over time. So you're interested in these kinds of topological cavities and you're interested in these things called maximal um, simplices. So a maximal um, simplex is a simplex that is not contained in any larger simplex, right? And then, of course, there are hypergraphs, and hypergraphs have, have uh, seen uh, some excitement in the graph neural network deep learning um, field recently, where um, you have polyadic relationships, but oftentimes, actually, people think about hypergraphs as sets of sets, and they don't think about it as that I have this hyper edge and absent substructures in that hyper edge is in fact important. So here in this little hypergraph, a hyper edge that I'm showing you, there is no dyadic or direct relationship between these two nodes. And that may be significant. Maybe you should take that into account, right? So just looking at hypergraphs as sets of sets, um, where you have sets of nodes, right? Um, it is not as, um, as interesting. Now there was a recent paper actually in terms of random walks on these hypergraphs when you think about them as sets of sets and how uh, a node in one hyper edge has different weight as another node on a different hyper edge that it participates in. So when you do the random walk, you should take that into account. And at the end, if you're interested, I can put um, the link to that um, the reference um, at the end of the talk. So again, why should you care about all this? So it depends on what insights you want to get, right? So if you're interested in network neuroscience and you're making benchmarks of that, if you are just representing it as a simple graph, then you can find, for example, small worldness, you can find this kind of modular architecture, you can find hubs. If you represent it as these simplicial complexes, then you can find these large scale cavities in structural adult brains. You can find these, these neural rings and how far um, their tentacles go, and you can find hypergraph. If you represent it as hypergraphs, you can find these functional hub hyper edges. Um, and so, depending again on the insight that you want, you should care about what representations you have, and then from there you can go on with the benchmark. But then knowing that, okay, if I go with a graph, there are only certain types of questions that I can answer. And this leads us to some examples. So here I have a simple example of a brain. I have four regions, four tasks, and I have data about you know, which regions are fired for a particular task. And so if I represent it as a simple graph, then there is no subset dependency, and I can only build on pairwise fire uh, together, right? So that there are regions that um, dyadically fire together. If I represent it as a simplicial complex, then I do have subset dependency and I can capture co-firings of different regions altogether. And if I represent it as a hypergraph, 
I don't have this subset dependency because it doesn't have downward closure, and but I can capture regions that exclusively fire together. Or another example in terms of the transportation network, here's five bus stations, three bus lines, there are the roads that are dashed. And so if I, again, represent it as a simple graph, I could represent it with temporal dependency, uh, depending on whether I have higher representation of it, like the growing graphs, I can represent a line graph, for example. Uh, but really, uh, what I'm capturing is this uh, subsequent bus stops among a particular route. And if I represent it as a simplicial complex, then again, I have the subject dependency. And what I'm looking at is stations on the same bus line. And if I represent it as a hypergraph, then I have no temporal dependency and no subsets. And I'm representing stations from the whole bus route. And of course, there's lots of different variations, right? There's directed, there's weighted, there's dynamic. It's not quite clear what dynamic is, right? Are you talking about some system that's slowly moving like a co-authorship network? Or are you talking about your brain or the stock market that's moving very fast? There are multiplex networks, there are multi-layer networks. There are these two figures that will tell you what they look like. And of course, there are these higher order networks where it says sequences in a graph are extremely important, right? Such as, for example, when you're modeling or benchmarking a transportation network. Now, of course, there are other frameworks. Uh, for those of you who come from graph theory, there are graphons that describe limits on sequences of graphs, and they're useful to estimate large and noisy systems. There's these metapopulation models that folks have shown are good uh, for measuring global behavior of local species, and it can be adapted to networks. And there are these sheaves and random sequences of sets uh, when Austin Benson and his co-authors, Ravi Kumar and Andrew Tompkins had a paper in KDD 18, where you can handle added information to each node, right? So um, the whole um, GNN enterprise is because there are lots of uh, information on the nodes, right? Uh, if you're Pinterest, right, you have a lot of information for each person, not just the graph structure, right? And that's where um, a lot of the power of the GNNs come in because you have all that um, added information. Okay, so you have chosen your frameworks, but how are these different mathematical frameworks related to each other? So if I take a hop, uh, hypergraph, I can turn it into a simplicial complex by taking every hyper edge and making a simplicial complex from it, and then take every simplicial complex and just create a clique from it. But what happens is when I go from a hypergraph to a simplicial complex to a graph, I'll be losing information. And when I go the other way, when I take the graph and for every click I make a simplicial complex and then I take the maximal simplicial complex to make these hyper edges because I'm trying to be conservative and I don't want to have a lot of hyper edges, what happens is that these two hypergraphs are not the same, right? So one has to be careful of using benchmarks of graphs and saying, well, I can make hypergraphs from them because if you had originally represented your system as a hypergraph, those two hypergraphs will be different. And again, why should you um, care about this? So when it comes to analysis, and this is very simple analysis, I'm not gonna talk about complex analyses where uh, explaining them is extremely different, uh, difficult. So I have a graph, I have a simplicial complex, and I have a hypergraph. Each one has five nodes. And if you look at the simple graph and this green node, you're like, okay, great. It has four friends and it participates in two triangles. And when you look at the simplicial complex, you're like, okay, it also has um, four friends, but it has one, um, two simplex, this shaded um, um, triangle. And the hypergraph, you're like, well, it really has only two friends, but it's involved in a hypergraph with four nodes. And what happens is when you represent these as different ways, then you would get different analyses. So if I have this simple graph and I look at for, uh, for patterns in it, I will find core and periphery structure, which you all know, right? There's a core set of nodes and then um, that are highly connected to each other. And then there's this periphery set of nodes that are not connected to each other. They're connected to the core. But if I represent it as a simplicial complex, then what happens is I find these cavities and there's this global um, structure that I'm seeing here. And if I represent the same thing as a hypergraph, then I find two communities. And these two communities are not the core periphery communities. And so then your insights, 
right, about whatever system you're studying will be different depending on what representation you have. And of course, there are some important open questions to consider here. So if I rep rep represent some data as a simplicial complex, how would I interpret the clustering coefficient here? What is the diameter of a system when I have hyper edges that have different number of nodes in them? Should I treat the hyper edge as a first class object or not? How do communities, how, how would I find communities in a simplicial complex? How do these communities differ from the hypergraph in particular since hypergraph does not have this downward closure? And then lastly, can I combine them? Can I combine a hypergraph with a simplicial complex and a graph for different parts of the system to capture different dependencies? And of course, these are all, again, open, open questions. And then, of course, there's the insights, right? Uh, we're doing all of this to be able to be useful to somebody. And so again, like going to the co-authorship network, I just want to stress again that um, if you represent it as a simple graph, right, you're measuring dyadic relationships. If you're representing it as a simplicial complex, you're measuring polyadic, but with downward closure. And hypergraphs, you're representing as authors that exclusively publish together. And again, if you take the simple graph and you make simplicial complexes out of it or hypergraphs, those simplicial um, complexes, um, those special um, simplicial complexes are not going to be the same. And the hypergraphs are not going to be the same. And so one has to be careful in terms of converting, for example, a simple graph to a hypergraph or a simplicial complex. And one of the things which is interesting is that, okay, well, if I represent, let's say I take some data, this is some co-authorship data from DBLP, um, and I represent it as a simple graph, as a simplicial complex, and as a hypergraph, and I want to know how correlated are the degree distributions, right? The first thing we check for a graph is this degree distribution. And when you create a benchmark, right, you care about the degree distribution that you are covering. And so if we look at the Spearman correlation between um, hypergraph degree and simplicial complex, they are highly correlated, as one perhaps would expect, because you're capturing polyadic relationship. And then next is the simplicial complex degree and graph degree. And finally, it's the hypergraph degree and the graph degree. And again, um, the graph degree distribution is, uh, is only capturing dyadic relationships. So perhaps this is expected. But again, if you're making a benchmark and, for example, you're saying, okay, how much of the space am I covering? It's important to know about these things. And then, of course, if you care about graphs, you also care about triangles, so clustering coefficient in a particular graph. So what I'm showing here on the x-axis is the average node clustering coefficient. So for every node, I'm measuring how many triangles it has over how many triangles it could have, and then taking an average over them. And on the y-axis, on the primary y-axis, I'm showing the average node clustering coefficient in a hypergraph. And here I'm measuring the node clustering coefficient as the normalized extra overlap between two uh, hyper edges. And so the higher value that you have, it means that neighbors connect via hypergraphs that don't contain the particular node V. And so you go through every node in your hypergraph and you count how many neighbors are connected via the hyper edges, you normalize and then you take the average. And this is a, um, an email data set. And so what we see is, uh, so this is for um, number of participants in an email uh, that's between five and 25. So I send an email, let's say I see 25 people max, right? And over on the upper right, you're seeing a six to 25, a seven to 25, and eight to 25. The R is the row of the Spearman correlation rank, and the P is the p-value. And you see basically that depending on whether I represent it as a simple graph or a hypergraph, I'll get different values for the clustering coefficient. And then the colors are this thing we're calling log fill coefficient, which is the fraction of the smaller hypergraphs that exist within a hypergraph edge. So in a way, we're trying to capture this downward um, closure and how much of that exists, even though hypergraphs don't guarantee that. And again, higher 
here means that the intra-team communication is very good, that you're not just good at talking to everybody else in the organization, but you are also good at communicating with yourself. And again, you can see that um, there's no pattern here in terms of the colors that are filling the nodes. So, so again, so what? Now, even in the case when your research question is fixed and you have access to the full data set, and there's very little interactions among the different types of dependencies that you have in terms of the temporal, the subset, the spatial, the choice of the representation will give you different insights. Uh, and that, would, that is just because of the assumptions that they are making. And if you're making a benchmark, you should care about these things. So just the, putting it all together in one diagram, right? So there's the research question, there's the data availability, and there's the system dependency. There's some dependencies, uh, we talked about three of them in this work, um, subset, spatial, and temporal. Based on those, you can pick a representation, whether it's a graph or a simple graph, hypergraph, or simplicial complex. One thing to be aware of is that if you go from a graph to a hypergraph, you are forcing structure or relationships, you're making assumptions. And if you go from a hypergraph back to a graph, you're losing information. And then depending on how you represent it, you're going to have different insights based on the analyses that you do. And so again, I'll go back to the take home message. There's no perfect way to analyze a complex system. And you should be very careful about the modeling decisions that you're making when examining a data set from one system um, to another system or from data sets from the same system. And you can uh, download the slides here. And I'm happy to answer any questions um, that you may have. Yeah, thank you for the great, great presentation. And uh, if anyone have uh, questions, you can, since we don't have that many people, you can just uh, unmute yourself and ask. Uh, at the same time, uh, I have a couple of questions. So, uh, First, I have a very small question, which is relating to the three types of representations, like graph, sim, sim, uh, simplicial, complex, and uh, hypergraph you just mentioned. So uh, one question I have is about the relationship between graph and hypergraph. So it seems that um, uh, like for, for each hypergraph, you can actually find a bipartite graph that corresponds to it, right? So I'm wondering, like, what's the point of um, like having a hypergraph? Then you can like when, when each hypergraph you can find a equivalent bipartite graph to uh, to to represent represent that, right? So excellent like, question. Uh, yeah. Excellent question. There's a fine line between a hypergraph and a bipartite graph, right? Where you have the nodes on one side and the hypergraph, hyper edges on the other side, and these right. nodes participate in this hyper uh, edge. Um, the thing is that if you represent it that way, then you're mm -hmm. thinking of a hyper edge as sets of sets, right? Mm -hmm. You will not be able to capture the fact that some of the nodes actually have direct links to each other, right? And so you won't capture those, uh, those absent structures. And so for certain complex systems, like for example, your a human brain, you would actually want to know that, oh, these two nodes actually don't connect directly, right? They could be part of a hyper edge, but that they don't connect directly. And so it, it is a very fine line. It's a great question to ask. And in fact, when you're looking at a system, you should think about, okay, well, if I'm representing it as a sets of sets hypergraph, Mm -hmm. Is that does that just reduce to a bipartite graph, which I can deal with a lot easier um, than a hypergraph? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. So another question I have is uh, so yeah. So I, I think uh, the, the the problem you mentioned uh, actually. So I've I've been like playing with this kind of calls or or. or or scientific paper network. So I've, I've tried like to uh, build, like reduce the kind of the core data set by um, like, like changing the citation links to like to links that maybe two papers 
so share and author. Uh, so those kind of uh, uh, links. And, uh, and then I, I run some, some of the graph neural network models on it and the performance totally changed. So uh, like it seems um, like many of the popular graph networks only works well when, you're, when the links are actually the citation links rather than the links that uh, they share and also. Um, this, to, to some extent, this makes sense because like, uh, like for, for, for that, Bill said that the prediction target is, is the category of the paper, right? But, um, but the same author could write papers in different categories. But if, you, if they have citation relationships, uh, that's a stronger indication that they um, kind, of, um, uh, kind of share the same category. So, so my, my question is that, well, like th this kind of uh, analysis is kind of ad hoc. And uh, so, well, I can get a sense why in this particular case, this types of links helps my uh, prediction task, but that types of links doesn't help much. Um, but is there a kind of more general principle or, or those kind of things? that can help people to navigate through, uh, especially when combining the representation of the graph and the machine learning tasks. Like what are some of the like, general principles people should be looking at when they construct their graphs for a machine learning task? Yeah. So, so do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so the thing to really think about are the processes that are making that graph, right? Like, mm -hmm. unfortunately, mm -hmm. machine learning people, and I'm one of them, right? I'm one of us, right? Uh, I've just like been spending a lot of time with network scientists who really care about the processes that are generating graph. We don't think about it, right? As if like, the graph or get is a gift from gods, right? It's a gospel and we don't think about like, how was it produced? So, so for example, with citation networks, we know there's this cut and paste um, property that is happening. Uh, we see it in patent citations, we see it in paper citations where you just copy a whole chunk of your BIP file and you move it to another BIP file, right? And you, so, so there's some of that. So the biggest thing would be to just think about the processes that are generating your graph. And in fact, along those lines, um, let me share my screen. This is um, this is when we were working on growing a network, and I believe you're you are seeing um, uh, my my screen here. Yes. Where if you're making benchmarks, it is important to at least measure two things: the degree distribution, the properties of the degree distribution, and the properties in terms of the triangles, right? And for example, if your machine learning system is learning when it's an Erdős Rényi random graph, then I don't believe your machine learning um, algorithm, right? In this, I'm assuming that you have no content on the nodes, right? I'm assuming that you have a graph and the links are all random. So if the links structure is all random, then what that means is that you have no relational dependency, right? In machine learning, we like to learn the dependencies in the data. And so if your machine learning model is performing really well on an Erdős Rényi random graph, then I would be suspicious, right? And in fact, when you go talk to other scientists, they always check against, well, what if the link structure was random, right? What if the, the, the attributes of the nodes were random, right? What is this configuration model? How would your algorithm do on a configuration model? And so th for this work, uh, what we had done was that, okay, at least these two dimensions, and you can have multiple dimensions, right? You can have, for example, uh, another dimension on average number of triangles per node degree, right? So if I look at all of my nodes that have degree 10, what's the average number of triangles around them? Um, the modularity is a global feature here. But then you can place you know, your graphs and you can see um, when your, uh, your algorithm does well and when it doesn't do well, right? And so you can be more honest about the fact that, okay, my algorithm works on these graphs and not on those graphs. Um, and I know that is not our culture within machine learning, right? It's like my algorithm is the best algorithm, right? master algorithm, um, at least for the next five minutes. <laughs> but it's, it's useful to say, okay, you know, my algorithm works here, 
right? Where like Keda uh, is or where, where Cora is. Um, and like a particular example of this is when you're dealing with protein protein interaction networks, um, a lot of the um, graph embedding methods that rely on having dense parts of the network does not, do not work because in protein protein interaction networks, you don't have a lot of triangles. So you have heterogeneous degree distribution, but you do not have a lot of triangles. And so if you want to do link prediction, for example, on a protein protein interaction network, what you want to do is you want to not do common neighbor that you would do in a social network, right? If I want to do link prediction, a very good approach to use, and it's good for the climate, is just looking at the number of common neighbors that you and I have, right? And in fact, if you and I have lots of common neighbors, but we're not friends, we don't have a link, then that means we didn't want to be friends, right? And there's social science theories behind it. But in a protein-protein interaction network, you want to look at paths of length three, not paths of length two with a common neighbor. Um, that is a much better heuristic of trying to do link prediction in a protein-protein interaction network. And so again, some of these things in terms of like when you're in terms of benchmarking, right? Where are these, where do these data sets fall? Um, and then you can say, okay, my algorithm works well here, right? And this is a cartoon version. Obviously you can have it be, um, have like actual tick marks. And in this paper later on, we do have it where um, we actually have quantified it. I hope that was helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think these are these are helpful indicators. And uh, let me see. So, do we have any further questions from the audience? I guess the one thing I can leave the audience with uh, is the following. I was talking with Bin Yu, who's a distinguished professor at UC Berkeley. Yeah. Um, some of you may know may may know her. And uh, with NeurIPS, for example, right, they have now these required um, negative social impact statements. Uh -huh. And perhaps one of the things we should do, which is in spirit of this workshop, is as a community require that each paper have an assumptions section and a technical uh -huh. limitations section, right? So here okay. are the assumptions I made. And here are the technical limitations of my system. And I know that we're all in about like selling <laughs> our, our algorithms, but that would be more scientific, right? And perhaps it will solve some, not all of the reproducibility problems that we have, right? The whole thing with the benchmarking is that, okay, well, okay, Tina's system does this and, and Bob's system does that. And so if we have those as requirements, I think as a scientific community, we would be better off. Right. So yeah, I, I I very much agree with you. So I think like uh, for example, um, a lot a lot of the, the popular uh, graph neural networks were actually at the very beginning were developed based on like a few like a few set of benchmark tests, right? And uh, and later on, people find that they are not performing really well on some like other data set. For example, one one thing is about homophily, where uh, like like the citation networks are like mostly have for homophily and uh, and uh, many of the design of the early graph neural networks are kind of tailored for for this kind of uh, properties. So um, yeah, but I guess uh, like if we if we have so I guess maybe one challenge is that people may not be aware that this data sets have this kind of common assumptions. Like they, 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 maybe they are thinking in different ways. For example, maybe they are uh, like, I'm using a, a, a variety set of benchmark data sets. I'm using a social network and a citation network and maybe another network. But unfortunately, they all have this kind of homophily phenomena. <laughs> so, but, but uh, I kind of, like I'm, I'm kind of using networks from diverse domains. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking my algorithm is performing, um, should should be performing well in, in, in different data set, right? But um, yeah, so, so I guess like uh, if we are able to understand the 
like the social theory behind social network, we are able to understand more of the domain knowledge of the data set under each, like in each domain, then probably we are, we will be better able to um, find the, the, the assumptions or, or the limitations we have. Yes, I, I think so. I, you know, you don't like we don't need to go and learn social science, right? But at least we should like think about, okay, where does this data set fall in this in terms of like degree distribution in terms of modularity, right? And at least say, look, the 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 systems that are the, the data sets that are tested on fall here, right? This mm -hmm. is the area I'm covering. Great. Mm -hmm. Like I have no problem with that, right? I the see. problem is when you one says, "Oh, this will work for on everything," and then when somebody else tries it, it doesn't work, and then we as a community we don't come across as scientific. We come across as, "Oh, we're just peddling different models and and algorithms, and we're just playing our own little game here, right?" As opposed to really like, "Okay, what did we learn and about uh, about the system or about how to model it?" And so I very much appreciate these kinds of workshops that are trying to get us to become more scientific. And then I do know that we are at the end of my session and I very much appreciate you being my interlocutor at this at the end of my talk. I did put the two, um, there are two references I put in the chat. The first one is a paper that Park and Barabashi wrote back in 2007 in PNAS that thinks about homophily in a graph and looks at it both in terms of what they call dyadicity and heterophilicity. So you look at both sides of homophily and how um, across different graph ensembles, you would get different dynamics. And then the second one is this recent paper that I was saying about random walks on hyper uh, graphs uh, where um, the uh, weight of the node is different. So if you think about representing a co-authorship network or a team um, uh, data as sets of sets, then maybe I contribute more to this paper, right? I'm part of this hyper edge and I contribute more to this paper and less to this other paper, right? And then if you're doing a random walk to find a, dis a stationary distribution, then you should take that into account, right? And then that way you would, for example, know the members of the team or the authors who are who predominantly do most of the work. So you, so the students will have the higher rank, right? Because they 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 do all the work. So um, that kind of a thing. Great. Uh, yeah. So uh, do you thank want to you have very a much. Question? I'm happy to answer so, uh, any questions offline if folks are um, are are shy. And then just the one thing, um, so the network science community is very interested in these higher order interactions now. So they have kind of moved on from simple uh -huh. graphs to these higher order, uh, higher order interactions. And um, I'm sure the machine learning community, the graph mining community will follow suit soon. Uh, I have seen some papers, but you know, there's gonna be a flurry of them. Uh, yeah. yeah. So thank you very much again to both yeah, of you. Thank you, thank you for joining us, yeah. Thank you yeah. for that great talk. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, so uh, maybe we can move, move on to the paper session. Um, we are having four excellent papers in this session. The first one is, uh, uh, the paper title is An Open Challenge for Inductive Lane Prediction on knowledge graphs um, by Miguel Galkin from Mila and Max Brundel from LMU and Charles Tapley Hoyt from Harvard. Hi, my name is Michael and uh, uh, today at uh, the graph learning benchmarks, I'd like to talk about our new challenge that we start uh, with the team biking the challenge for inactive link prediction on knowledge graphs. Generally, the area of representational learning on knowledge graphs has largely been focused on the transductive setup, so the one the one to the left. Uh, to, by transductive setup, we understand such a link prediction setup when we have one graph with a known set of entities, it is fixed, and we run the inference 
on the same graph on the same set of entities. Why? Whereas inductive link prediction is when we perform inference on a different graph and uh, it might have a new uh, set of entities or it might have a larger extended set of entities. So it's either some uh, new graph or the extended version of the graph. And the problem with the transductive link prediction, why we need uh, a new challenge is that transductive link prediction is pretty much stale. All those 10 years has been hundreds, hundreds of KJ many models that were, were evaluated purely on transductive link prediction tasks. And if we look at the papers with code benchmarks, some small excerpt on the standard pre-base uh, uh, 15k benchmark, we see that the performance pretty much stale. There is no substantial progress since 2018, 2019. So a few models were published by that time. And since that, uh, since those years, as you see, we have been pretty much in the same ballpark of uh, performance. And on the other hand, the area of graph representation learning changed dramatically since 2018. So, uh, by some means, we would say that uh, transactive link prediction is not is no more a valid uh, representative benchmark for measuring representation learning uh, models on uh, relational multi-relational knowledge graphs. So, by that, we would like to present a new uh, benchmark, a new set of datasets uh, on inductive tasks. Uh, there are two such setups, and uh, one of them uh, we call fully inductive when uh, the inference graph is disconnected from the training one. So the training one has uh, one set of entities, inference graph has another set of entities, and we are predicting links between unknown entities, unknown entities at training time. The second setup, inductive setup, uh, it is called semi-inductive. Uh, we can also think about it as extended inference, as having extended inference graph. So at, at, at training time, we see some, we, we have, we see some graph, at inference time, we see an extended version of it. So we see here new entities, uh, more edges, and they are connected to the training graph. So that's an important difference. In uh, this work, in this new challenge, we focus on the fully inductive setup. So uh, the inference graph is a totally disconnected one, and we predict links against this uh, new inference graph. So we focus on this, on, on this setup uh, uh, with the two uh, motivations. The first, the first reason is that we on purpose do not give input node features. So we would like to frame it as a geometric task such that uh, we can leverage the topology of a graph uh, instead of relying on some pre-computed features that can be already expressive enough. But you, do, you won't, might not need a graph structure whatsoever. And on, uh, the secondly, we want to encourage the search for more efficient non shallow embedding models capable of uh, inductive reasoning on knowledge graphs. So that is a emerging trend, and we would like to support that with a new set of data sets and uh, base layers. So particularly, we propose uh, two new data sets. We, um, we created two baselines, and we also have a hidden test set for the evaluation of final models. Uh, besides, we also uh, put additional emphasis on transparent evaluation and uh, our reproducible code. So uh, talking about data sets, we sampled two uh, inductive benchmarks from Wikidata. So no more uh, discontinued zombie free base that has been there in the area for dozens of years now. The small graph fits very well for initial experiments. It uh, has about 10k entities in the training graph and about 6k entities at uh, the disconnected inference graph, while the larger one has around 50k training entities and about 30k at uh, inference. And, and this is by a large margin the biggest inductive data set uh, known in the community right now. So all existing other benchmarks they are orders of magnitude smaller than this large one. The baselines we propose leverage node piece which is a recently proposed model for compositional tokenization of large knowledge graphs which builds a, a vocabulary of uh, tokens and those tokens can generally be anchored nodes and some relation types but for the inductive setup when we have disconnected uh, graphs at the first time we just restrict here the vocabulary to relation types 
and we represent node as a set of incident relation types and we send that to some uh, encoder neural network and optionally we might also use a message passing GNN relational GNN on top of those features. Talking about metrics, we uh, emphasize here the mean reset local rank and various hits at K indicators. Uh, so hits at uh, 100, for instance, is a large, it's large recall indicator where hits at one is a very high precision indicator. And also we measure the adjusted uh, mean rank index. So generally the benchmark is far from being salted, far from being saturated. And uh, those models are still relatively uh, small and they, they can be trained pretty fast. So in the active node piece uh, just takes, in both versions, takes about five, 10 minutes to train where the GNN version might take a few hours. Still, uh, you can uh, extend those baselines. You can uh, submit your new models. We encourage that. So we have prepared all the necessary infrastructure for that so how do you submit and how to participate in the challenge so first all our data sets are indexed uh, in Zenodo uh, all our code is published in the official github repo we also have a, a github io page with uh, all the instructions all the data sets are licensed uh, with MIT uh, license which is open and permissive and uh, it's very easy to submit your work which you just need to fork the repo and uh, upload the weights, uh, the models are not that large. Uh, we don't usually have shallow node embedding, so uh, it's pretty okay to upload the model weights right on GitHub. And uh, finally, we, we will evaluate them on a held out test set of uh, missing triples on those graphs. So that's pretty much it for ILPC 2022. Uh, you can check out the paper and also we encourage you to check the websites. Uh, on GitHub, the official repo in code and data, everything is there. It's also integrated in the latest version of PyKeen. And uh, we also have a Medium blog publication which describes some of uh, the contents uh, in a bit more detail and a bit more graphic format. Thank you very much and uh, reach out to us if you have any further questions. We look looking forward to your submissions to ILPC. Um, hi, Michael. Hi, hi. So, is there any questions from the audience? Yeah, so I have uh, two questions. So, first one is a quick one. So, um, like you said, there's a hidden like test set. I'm wondering, like, if you if you're if you're going to hit uh, hide that uh, keep that test set hidden for just for this year or or like uh you're 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 never going to release that test set <laughs> uh well it is sampled from the same inference graph uh -huh. in all in both benchmarks and uh, we do have uh, a full train validation test splits so for now it uh, it seems that just keeping those three would be okay even mm -hmm. with the test set and the hidden one yeah we, we for the interest of future generations, we'll, we'll, we'll try to keep it in house for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. Yeah. And is there any plan to, uh, I mean, like when people get to, even if you keep that hidden uh, and uh, like when people start meet their, their models more and more, and they are, they are, they are going to try, they are going to dig out some of the information. Of all that's so set, right? So, is there any? Well, well we, we tried it on one hand, the OD uh, in distribution, IID. Uh, on uh -huh. the other hand, uh, it is still, it will still be challenging, right? So, even the current uh, validation tests, they are pretty hard to solve. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think that the overfitting, <laughs> they are over, overfitting on the test set. Would, would be I see. Yeah. I see a question oh. in the chat. Uh, what are the okay. metrics used uh, or more suitable in the full inductive link prediction task? So generally we are still in the link prediction setup when uh, uh, we have only positive samples, so don't have negatives. So we're still using ranking here and the Charlie, he's here. So kudos to him here and also in this chat. Uh, we also proposed uh, here in the same workshop uh, a new 
set of metrics, a fixed, uh, fixed version of ranking metrics, which are fixed for chance, for some randomness. Uh, but generally, uh, it is still, we, we are in the ballpark of ranking metrics without negative. So we, we do not do any classification because we do not have predefined true negative edges. And overall, they can be like v squared of them. And since you are in the graphs, like for 50k nodes, v squared is a lot. <laughs> so you can easily predict, predict all zeros and you will have super high metrics because of the sparsity. Yeah, so uh, mostly ranking metrics. Yeah, all right. Uh, so uh, thank you, Michael, for the sake of time. We uh, Let's move on to the next paper. Um, so the next paper is uh, title is an, ex an explainable AI library for benchmarking graph explainers. And uh, it's by Chirag Agwal, uh, Owen Kuhn, uh, Hima Labraji, and Marinka Zipnik. Hello, my name is Owen Queen from the Harvard Medical School Department of Biomedical Informatics. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about our project titled Graph XAI Bench, an explainable AI library for benchmarking graph explainers. First, an introduction. The field of graph XAI lacks tools for reliable evaluation and benchmarking of new graph explanation methods. To address these gaps, we introduce GXAI Bench. Some of the key innovations of GXAI Bench are first, data sets with ground truth explanations, and second, a focus on XAI in our benchmarking pipeline rather than predictive tasks. Now for an overview of our GXAI pipeline. We see here that one can first call on one of our custom data sets that are then going to be that can then be fed into a GNN predictor. One can train this GNN predictor and feed it into one of our explainers. Then the explainer will output an explanation that can then be fed into either performance metrics or a visualization tool. We provide two data sets for no classification. The first being the BA shapes data set, which is taken from the GNA explainer paper. This is a synthetic data set that has ground truth explanations. The task in this data set is to identify whether a node is a member of a house motif within the graph or not. Therefore, the ground truth explanations are the house structure within the neighborhood of a given node. We then provide the recidivism graph, which doesn't have ground truth explanations, but it does have a race feature, which is considered as a projected attribute. This can be used to evaluate metrics for fairness. We also provide two graph classification data sets that are taken from the domain of chemistry. The first is the classical mutag data set, which has ground truth explanations of NO2 and NH2 groups. We then provide the alkane carbonyl data set from another paper published in 2020 that provides ground truth explanations of alkane and carbonyl functional groups as seen on the right. We also provide a number of graph ML explainers. First, we provide a few baseline explainers and then some more advanced ones that were published recently. We provide the random explainer, which is used as a, as a baseline. We also provide grad, grad cam, guided back prop and integrated gradient, and then a few explainers that are designed cut that are custom designed for GNNs, which are GNN explainer, PGM explainer, PG explainer, and subgraph X. Now on to the evaluation of graph ML explanations. We use a number of metrics taken from a paper that was recently published in 2022. First, we have accuracy, which is the correctness of explanations. Second, faithfulness, which is the degree of correspondence between the underlying predictor and the output explanation. Third, stability, which is the sensitivity of explanations to perturbations. And then finally, counterfactual and group fairness, which is the preservation of fairness within the explanation. We also provide visualization tools within our package. This is a visualization of the BA shapes data set. On the far left, you can see a ground truth, an example of a ground truth explanation. We see we have node U, which is highlighted in red, and it's surrounded by a number of yellow nodes, which are the ground truth explanation nodes and then red edges, which are the ground truth explanation edges. We then provide examples of a number of explainers when evaluated on this example. When we first look at grad the gradient method, we see that it slightly highlights some of the nodes within the house, but doesn't highlight them very strongly. We then have grad cam, which entirely fails to identify the house around node U. We also have GNN explainer, which identifies all of the house, but also includes a node that's outside of the house. And then finally, subgraph X, which 
includes all of the nodes around our node uh, around our node U that are in the house, but fails to get the one that is in the corner. Now on to library design. We provide two data set classes that have all the function how all the functionality of a typical data set class in addition to storing ground truth explanations those are node data set which are used for node classification tasks and graph data set which is used for graph classification tasks these can then be inherited by upstream data sets that can use the this underlying functionality for example we have the mutag data set which would inherit from the graph data set class now into the explainer class called base explainer this is going to lay out an API where the user will call either get explanation node or get explanation graph. Get explanation node is used for deriving explanations for node for node classification. And get explanation graph is used for deriving explanations from graph classification tasks. We then provide a number of other functions that are used for uh, underlying, underlying operations within an explanation, um, such as get embedding, set masks, and predict. And this is meant for future developers to use within our pipeline to implement their own explanation methods. We then provide a number of metric fun uh, functions that correspond to our metrics. For example, we have graph explanation accuracy, which would take in an explainer that's which would take in an explanation that is output from an explainer and a ground truth explanation, and then would return an accuracy score. Now for an overview of our API, we've designed GraphXAI Bench so that GXAI Bench so that it's very straightforward and concise. We first see that you can extract a data set um, such as the BA shapes data set in this instance, um, and then get uh, the graph from that data set. And then you can train your own model and then call a GradCam explainer, which can then take the model and a given loss function and output the explainer that can then be used um, to call get explanation node that is going to give you an explanation which can then be fed into a metric such as graph explanation faithfulness that's going to output a faithfulness score for feature node and edge this explanation you can then call the visualization tool on it we also have a number of benchmarking results that we include within this paper on the on the left we show a number of results from the BA shapes data set, the mutag data set, and the alkane carbonyl data set. On the right, we have the recidivism data set results um, that where we evaluate faithfulness, stability, and fairness. We see from these results that we don't have any method that particularly sticks out as the most advantageous explainer. In conclusion, we hope that GXAI Bench will be able to advance research and graph ML explainability. The, the, by promoting holistically robust explainers that are able to maximize these given metrics. We also provide an open source platform on which researchers can implement new GraphML explainability methods in the future. Thank you. Thank you for the great uh, presentation. And I see Owens here. Um, is there any questions from the audience? So, yeah, so I have a question for you. Um, so like you mentioned that you're kind of uh, evaluating the explainers by some ground truths. I'm, I'm wondering like how, how is that, how are those ground truths defined? Like the ground truths of explanations, right? Yeah, so um, within our synthetic data sets, it's pretty easy to define our ground truth explanations. Um, we just sort of make a predictive task um, where that predictive task has to only rely sort of on that one ground truth. Um, mm -hmm. Within our sort of real world data sets, um, we kind of take a traditional method for um, the other explainer papers take where they um, maybe take data sets from chemistry. And then within chemistry, we know that there are certain kind of uh, structural modes that um, lead to given predictions. And so those are sort of treated as our ground truth explanation in a way. Um, so we know that the sort of comparison to those ground truth explanations is not entirely sufficient to tell whether an explainer is advantageous or not. So that's why we also provide other functions um, such as the faithfulness and that sort of thing. I see. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, if there's no other questions, let's move on to the next paper. Uh, the next paper is uh, Robust Synthetic Gene Benchmarks with Graph Work uh, by John Palowicz, Anton Sicily, Brendan Mayer, and Brian Parosi. Hi, my name is John Palowicz, and today I'll be discussing our work on robust synthetic graph neural network benchmarks with GraphWorld. I'd like to thank the organizers of the Graph Learning Benchmark Workshop for hosting our talk and all of the talks today. As a brief introduction, GraphWorld is a framework and methodology that we are introducing to evaluate GNM performance against diverse graph properties. GraphWorld uses random graph models to generate a synthetic graph population for this purpose. My collaborators are three others on my team at Google Research, Brandon Mayer, Brian Perosi, and Anton Sietzlin. So why are we doing this? Well, as a motivating phenomenon, we are all familiar with many of these seminal papers, and we're also familiar with the fact that these papers reuse benchmark data sets to compare their contributions to previous innovations. The way this is usually presented in research papers is in the form of a table, where new models and GNM variants are listed comparatively to old models and ranked using various test metrics. Usually, the model the paper introduces is able to achieve an increase in the metrics on the benchmark data sets. As many of us are familiar, the most common benchmark data sets are citation networks, social networks, molecular networks, and a few other types. Furthermore, some of these types of networks are primarily used only for certain GNN tasks, like citation networks for node classification and molecular networks for graph, graph classification. So what this means is that the data sets used to evaluate GNNs on a particular task can be very similar to each other, depending on the task. These observations are part of a larger set of inherent consequences of depending on a handful of data sets for research over time for the same task. One of these consequences is that the corresponding analyses and evaluations cannot be expected to generalize well. As an example, we computed two statistics on benchmark graphs from the recent Open Graph benchmark, as well as from an older and larger graph data store called the Network Repository. While network repository was not necessarily intended for graph learning benchmarks, and therefore they don't have labels, we can use it as a comparative graph population for a much smaller graph learning benchmark collection like OGB. We find that OGB datasets exist in a low density region of the space of graphs from network repository. Thus, it's unknown whether or not performance rankings achieved on OGB generalize to other regions of graph space. Another risk this introduces is incremental overfitting of GNN architectures. In other words, successive reuse of these datasets may bias model architectures towards the properties of those datasets. And finally, access only to only a small number of large graph datasets makes development hard to scale for the average independent researcher who wants to experiment with GNM models. However, as mentioned, these consequences are here to stay, and experiments on real-world graphs remain very important for innovation. So we ask the question, how can we also evaluate GNNs on populations of diverse graphs? As a first approach to this problem, we, we introduce GraphWorld, which is a generalized framework and methodology for evaluating GNNs on synthetic graphs. Using Python-based beam parallelism on the Google Cloud platform, GraphWorld is able to simulate tunably diverse populations of graphs, train and test any number of GNN models, and aggregate GNN test metrics in a way that facilitates easy cross-model and cross-dataset comparisons. We propose that graph world be used as a complement to benchmarks on real world data sets. There are essentially two classes of preceding work. First, we have papers that introduce pipelines for cross model evaluation on fixed data sets, usually real world. These are useful, but do not involve synthetic data. Second, we have papers that include limited synthetic, da limited synthetic data set experiments, but these experiments focus only on one task and usually are not generalizable. Graph world improves on both of these types of works by systematizing GNN evaluations on arbitrarily diverse populations of synthetic graphs for any task. The first formal input to the graph world system is a task, is a task which can be represented as a product space of graphs, node features, and node labels. Note that this encapsulates graph classification tasks by organizing graphs along the adjacency diagonal. Additionally, graph world requires specifying a generator for the task, any number of models that solve the task, and a performance metric for the task. To give you an idea of which of these inputs is doing the work, GraphWorld creates an arbitrarily large and diverse task space by sampling from the generator's probability distribution. In our paper, 
we demonstrate graph world experiments with particular choices for these inputs. For example, for no classification, for no classification tasks, we use the well-known stochastic block model to generate graphs and features with heterogeneous properties. This model splits nodes into clusters and can generate arbitrary cluster homophily by setting what is known as the P to Q ratio, where P is the probability of within cluster edges and Q is the probability of between cluster edges. We also attach node features that can be more or less homophilous depending on the cluster centers. In the table, I'm showing three of more than 10 different parameters that control aspects of the SVM, including the degree distribution, the edge density, and the cluster sizes. The task of the GNN here is to infer the SVM node level labels on a held out portion of the graph, and we use the F1, 1 versus rest metric for e evaluation. However, the SBM is not a necessary generator for GraphWorld because GraphWorld is actually agnostic to the particular generator. Other generators, like the LFR benchmark, can be used to generate node classification tasks. Node classification is just one of the tasks we include in our paper. We also demonstrate graph property prediction and link prediction pipelines using various graph feature and label generators. For each task, we included these 10 GNN models and some baselines depending on the task. We note that the graphs generated in our experiments are small. The number of nodes in a tunable, uh, the number of nodes in GraphWorld is actually a, tuna, a tunable parameter of each generator. So GraphWorld experiments with larger graphs can be run. However, as a limitation of this system, GraphWorld cannot generate, for example, OGB mag size graphs because each GNN must be evaluated using the memory of one Google Cloud virtual machine. So as we mentioned, we ran large scale graph world node classification experiments. And this produces not just five, say, model rankings corresponding to the classic academic data sets, but a whole dense collection of model rankings computed over a continuous graph space. One of the main results we present in our paper is a visualization of the mean reciprocal rank of each model relative to other models over this space, again, relative to the classic data sets, which are also visualized on this surface. We see that model rankings remain relatively consistent over the subregion that contains the classic data sets, but change sharply when moved away from this region. In particular, the edge homogeneity of classic data sets is high. And when, model moves into, and when models move into less homogeneous regions, they seem to change performance. So we look at this as our main proof of concept for GraphWorld, since it shows that GraphWorld can generate task regions that produce new insights beyond what can be inferred from experiments only on a handful of data sets. Another capability of the GraphWorld system is marginal parameter analysis. We can compare the model's responses to changes in parameters of the generator. For instance, we found that models responded inconsistently to changes in both edge homogeneity and average degree, which correspond to some of the architectural differences between models. For this analysis, we find the most interesting 1D slices in this space by greedily searching for the collection of curves with the highest dependence on each generator parameter measured by the curves' is, uh, F statistics. There are certainly a few limitations of GraphWorld. For instance, in our paper, we only produce small synthetic graphs, as mentioned earlier. This makes it hard to test scale-dependent capacities of GNNs, such as the ability to encode long-range dependencies. Secondly, GraphWorld is agnostic to the task and the generator. The experiments in our paper are just examples, so they miss a lot of other possible tasks and the generators for those tasks. In fact, GraphWorld experiments Um, hello, Jun. Hi. Oh, so uh, 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 maybe maybe Jun is. Uh, I'm here. Ah, uh, yeah. I'm <laughs> I'm 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 saying. Uh, like Jun Jun Jun. Oh, yeah. Like clustering oh, okay. coefficients. Jun. Uh, there seems to be some issue in playing the video, so I think I can continue. That's fine. We're at the eight minute mark, and I, I think most of the main ideas were out, so no no worries. Yeah. Okay, there's some network issue happening. Sorry about that. That's okay. Yeah, hi, John. Uh, yeah, thanks for the hey. presentation. And uh, 
uh, is there, oh. Yeah, Tina has a comment. Yeah, awesome. I, I was going to say excellent work. Uh, there's this work that was done by JP Onella and his lab in, at uh, Harvard Bio, Biostats Department about finding flexible, mo flexible model selection, which is really nice. You may want to look into that. And then just a, a question is, um, do you have block two level Erdős Rainy model as part of your graph world? I put the reference Fuck, to it. Um... I see. Uh, so no, we did not include that particular generator in the paper. However, I believe that most random graph models are fair game for models that could test some capacity of GNNs. So the the two block Erdos Rainy model, you know, I'm actually not familiar with that one. It could be um, like the stochastic block model, but maybe not. Um, so it could test some ability of um, GNNs to distinguish between the blocks, or if it's higher hierarchical create a hierarchical representation or something like that so yeah so the good thing about uh, the two the the two level block um so or the better model they call it uh, the, the sure. block level air training model ba basically the process is i have a bunch of dense air training graphs and then i connect them in a scale free way um but the thing is that you can give it uh the degree distribution and the triangle distribution of the kind of graphs you're looking for right and many That's of the awesome. graph generators don't allow you to do that now, of course, we still want Correct. a graph generator that that will, uh, you know, take in also degree versus average um, number of triangles, but there's none there. But anyway, uh, there are two simple comments. Excellent work. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, yeah, thank you, Tina. Um, and uh, is there any other questions? Yeah, so maybe I also have a quick question. So, um, like I'm wondering, like what, uh, what kind of infra infrastructure will we rely on for 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 this library? Like, do you, because I I remember you mentioned uh, some kind of Google infrastructure are used in in in, in this work, right? So, um, right, like that um, Google, it's caused some problem for accessibility. The, um, the infra we use is entirely open source and available to okay. the average um, consumer and researcher. So basically you just sign up for Google Cloud um, and uh -huh. in our open source release coming within a month, we will have instructions for how to like rerun the experiments with a Google Cloud account and also how to rerun smaller experiments on your own machine, which I, we think is important for just like getting a quick start. So that'll come in about a month when we open source the code base as well. Yeah. Great, great. I, I look forward to it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, me too. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so let's move on to our final paper, um, which is uh, expert public benchmarks for dynamic heterogeneous academic graphs uh, by uh, Samira Horowalovis Sala. I'm sorry if I pronounce it wrong. <laughs> Aline uh, Aitung and uh, Anastasia uh, Us Usenko and Shivam Sharma, Jasmine Enshu, Robin Kospe, Maria Golinski, and uh, Svetlana Bokova. Hello, all. I am Samira Horavlubitana, and I'm a scientist at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, along with my colleagues, Alan, Anna, Shivam, Jasmine, Robin, Maria, and Svetlana. We're going to present our work today called Expert Public Benchmarks. Uh, probably Jones experiencing some network issues again. I can try if I can play the video.
with public benchmarks for dynamic heterogeneous academic drugs. This work is as a part of a bigger project in learning global proliferation expertise and capability evaluation from open source data. Unlike any other work to date, we propose an end to end solution to detect, anticipate, and reason about proliferation expertise, evolution from unstructured, dynamic, multilingual, real-world data. We started with collecting scientific PDFs from two domains on AI and nuclear, and uses natural language processing, deep learning, graph, and other AI-driven, usable, and explainable analytics to extract structured domain knowledge from scientific papers. We then perform predictive and prescriptive inferences to enable real-time understanding and reasoning to support non-proliferation mission. In this work, we are proposing a new graph benchmark that addressing the shortcomings of the existing graph benchmarks. These benchmarks can be divided by the input graphs spaces, both in the static and the temporal graphs, and also with the homogeneous and heterogeneous nodes and edge types. Most popular static homogeneous benchmarks are Cora, Sightseal, and the most recently released Open Graph Benchmark. They mainly focus on the co citation links that span across different paper nodes. OGB Benchmark has various networks that span across affiliations, authorship, and topics, yet, it does not support for the temporality. Our work is different from this work as we provide graph benchmark dataset that have both heterogeneous nodes and edges, such as collaboration, partnership, and expertise, and specifically how they evolve over time. Thus, we support both temporality and heterogeneity in a benchmark. To this end, we collect PDFs from different venues on AI and nuclear domain. Specific to the AI, papers were collected from SEL, iClear, ICML, and NeurIPS. And in nuclear domain, we use the proceedings of Web of Science, papers available in OSTI, and the Scopus as our databases to collect the data. In both domains, we use the subject matter experts to craft the keywords specific to the both AI and nuclear to filter the dataset. PDFs are first passed using the Grobit and Sermai tools to extract content as well as metadata such as author affiliation and country affiliation. Using an in-house developed processing pipeline as presented in the figure above, we process publication metadata and construct dynamic heterogeneous academic graphs. Our graph consists of three different node types, scientists, institution, and capability. These nodes are connected with three different edge groups that they are collaboration between two different scientists, partnership with the scientist and the institution, and expertise edges between a scientist and capability. More importantly, we perform entity resolution across scientists and institution. First, we create a unique node for authors and affiliations for each paper, and then manually combine nodes if two entities were determined to be the same. When resolving nodes, we consider several heuristics such as text similarity of the entities, edit distance between the two names, graph similarity of the nodes in the ego networks. Our graph data collection is as following. We have four different venues in the AI domain, SEL, ICML, iClear, and NeurIPS, and three different venues in nuclear domain, Web of Science, Corpus, and OSC. And our largest data set on AI is from SEL, that has more than 38,000 scientists and range across more than 200,000 collaboration edges. And on nuclear, the largest data sets from Web of Science, that where we had more than 1.3 million of scientist nodes, there where they have more than 4 million collaboration edges. In total, we had more than 3.5 million of nodes in our collection that range more than 34 million temporal edges. Let's see how our graphs change over time. Specifically here, we visualize how the number of edges change over time in both ACL and Web of Science dataset. Specific to the collaboration edges, we group the scientists into incumbent and newcomer node based on their appearance. 
and we see like on the acs community there are many newcomer nodes appeared on the late years in comparison to the web science community that where we had many repeated interaction similar pattern can be observed on the capabilities and the partnerships as well specific to the graph machine learning community we propose three interesting questions we can use this data set to predict what is the institution or the scientist, a given scientist will collaborate with next in terms of predicting the collaboration and partnership patterns. Similarly, we can ask whether what is the next capability a scientist will publish on to address the authorship behavior. In terms of the con predicting the content evolution over time, we can ask whether what are the scientists who are will publish on a given capability. We can frame this problem as a multi-step link prediction task. Since our graphs consist of capability, scientist, and institution nodes, and they are connected by the temporal links, the, all the historical graph can be treated as in the discrete time snapshot graphs or as the continuous version of the same graphs. The task is to predict the links appeared on the future graphs. The model that we want to design should need to predict the edges between seen or unseen entities and also need to adapt to the dynamic nature of the how they would evolve. Here we propose a systematic way of looking at the associated problem complexity in the temporal link prediction task. We define the temporal link prediction task in both transductive and the inductive task. In the transductive task, we have nodes that are seen in both training and the testing that can be further divided into the first time and the repeated interaction. Similarly, in the inductive forecasting, we have the edges that interact with at least one unseen node and with the seen node. We define the transductive task complexity by the number of first time edges over the number of transductive edges. And similarly, in the inductive task, we define the number of inductive edges over the total number of edges as the complexity measurement. In both setup, higher the proportion, higher the task complexity. As you can see in the picture on your right, you see the both transductive and the inductive task complexity increases in the ACL domain, but on the web of science domain, it's only the transductive task complexity increases. We propose new evaluation procedures in the temporal link prediction task. For example, we can report the performance with the associated task complexity in both transductive and the inductive forecasting. As we have heterogeneous nodes and edge types, we can report the performance across multiple edge types. Similarly, since we have temporal links, we can forecast for the multiple time step ahead. We can also address the memory staleness problem by reporting the performance for both active and inactive nodes. Here we report the performance of seven baseline models, where five baseline models are originally developed for the static homogeneous graph, while the last two, RNA and the TGN, are developed for the dynamic heterogeneous graph. As you can see here, all the models perform well on predicting the repeated interactions as expected in the mean reciprocal rank metric. But in the same time, RNA as a model stands out in the transductive task in comparison to the rest of the baseline. However, the TGN model that account the continuous time graphs does well in terms of predicting the inductive edges. Our pre-processing codes, models, and the widgets are available in our GitHub under the name PNNL Expert. To adhere to the FAIR data principles, we make data available via the Berkeley Nuclear Data Cloud. You can access our data set under the project name Global Expertise Forecasting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Samira, for the, for the presentation. Um, is there any questions from the audience? All right, so uh, I, have a, I have a question for you. So um, 
like what are some like unique challenges when the graphs are both dynamic and heterogeneous when, when, when you when you are modeling them in, in like in terms of the like the prediction task on, on this kind of data so yes. are there any some unique challenges when you combine these two yes it's a good question so the major challenge is that uh so you can treat this heterogeneous graph as a collection of different individual subset of graphs. For so example, in our setup, like the scientist to capability edges were pretty less compared with the scientist to scientist collaboration edges, because the capabilities that we limited to around like 20 to 50, but where the scientists you have around more than 40,000 in the ACL domain. So you can see that's kind of an imbalance in terms of the subset graph subset whenever you want to learn and how the specifically the subset kind of as a collection evolve differently for example uh scientist to scientist interaction in in the a ai domain rapidly changes but the uh in the nuclear domain as you see like on there would be many repeated interactions between different two different scientists and also they have been basically repeatedly interacting with the same ex expertise. So I think the heterogeneity brings different challenges, both in terms of the prediction task. That's why TV thought to like represent or report the performance across different heterogeneous edge types. So the knot groups would be more interesting and could drill down the performance better than presenting them on aggregate. I see. Yeah, thank you. Um, is there any other questions? Okay, so if there's no questions, we can wrap up this session and uh, please come back in about 15 minutes. Uh, so uh, in our last session, we'll have a panel discussion uh, with uh, four panelists, uh, Luna Dong, uh, Petr Velikovic, Min Jae Wang, and Ro Xu will join us uh, as, as panelists. And the, the uh, the panel discussion starts at uh, 6.15 p.m. At, uh, in CEST time. Um, yeah, so like it's about 53 minutes from now. Uh, let's have a break and uh, please come back. Yeah, so my name is Anton and I will be moderating the discussion today. Um, we have uh, four exciting speakers for the workshop of the graph learning benchmarks uh, to discuss the present, past, and future of benchmarking, uh, graph neural networks in particular, and graph models maybe more uh, generally. I will first uh, maybe introduce the speakers one by one, and then uh, we can start uh, discussing the benchmarking. So we, first, we have four exciting speakers. First, we have uh, Luna Dong, uh, which is a head scientist at Facebook, AI, AR and VR uh, assistant. Um, before, she was working at Amazon, uh, leading on efforts on knowledge graph. We have uh, Petra Velichkovic uh, in, from DeepMind and University of Cambridge. Um, we have uh, Min Jie Wang from Amazon uh, in uh, Amazon Shanghai Lab. And we have uh, Rosie Yu, uh, professor at the University of San Diego, California, San Diego. So we have people from all over the world and we have uh, people from all the different time zones and all the different expertise uh, joining us to discuss benchmarking with GNNs. So I wanted to maybe start with a kind of generic question. Uh, given your unique experience and unique application points uh, with GNNs, can you talk uh, shortly about uh, some specific pain points you have encountered in your own application domains? So I will maybe make this as a round question and I will start uh, one by one. Uh, firstly, maybe starting with Luna. Uh, You're muted. Can you hear me? Okay, cool. Um, so uh, my background is um, I spent the past 10 years building knowledge graphs. And uh, this started with um, uh, Google generic knowledge graphs. And then I 
uh, spent about five years at Amazon building product knowledge graphs. And um, so for these 10 years, we have been building a graph that is a special graph knowledge graph. We have been using the graph to support different applications. And uh, also, as we build the graph, we actually also are kind of uh, getting a lot of information from other kinds of uh, graphs. For example, we, mod uh, we extract knowledge from semi-structured websites. For example, if you think about IMDB, so you instead of uh, chunks of texts, you have attribute value pairs, and we model that as a graph. And also for user behavior, such as purchasing, putting things into the shopping cart, et cetera, we also model it as a graph. So we try to mine those graphs to extract knowledge and um, do recommendations, et cetera. So that's how I have been working on knowledge, uh, on graph in the past years. So given um, your working experience with the knowledge cross, do you have something uh, to share with us about how, you know, slightly differently the evaluation is done, uh, the benchmarking is done there? Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. So that's a, um, so that's um, always a challenge we face. And uh, regarding the evaluation, one thing I find out is uh, in industry and in academia, there is always something different. And I remember it's a few years ago, we have a bunch of um, intern students arriving at the beginning of summer. And uh, they asked me, hey, what is the evaluation metric in industry? And uh, yes, at that time I worked for Amazon Retail and I said, we have only one evaluation metric and that is dollars. And uh, this is definitely not kidding, but uh, it is the most important thing uh, for, uh, for certain use cases. And um, uh, let me give you an example, uh, a concrete example, rather than all of this like jokes regarding how the evaluation could be different between academia and industry. So um, I don't know how many of you have heard of this uh, knowledge inference. Basically, you have a knowledge graph, and then you want to infer some knowledge. And um, normally, when we um, write papers about knowledge inference, uh, we will uh, use knowledge embedding and what we will report includes, for example, MRR. So basically, um, if we are given a subject and a predicate, and we try to predict the object, and we will basically um, report, okay, among, let's say, among the, uh, this is also another metric is hit at five, among the top five uh, predicted objects, uh, whether or not the correct object is included in it. And um, so that's normally what we do in the, uh, in the in the in the papers, but in practice, when we do this in production, it is totally different because if we make a mistake in the inferred knowledge, basically we provide different or wrong information to the user, and it can be very uh, untrustworthy experiences for the users. And uh, another example, which is even simpler, uh, is that we, in, when we write papers, we often like report F measure. So basically we try to trade off precision and recall. And uh, in industry, when we sort of um, productionize stuff, we seldom consider F measure. And our goal is typically, we first get to a certain precision bar, for example, 90% precision. And uh, this is something that is barely acceptable, meaning every 10 values or whatever we provide you, one time it is wrong. And um, we set that precision bar and then we look at the recall. And if the recall is, is reasonable, we launch it. And after the launch, over time, we try to improve the recall. And it's never that, hey, we try to get the uh, best uh, F measure, because let's say if the best F measure means low precision, still we cannot launch this. So all of these are like a different uh, mindsets for evaluations. 
Um, thank you so much uh, for your experience. I think we will proceed with Petar and then we will switch to more dialogue-esque uh, discussion formats uh, later on. So please take the stage. All right. Um, yeah, in terms of biggest pain points, I guess I'll highlight two things I was involved in, one which was more industrial, the other which was more scientific. Uh, on the industry side, uh, uh, our team at DeepMind had uh, deployed graph representation learning models inside Google Maps, and it's currently serving queries for travel time prediction worldwide. I think the, one of the main pain points we experienced there, which I mean might be said of most machine learning models in industry, is that uh, the model we launch is very rarely going to be the model that had the best performance simply because um, the uh, the offset of the costs required to run a better model uh, are often not justified even if there is a significant improvement in accuracy so some of our best performing some of our best performing models used a lot more of the graph structure of the road network but just loading that extra graph structure of the road network meant that the system ran much slower and therefore it was not feasible to serve as many queries as we had to do. So that was one uh, sl slight wake up moment for me. The second one uh, on our recent work on uh, combining uh, graph representation learning, among other things, to help uh, settle mathematical conjectures or propose new approaches to mathematical problems. There, we found that a big pain point was explainability, or more specifically, reliably figuring out why did a graph network uh, learn to do something that it uh, well predicted something that it did. In our case, we were very fortunate that uh, within all of that garbage that a classical explainability method might produce, uh, a very keen, dedicated top mathematician, if they stare at it for long enough, will figure out the underlying signal. But if we want to make a method like this broadly available for all of mathematicians, we really need to think deeper about explainability. I think it's a bit underrepresented in the community right now. I hope that answers your question, Anton. It does. It does. Um, just a reminder for our listeners that you can also un un ask questions in the chat and I will pick them up. Uh, but we will proceed uh, with Rose uh, next as our sole representative of pure or like pure academic research. Oh, disclaimer, I'm not a pure academic researcher. I also have a part-time appointment at Google Research. <laughs> so um, anyways, my point, uh, my research focus on time series modeling, spatial temporal data modeling. The I guess the scenarios where we encounter graph is one example like in traffic modeling, where we have road networks as graph. And we did one of the first work on forecasting traffic patterns, account, uh, accounting for graph patterns. Uh, represented in road networks. Um, we also work with CDC to understand dynamics of COVID progression. And in that case, we have the mobility graphs of uh, how community move over time. And we in infer these graphs and then use the graphs to make better predictions of number of cases in COVID. So that's on the application side. And on the theoretical side, we try to understand the representation power of graph networks. And then we did some early work about uh, trying to understand what cannot be learned or what can cannot be learned by graph neural networks. Um, and in terms of pain point, um, I think one of the challenge is uh, you know, computation because we typically work, work with a large number of time series. On, so in the traffic case, we have several thousands of sensors which correspond to a large graph and they also evolve over time. So uh, the number of dimensions will explode with the number of timestamps and number of nodes in the graph. Um, so we, I think in academia, sometimes we, we don't have the training to deal with large scale systems and, you know, on low level implementation of uh, these uh, algorithms. Um, yeah, in terms of benchmarking performances, I think one interesting fact is that when we work with CDC, we realize it's not only the point prediction that's only that's useful, that matters because we not only care about like how many cases we will have in the next few weeks, but we also care about uncertainty that associated with these predictions. So we wanna know how confident the model is, how can we leverage uncertainty to make decisions? Um, so in, in that case, we actually come up with new metrics to quantify the uncertainty of the forecast. Um, so that's just something that is kind of missing in the graph learning community. Thank you. That's uh... The second time uncertainty and uh, explainability has been mentioned so i guess that's uh, one of the big pain points uh, for all of us so let's also hear from minji um what would be your experience 
Yeah, yeah. Hi, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. So perhaps my background is quite different from all the people here because I'm a system developer and system researcher. So basically at Shanghai here, I'm I'm leading the deep graph library framework uh, development and also all sort of like system library research. So as a system researcher, like on graph machine learning. Um, I'm always looking to build a better system, right? So, uh, so the, the the pain point right now is if we look at, for example, what are the most promising neural network graph neural network? It is very difficult to say. And even if we look at the OGB data set, right, or the all these benchmarks, although they have a variety of the domains, but you you are really see like one like graph neural network actually dominated everything, right? So I, I can see there are a couple of reasons. For example, like a, a lot of model there, they are using like raw features in the, instead of like structure or use a very slightly little structure information there. And you can see like the data set proposed, the benchmark proposed right now is kind of facing a multi-modality problem. Like you are facing the problem with like how to deal with features, how to deal with structures. And if one, one side is waiting over the other side and, and this makes the model very difficult to design. And this is this is perhaps one thing. Uh, and the other thing is we are also looking at the end-to-end -end pipeline. Uh, as we observe, like in a lot of real world scenario or, or, or sort of customers we're facing, um, they don't actually come up with the graph. <laughs> so it is really a difficult thing because uh, uh, it, it all depends on the task we want to solve. You need to understand, okay, how you generate the graph, right? And even if for the benchmark right now, and the graph is quite different from, from if you look at the image, right? We take a picture, it's, it represents the real world. It's correct, right? But if you look at the graph data, it is generated by human tracing, right? So there will be error and the data collection may have some errors there, right? And I think many of the speakers had mentioned uncertainty. I, I totally agree with that. This is, there's a lot of error and how to deal with that is a difficult thing. So what we are looking is uh, how to start from scratch, how to start from like non-structured data, how to generate structure from that. And the data generation process is quite important. I think it's, it's somewhat missing uh, in the current, like uh, the entire pipeline, yeah. Thank you, that's very exciting uh, for the graph building. Um, so I think that one uh, point about the OGB uh, mention is also something that people has asked uh, us over Twitter. Um, they asked us basically for, about generic versus task specific benchmarks. So in OGB, we have this kind of a unified platform, but on that we have something like 10 or 15 day, different data sets from different subdomains, like as a field, um, the question is, how do we, you know, focus developing all the best, you know, the best of the best GNN models on all the data sets versus specializing and developing tricks uh, that work, uh, maybe not so generalizably on a subset of these? Anyone who wants to jump in? Yeah, maybe I can talk a little bit. <laughs> maybe I can talk a little bit. I mean, I mean, I'm not a, a real like expert in model designing, but from the data side, I can see as I mentioned before, like uh, uh, we we are like solving problems that mixing a lot of aspect together, right? Like if you look at the different domains, these networks, if we consider how the network is generated, right, and if we consider how the features are incorporated, they are all from different sources, from different domain knowledge. And uh, and the right now the benchmark right now it's it doesn't it doesn't say okay we have a, a general I would say property like a summarization across different like uh, different different data set so uh, and I will say like if we wanted to develop a general like uh, architecture uh, that can fit on, uh, that can fit on different domains it will be better if we can separate the different aspects say okay we have a different benchmark set. And it is designed specifically for folks, for example, certain network characteristics. I think many of the I mean, many of the papers in this workshop is targeting this kind of aspect, this kind of idea, right? Say, okay, we want to have some homophily data set, some heterophily data set, or like care about different like spectrum, right? So I think it's a good starting point uh, uh, in terms of that. Anyone else wants to comment from their uh, diverse experience. I can jump in here um, regarding this uh, generic so solution versus uh, special cases and uh, how to build the benchmark to support one of them or both of them. And uh, this is actually 
A great question. And I feel like no matter where we are, we are facing this uh, problem. Uh, when I sort of uh, write papers in academia, I sort of um, try to balance between get um, a solution that works for many, many different domains and uh, uh, problems. And, or write something that works for a special domain. And the generic knowledge graph and the product knowledge graph, this is one example. And uh, when we build the systems in industry, it is similar. We try to decide, okay, if we write a platform where many, many different sort of uh, end features can be developed uh, beyond it, or it is just for some particular use cases. It's kind of the same uh, sort of uh, balance trade-off to make. And um, it's possibly slightly different for academia and for industry choices. And for academia, I kind of feel um, either you are method-driven or you are um, problem driven. And why am I saying this? So uh, just as an example, GN is more of a method driven. We have this um, graph neural network and we can use it to solve different problems like social network, like um, product, no uh, sorry, knowledge graph, uh, like um, some of this uh, behavior network like uh, browsing or purchasing. And uh, that is more of a method driven. And on the other hand, we could have a problem at hand. For example, it could be building a knowledge graph. It could be uh, like a recommendation. And to solve that problem, we try to use whatever methods that work best for that problem space. And then um, the question is eventually there is no uh, which is best, which we should um, uh, sort of uh, put more emphasis on. And uh, normally for a generic uh, solution, when we want to use it to solve a real problem, we start with it. And oftentimes after that, we need to do some tricks. And um, so it's almost impossible that there is something that we take it and it works uh, perfectly. And uh, on the other hand, as we solve concrete problems, we identify some interesting generic problems. And uh, taking uh, data augmentation as an example, uh, I mean, we already have some like um, uh, deep learning methods that seem to work well, but when we put it into practice, we find out, okay, because of the skew of the training data, what we get is not as ideal as we hope for. And as this problem happened uh, here and there, we realize, okay, uh, we need something that make it more uh, robust. And that comes back to that kind of motivated some generic problem and for all of this data augmentation. So I think it is not a choice between the two, rather it's more of a balance. And um, there will be a lot of um, uh, benefit uh, to build uh, benchmark for particular domains, verticals. And on the other hand, when we want to test out the effectiveness of generic methods, we want to test out on many different domains. And um, taking GN as an, as an example again, we might want to test it out on five different kinds of uh, graph um, problems to see how effective it is. And those five um, benchmarks are actually developed by four different domains. So with this being said, building benchmarks, this is actually a first building benchmarks for different scenarios will help both. And the second is actually a good way to um, kind of uh, help the two different uh, methods to meet in the middle. Thank you. Um, this also relates somewhat to the question raised in the chat by Egon uh, Flanagan. Um, the question is about non-GNN methods competing with GNN methods for predictions. So oftentimes when we write a GNN paper, we compare with five different GNN methods. Uh, and then we kind of, you know, uh, maybe naturally emit uh, some of the baselines over the time this happens more and more. I'm wondering like, um, so for instance, I, I know that uh, better benchmarked uh, and compared against uh, non-GNN methods for this road traffic prediction problem that they described beautifully in the blog. 
uh, how was your experience, uh, you know, going back and comparing against all, all of the different methods? Well, um, to answer Johan's question directly, I will just say that the answer is uh, uh, yes. So people definitely think that should think that non-GNN methods provide good benchmarks. In fact, uh, on many problems of industrial interest, non-GNN methods will perform better than GNNs. And this by now I hope is more or less an accepted uh, statement in the, in the field. Um, I think I have a bit of a a bit of a great position in that the problems I work on are totally unsolvable by traditional label smoothing graph analysis methods because you actually have to do computation or non-trivial computation over the graph structure that you have. And as a result, you cannot get away without doing something like a GNN to do that computation. But for many problems where you have to do something like propagating labels from a, from a small set of nodes onwards or doing simple kind of knowledge graph completion, like in most of those kinds of problems, traditional methods can and will be very strong baselines. And there's been many papers saying that, especially if you expect a certain degree of homophily, that uh, a graph neural network could learn to do the same thing, but you're just overparametrizing a problem that doesn't need to be overparametrized. So, yeah, generally, uh, I'm now teaching a master's course in graph representation learning. And one of the first things I say to my students is, uh, before you make glorious claims about GNNs, try to remove the graph and see if the result is any worse. And you'll find that in some problems of interest, the, the performance will be not that much worse, actually. So deep sets models, for example, which uh, are basically graph neural networks with the unit adjacency matrix, and therefore far more scalable, can be competitive with GNNs on many graph level prediction problems, simply because uh, the graph structure itself either wasn't that useful to begin with, or uh, as uh, many of the other co-panelists already mentioned, how much do we really trust the graph? In many cases, you'd be surprised how heuristical the graph actually is and how we're not actually even that confident that the graph should have the form that it currently has. So yeah, and even in cases where you can trust the graph perfectly, you can actually find alternative edges which express the same thing and allow you to solve the problem much better. I'll just give one quick simple example. I want to query whether two nodes in my graph are connected. So I have a graph and I have my two nodes as uh, tagged with a binary input flag and I want to say yes or no, are these two nodes connected? A typical GNN ran over the ground truth graph will need in the worst case, big O of n steps to cover a potentially very long path. But if I instead choose to represent my graph in a different way and use the disjoint set union data structure, which represents all the connected components in my graph, so it's great for that kind of query, I have now reduced the time complexity from big O of n to the inverse Ackerman function, which for all astronomically large inputs of n is less than five. So even if the graph is perfect, the input edges may not be the optimal edges for the task that you need to perform. So these are all issues that we have to take into account uh, when benchmarking GNN versus non-GNN methods. Thanks. Um, yeah, right. I think that this goes into the direction of uh, like how can we augment or transform the, G the graph structure such that our, you know, we would still see, say GNN models work um, well enough uh, on them. So I think uh, Rose maybe if you can talk about some of the modeling decisions that you had uh, with the time series specifically. Um, that... uh, sure. Yeah. So, so yeah, so I mean, we have seen, seen some cases where a GNN have substantial advantages of a traditional method, for example, in traffic forecasting, traditional methods would use the differential equation based methods, the LWR model, ARZ model. Um, and these models are really slow to simulate and very rely on very strong assumptions such as non-linearity in dynamics. So we observe that if we have large amount of data in the case of traffic, uh, it's actually much better to use deep learning methods such as GNNs. Um, however, when we're looking at transductive learning tasks, uh, we actually don't see any advantage in GNN. In fact, the traditional method was great. I think this kind of phenomenon has been observed by uh, uh, other groups as well who are working on this, like just, uh, like just in Austin Benson's group and uh, including some of our colleagues at Northeastern. Um, we basically compare the traditional methods um, like graph network science-based methods with GNNs. And we see that GNNs generalize terribly to new tasks and announcing labels, uh, whereas traditional methods uh, was great in this kind of transductive learning tasks. 
Um, and I think that's one of the major challenges in uh, deep learning methods is that they don't generalize to on-scene test set or uh, to new tasks very well. Uh, for instance, um, one of the applications we did is to predict the binding affinity between drugs and, uh, uh, and proteins. And we realized what, that the GNS actually don't do uh, well at all in that case when there's new target given to the data set, but if you use tra traditional network science-based methods, uh, it can generalize to on-scene target and on-scene drugs. So that's one of the challenges. Thank you. Um, so one more question from the chat uh, from Michael Galkan. Uh, so far, it seems that knowledge graphs in industry are more of a data organization paradigm for products recommendation rather than doing real science quotation marks. How do you think, is it mostly because knowledge graph community comes from the database semantic web background and not that much of a machine learning? What do you think would be real science with knowledge graphs? I'm not sure what the definition of a real science is. So if you can uh, specify on that, uh, we can answer the question uh, better, but maybe uh, Luna? you try to tackle it? Yeah, I, I fully agree. I, I want to first understand what do you mean by real science to better answer this question, Michael? Uh, mostly those problems uh, as are solved with the uh, GNNs uh, like drug discovery or uh, yeah, like traffic prediction or those real uh, big uh, complex objectives. So far, what seems uh, from my experience observing KG applications is more of a storing, exchanging structured information rather than uh, applying it for big, uh, practical, societally impactful use cases. Okay, uh, thanks a lot for the explanation. And you're basically saying uh, you are more of uh, thinking uh, about all of this uh, neural network solutions. And it seems that is not um, applied much in industry. Is that your thought and the question? Yes, yes. Okay, sure. So um, first, as far as I understand and observe, I don't fully feel industry is not using neural network for building knowledge graphs. And um, let me give you an example uh, for my past project at Amazon, where we are trying to build a product knowledge graph. And um, a lot of the product knowledge is buried in the text. And so there are a lot of NLP solutions trying to extract uh, knowledge from the product profiles, including the titles, descriptions, and so on. And there is also uh, kind of um, the multimodal solutions, building transformers, getting the embedding on the text profiles as far as the product images to decide if what is a particular attribute for the products, and also whether some of the product values product attribute values are incorrect. So um, I think um, I, I, I don't have this strong feeling that industry is not using uh, like um, the latest neural network solutions to build knowledge graph. So that's number one. Number two, there are uh, solutions that have been proposed in academia, but not used much in industry. That I definitely agree. And you mentioned about knowledge inference. And um, <clears throat> so when we do all of this knowledge embedding to decide if one uh, knowledge triple subject predicate object is correct, or if uh, some uh, doing some inference given subject predicate or given predicate object, etc., and uh, we have quite a lot of papers, a lot of methods proposed to solve this problem, and I haven't seen it used that much in industry. And the reason is not because it is based on neural networks. The reason is is not production quality. And as I said, ninety percent precision. This is the lowest bar for uh, generating and showing some uh, knowledge facts to the users. And if we come back to those papers and see what is their precision, oftentimes it's far below. So that is um, 
part of the reason. Oftentimes we see like hit at three, hit at five being 50%. And this basically means top five answers are all incorrect possibly. And so that's definitely not launchable. So I think these are the two major things. I can tell you a little bit more about why it is actually really hard to do automatic knowledge extraction. First, as I said, the precision bar is high. This is very different from recommendation, for example. For recommendation, I can recommend you something. And um, as far as it is useful for you, you won't complain too much, even if it may not be exact, may not be the best, but for knowledge generation, it is different because we are providing you data. And if we say something wrongly, this is a big miss. And so it is much higher bar and higher bar on precision. So that's why it is um, harder. And, um, and a second, there is a lot of a variety in the data. The data in different domains could be different. The data in different data sources could have a lot of um, uh, different features. Uh, I mean, I, I just mentioned about semi-structured data. When you look at all of this IMDB or some other sort of um, uh, semi-structured websites, even though they all give you structure, uh, they all give you data in attribute value pairs, it's very, very different formats. So it's hard to do all of this auto extraction. And finally, I just want to fix you uh, on one thing you said. Uh, I mean, database is a science is a science field as well. And uh, there are actually this database um, sort of um, uh, their uh, theory, uh, theoretical database uh, community who <laughs> possibly did more logic than any other community. And so uh, don't say this is not real science because it's because of uh, database and semantic web is behind it. All right. Um, so figuring out what the real science is, um, I have a next maybe question uh, to discuss. There has been a large push in the past maybe two, three years with OGBA specifically on larger scale data sets. And given that, you know, uh, most of the panelists are from the industry, I'm wondering, is this enough? You know, um, do we have the data sets that we want? Do we have the data sets that represent our daily work? And uh, why not? Anyone wants to take a first step on the academia versus industry big data sets? Yeah, I can start a little bit. The short answer is no. <laughs> the short answer is no. Like uh, in terms of scale and the complexity, I would say. Like, um, so right now the biggest uh, like open academic data set is like paper 100 million uh, OGB and Mac, right? That is like um, several hundred million nodes several billion edges, right? And uh, that's just too too tiny compared with the industry scale. Uh, yeah, and uh, this in terms of scalability. And the other thing is um, the complexity. As I mentioned, one is the, the, the uncertainty, like there are a lot of things uh, in, in, in the real world data set. Other is the heterogeneity, like uh, almost all the data in, in industry is heterogeneous graph. And also they have timestamps. Right, so it's both temporal and heterogeneous. And I don't see any like public data set is close to that. So, but I, I won't say like, maybe, I won't say go through that route is correct. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that this is, there's a more complexity, but the tackle, tackling a more complex problem, do not say, okay, we want to go that route. We want, may want to decompose the problem into several aspects and then solve them piece by piece. And maybe the methodology combined together can give a better result. Uh, I, I can add to what Vintia said. I fully agree. It is not representative at all. And uh, working for industry for these many years, sometimes I really hope I could have a way to share the data or to share the complexity of the problem we face uh, in industry with all of this uh, super smart people from academia. I just don't know how. And um, all of this data have privacy issue. 
um, and um, and uh, I mean size and uh, complexity. This is one big thing, as Mintia said. Um, on the other hand, there are a lot of user behavior data that we can see, and uh, we sort of feel, oh my God, this is totally out of expectation. But it's hard for other people who haven't seen the data to to appreciate the complexity or the the problems behind it. The insights it's hard to get the insights either. And um, I agree with what Minjie said regarding uh, getting the separating out a bunch of uh, problems. Uh, that's one way. Uh, sometimes just seeing the data itself helps uh, sort of. Um, motivate uh, some new solutions. And um, maybe one possibility is to really for this uh, seamless collaboration is through internship, through all of this uh, like um, uh, visiting scholars, et cetera. So in those cases, academia people, no matter whether that is uh, professors, students, PhD students come to industry looking at the real data and try to sort of um, develop some, some methods and the insights they get from the industry on the real data can hopefully uh, sort of um, uh, inspire some new solutions even after they go back uh, to, to academia. So that's another way I can think of. And uh, if any possibility for industry to share some of the data sets, that would be best. Uh, I know how hard it is to get the legal approval. I also know because this is less appreciated from uh, companies. So it is kind of extra work that people cannot find enough um, time to do. Um, so that's kind of a pity. So uh, I thought a little bit about this question and uh, I'll say definitely that the currently available data sets do not meet general industrial needs. So I'll just echo what uh, uh, the previous panelists already said. Um, but I thought, you know, I've been thinking, what's the point in this panel where uh, I can most conveniently plug the recent work that I've been doing? And uh, uh, I think this is the right moment. So basically, uh, the, the problems that I'm currently working on wouldn't necessarily be called industrial on the surface, although they have implications for many industrial problems. I want to create graph neural networks that are capable of executing classical algorithmic computations. So think the kinds of algorithms that you see in a textbook. And this is because most real world problems require you to use some of these algorithms, but the real world data is noisy, high dimensional complex, and it does not align with the preconditions to apply those algorithms, right? To run Dijkstra's algorithm to find shortest paths, you need to have one scalar per edge in an abstractified graph. But what if my data input is a you know, real world stream from a road network where I have very dynamically changing conditions, weather, roadblocks, traffic lights, and so on, right? These kinds of high dimensional algorithmic approximators could then be a great plug and play component in problems that require these kinds of uh, tasks. Now, the great thing about learning an algorithmic reasoner is that there's nothing proprietary about it. You can implement an algorithm and use it to generate huge data sets of algorithmic trajectories that your model can fit. With the main you know, uh, bottleneck there is that there is a lot of engineering effort around preparing a benchmark which uh, uh, supports all of those algorithms together. So. Uh, we have recently released the benchmark. I put the link in the chat if you're interested. It took me two years of engineering along with many other engineers at DeepMind to make this accessible. So it was something that I've done kind of on the side to my regular work. As, uh, as mentioned by Luna, this is like something that, uh, you know, not, not many people can find enough time to do something like this. But we managed to release a data set of 30 algorithms with detailed trajectories from the CLRS textbook. And I'm pleased to announce that currently our state-of-the-art graph neural networks can solve out of distribution exactly one of them, the simplest one, BFS, pass a hot potato around the graph. Everything else, we struggle greatly in the out of distribution regime. So if somebody wants to play with a set of freely accessible problems that could greatly impact uh, industry problems as well as influence uh, you know, the design of stronger GNNs because you really need a GNN that imitates the computation, this is a possible data set to look into. Uh, okay, shameless plug stops now, but thank you. <laughs> thank you for the shameless promotion. I think that's a uh, very, uh, very timely and very uh, nicely fit into the question. 
so maybe Rose, uh, can you, as a person uh, that has not crossed the bridge to industry entirely, um, what would be your experience into sharing the data with maybe your students and collaborators? Um, so I think that there's a pretty good like tradition in the time series community that people do share data. Um, we have like M5 like uh, forecasting competition, which is collection of data from different industry like finance, uh, logistical companies, and another kind of uh, industry that will provide the data that normally I think they do some anonymization of this data. Um, and then there is also an increasing interest. That, for example, we work with uh, trajectory data, and then. Uh, there's self-driving car companies willing to share uh, their collected data, you know, in a huge amount of volume, and they host these competitions uh, for us. Then we can participate in uh, various competitions, and we get a hold of, uh, you know, what the kind of real world data looks like. It's messy, and you know, I just echo what other panelists said. Um, I think the the other uh, application we work with, like climate data, so uh, it is a very uh, friendly community because the data is collected by national agencies and you know, they release the data to public. I, I really wanted to, um, you know, call for action for the community that is a very uh, rich data set with a lot of interesting problems. Um, and uh, they have both simulation and uh, observational data available uh, and climate change is one of the biggest challenge we are facing these days. So uh, definitely take a look at that and a lot of graph learning problems as well. Uh, because you can think about uh, the spatial mesh on the Earth as a graph, the 3D graph, and uh, uh, also the interactions between uh, different uh, climate agents, let's say uh, hurricanes and the temperatures and all these things, they have very complex interactions. So I feel it's a very interesting venue for the graph community to take a look at it. Thank you. Um, I have a maybe next discussion point. So a lot of you mentioned the uncertain graphs uh, as they're you know one of the major pain points that's not really addressed by a community. So what would be a good benchmark uh, to address uh, these issues of uh, uncertain, untrustworthy graphs? So as a yeah, as a moderator, so maybe yeah. maybe one suggestion on like I think if I understood correctly, your question is like what could be a good benchmark for trustworthy graph construction, I guess. And right. I think one thing that we can I mean, I used to shy away from synthetic data sets and I thought that they were, you know, oversimplifying the question, but I feel like when you're able to control for all the aspects of your problem. Uh, it does teach you something about the limits of what the model is able to do. And well, I guess now I've been fully converted since the past uh, five or six top tier conference papers I published were almost completely on synthetic data. So just to say, don't, don't underestimate the power of these kinds of things. So in the, in the topic of uh, reliably learning to estimate the true underlying data structure, I think causality is going to be a big mover in this direction. Like causality researchers are not going to settle for a suboptimal graph, right? You need to tell them what's the true causal model behind what they're looking at, not something you've ad hoc constructed on the fly to make your predictions easier. So I feel like we can build maybe a synthetic data set with known causal relationships between the nodes where, uh, you know, we have some relationships between the nodes that say how the distribution of one influences the features or labels of another. And, you know, given the features of some nodes predict the labels of others and uh, try in the process, like without being given the graph structure, of course. And then your benchmark is more successful as you're better at fitting the labels and as you're better at fitting the graph structure. Uh, usually, I think some causal interventions can be a good direction and like evaluating to what extent is your structure actually as good as it is, right? Because if you predicted an edge between something that shouldn't exist, then an intervention on one of them should leave the other thing unchanged or something like that, right? Depending on the, I think that the separation is the property, right? So basically, yeah, causality, I think, will be a big driver of benchmarking in this space. Uh, I think gradually causality researchers are starting to use more and more GNNs in their work. I've seen uh, Rosemary Kaff from DeepMind that did a lot of very cool research in this direction recently. So I think, yeah, that, that's probably going to be the main driver of like reliable graph construction because you'd be surprised how easy it is to construct a hacky graph, which is just good enough for propagating data to get you the answers you need. 
So, you know, we can trick ourselves into thinking we're building good graphs when in reality, they're just decently enough built expander graphs or something like that. So the diffusion of data is good enough, right? Right, but then this raises the question, do we need the good graphs, right? Do we need this perfect causal graphs with the direct relations and edges that are absolutely perfect or the GNN models will smooth things for us? Uh, if you want to do science with GNNs, definitely so, yes. Any other comments on the science causality noisy graphs? I personally feel it is um, it is important to have some uh, good graph to test out um, the science side of the, the 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 solutions. On the other hand, we also need some benchmarks that really represent the real data. And um, the real data is highly skewed, is oftentimes noisy, is heterogeneous. Uh, and um, so we, we need to show some truth or show some reality um, to, 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 to all of our scientists, researchers as well. Yeah, I also wanna say, um, the issue right here is like building such a benchmark is very costly. It's very expensive. Like if you look at like um, I'll say okay, I'm you I'm labeling some images right. Like identify people. This is somewhat cheap right now, but if you want to build a graph, uh, this requires domain knowledge and also require a lot of like teaching actually to to do so right. So. So generally speaking, to make like a specific data set for a certain purposes, like a, a noisy detection or like for certainty purposes, it will be, so I'm, I'm more like in the middle. I will say we, 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 we probably don't need a certain, this kind of benchmark, but we really need to consider that, uh, like maybe for example, in the modeling, because the real data is like that, right? So we, our, our model, when we try to make our architecture, how to design this uh, like diffusions Right, this methodology to we need to consider that and try to encounter uh, come to counter that uh, from the algorithm side. All right, thank you for the middle opinion uh, on our uh, heated debate on uh, science and uh, non science of GNNs. Um, now, you know, it's almost like we have 10 minutes left. So I'm wondering, you know, if we were in the fairyland and uh, you would request a data set from the participant and you know our eventual listeners on YouTube, what would be the data set that would create benefit uh, greatly the community that uh, a person can realistically build right now that is not existent? So since I'm hardballing, uh, maybe Rose, what would be the T plus one data set uh, that you would want from the community if we were to make requests, of course? Yeah, I mean, I think the current pipeline of like taking a path a given data set and run like the machine learning algorithm on top of it is just like a lot of flawed. So I think the, you know, the ideal case where we have an interactive system where we can actively query the data that we want to test our algorithm. So. Uh, some new interest of our group is to look at this kind of uh, active learning setting and the interactive learning setting where we can, in, you know, proactively query the data set we want and then test the algorithm we, we are we're, we're building and then go and then look at uncertainty of the prediction and go back to uh, the data generator and ask for more data. So I, I hope you know this community can provide this kind of mechanism to test our algorithms, not just you know give us a set of data and then hope the algorithm can make the best out of it. Thank you. Uh, so active, active sort of learning. Um, any more requests for the community for the magic wand? One thing I would very much like to evaluate, uh, you know, starting from a skill, so starting from a set of algorithmic skills that I'm currently proposing in the current benchmark is, I think this was raised already by Minji in one of the previous questions is compositionality. Like I would very much like to have a GNN learn certain subsets of skills and then 
robustly combine those skills in a few shot manner. Like if I have something that requires you to do task A, something that requires you to do task B, I can learn those two things well. If I give you a new task, which is if something do A, otherwise do B, I should expect to specialize on that very quickly. Like I think current systems are not necessarily good enough for that, but we don't necessarily have good enough benchmarks to drive development of something like that. So our algorithmic benchmarks give a set of base tasks, but we, we would have to do really blind composition to kind of automatically create a data set of combined tasks. So if somebody would be keen enough and like also secure the required legal licenses to scrape a good data set of, uh, you know, competitive programming tasks from all these programming Olympiads and create them into a nice graph structured format, that would be something I would very much like, uh, but you know, or, or any interesting way of composing random functions that you find on the internet, I guess, and conveniently processing them. But the general idea is compositionality. Thanks. Um, yeah, I know one such way of copying and pasting things uh, of code from the internet, uh, but I will not disclose my uh, my sources. So Minje? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, if I want to have a data, right, like a graph data, uh, I really want a knowledge graph. Probably this is a question for Luna, but yeah, this is like, uh, uh, I think if we have, so we had such like a knowledge graph representing actually uh, the ground truths of how we think, right? How we think, how we do reasoning uh, to fulfill some task, right? This will be essentially a big step. I mean, I was, this is a hypothetically a step, right? Because it is very difficult to achieve that. But if we had that, right? We, and by looking at the process, we generating that graph, we can understand, okay, how we extract things. And by looking at how we use this graph to actually accomplish a task, we can understand how we reason things, right? So this will become a very central core, uh, core piece for us to understand like how we generate graph data and how we utilize graph data. So uh, I, I can respond to this. Um, so so uh, regarding this, have you tried uh, using the, um, the 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 free base knowledge graph to try to 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 test out something? Uh, yeah. So here in our lab, actually, so we are looking at the entire pipeline. Essentially, we are seeing okay because the free base of Wikipedia wiki data, right? This knowledge graph essentially generated from Wikipedia articles, and we are thinking uh, okay how can we like accomplish the whole pipeline, right? So from the raw text, getting the graph and from the graph to accomplish knowledge, understanding, like a language comprehension, this kind of stuff. Yeah. So it's more like it is the middle, maybe it's implicit. It's implicit instead of like explicit, like instantiated, but we somehow like model it in the middle. Um, and for free base, for, for your question, right? Like, um, uh, I think the, 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 the issue is still like, it is too noisy. It is too noisy. Like there are a lot of like information. Like I, I actually read through some articles about the generation process of free pace. And, and they actually list a lot of interesting phenomena like say, okay, how they make mistakes there. <laughs> and and, and, and then th this backs to your question, like your position requirement is very high. You, you cannot uh, tolerate knowledge that is incorrect, right? So how can we use that piece of knowledge to accomplish the following task? Got you. Okay. Okay. So um, you, you you are basically saying we need some uh, good knowledge graphs, and uh, that will help for a whole bunch. I guess for a whole bunch of downstream uh, applications and it's fairly clean knowledge graphs. I, I fully agree. I mean, that's why I was motivated to do knowledge graphs in the past years. Um, so my feeling is, uh, I mean, this is a separate point. Um, <clears throat> When I look at the real data and uh, the benchmark data, uh, why do I oftentimes read the read some of the papers and feel okay, even though the methods look good on those benchmarks, but may not apply to my problems? I think um, I was just asking myself this question, and I think it is the skew of the data, and um, just to take a uh, take take. Uh, Freebase as an example, uh, the benchmark data for knowledge inference is actually a small set that is very dense graph. And in reality, 
most of the graphs actually is very skewed and 80% of the nodes have very, very sparse edges. And that makes a lot of the models, algorithms, et cetera, not working well. And for those dense parts, it's another side of or another extreme of um, disaster. Because again, when you have a node that has thousands or even like, um, I remember there was a node with like millions of edges and um, the algorithm does not work either. And um, so uh, this high skew makes it a real challenge when we deal with real data. But for that one, I do not often see it reflected in benchmark data. So that is uh, my feeling. Thank you. Um, and we're all out of time for this perfect discussion. I think, of course, we would like to converse uh, indefinitely, but the organizing uh, problems and the timelines are restricting us to this time. Thank you all heartward, um, wholeheartedly for the discussion, for the interesting discussion. I hope we will also uh, release it uh, for uh, our conversation online and maybe someone will pick up on this um, thread of benchmarking and uh, these beautiful ideas and uh, suggestions uh, from all of our panelists. And now, uh, Jackie will give us uh, some closing remarks for the whole workshop. So stay up for that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for all the panelists. Uh, and also thank you everyone for the participation and support uh, of this workshop. Uh, so uh, it's my great pleasure to give some final concluding remarks of this workshop. Um, yeah. So first of all, I'd like to thank, thank our keynote speakers in the earlier session today. Uh, they give us a very intriguing talks covering the recent trends in graph machine learning method and benchmarks for molecular systems and constructing representations for, for complex systems. And uh, those are very insightful talks and, uh, and uh, thank you for joining us. And I'd also like to thank our amazing panelists. We had a, a fantastic panel discussions, including various topics like, um, like, like your different backgrounds in this kind of graph machine learning, different evaluations practices, and generic models and this is special uh, models, those kind of things. Um, so I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much for coming. Um, and also very important to this workshop is the contribution by the program committee. They spent a significant amount of time helping us reviewing all these papers and the workshop cannot be possible without their hard work. So thank you to our uh, PC members. And in addition, uh, we've also seen the presentations of the 12 accepted papers today. I want to uh, quickly remind you that the papers, code, and, uh, and data are also available on our website. And thank you for all the authors contributing your excellent work to this workshop. And finally, in the remaining few minutes, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the motivations and the future plans of this workshop. Um, so the, there are two major focuses of this workshop. One is uh, to encourage benchmark study of existing methods. Another is to encourage community efforts for uh, on establishing new benchmark data sets. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about the second focus and why we think this is an important thing to do. Um, so the first reason is that the graph data and the machine learning tasks on the graphs are really diverse. Um, as also discussed in the panel discussion, so far there has not been a generic model that can dominate different sorts of graph learning tasks, and the existing benchmark data set have not been representative enough for the uh, problems in this space. So it is still important to continuously bring um, graph data and tasks from different domains into this community uh, with uh, different characteristics. And this is best done through the community effort. Another reason is that uh, properly constructing the data, especially in the graph domain, is also part of the solution. 
Um, so, so Andrew Ng has been calling for people's attention on the data construction. And our keynote speaker uh, today, uh, Tina, also talked about the complexity of choosing the proper representations of graphs. So I think it's, it is particularly important for the community to pay more attention to the uh, data set work. And with this motivations in mind, and as the uh, organizers of this workshop, we've been thinking about how to better serve the data set contributors in order to encourage the data set contributions from the community. And in, in particular, we like to make the graph learning data set contribution easier, more popular, and more fun. And I'll talk about uh, some future plans uh, in order to achieve this. So to make the process easier, we hope, uh, we hope to uh, gather and share tools and, back and best practices on dataset creation as we receive more and more data set um, in, in this workshop. And uh, we want to make a list of it. And we also hope to make the publication of the data set work easier. Um, and one way to help with this is to have a rolling acceptance of data sets because the construction of the data sets can take a lot of time and uh, we, so far we don't have enough venues uh, for their publications. Um, so we think a rolling acceptance will be, make this process easier. And to make the dataset contribution more popular, I think it is important for the community better incentivize the datasets works. Um, and, uh, and I think the, the most important thing probably is to, um, to give enough credits to this data set works. This include encouraging proper citations of the, like the original data sets contributors. And I think it's also help to separate the contributions of the data and tasks so that uh, like the original contributors of the data will not be forgotten by the, by the, by, by the people in the community when, when, when other people creating new tasks on the data sets. And also uh, through the two editions of the workshop, we share the feeling with the New York's uh, data set and benchmark track that data set reviews require something different than paper reviews. But uh, currently, both our workshop and the New York's data set track are essentially still in a paper review format. So we plan to innovate the review and feedback process of data set publication using the GitHub workflow. And we think this process can also make the process more constructive and more fun. So with all these considerations in mind, uh, we are currently impl implementing a dataset submission platform, which will have a rolling acceptance of datasets and requires uh, people to have proper citation document documentations. And uh, we will have a guideline on that. And we'll also have a GitHub-based review and feedback mechanisms. And uh, so uh, we'll be, this, this platform uh, will be released soon. And so please stay tuned. And we like in the next edition of the workshop, we hope to uh, use this, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this platform to solicit new, um, uh, new data sets contributions. And uh, finally, I want to shout out to my co-organizers, uh, Jung, Anton, Marinka, and also our uh, adversarial board, Yu Xiao, Danai, Chao Zhu, and thank you everyone for the hard work to make this uh, workshop come true. Uh, and finally, thank you again, everyone, for coming to this workshop and for your support.